Section 48 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trial of John C. Colt for the Murder of Samuel Adams, New York City, 1842, Part 5. January 24th. This morning, Sunday, at a quarter before three o'clock, the jury sent word that they had come to an agreement. At four o'clock, the judge, in company with Aldermen Purdy and Lee, took his seat upon the bench. The jury came into court. The clerk. Gentlemen, what is your verdict? The foreman. We find the prisoner John C. Colt guilty of willful murder. Mr. Morrill then applied to the court for time to prepare a bill of exceptions, etc. The application was granted. The prisoner remanded to the custody of the sheriff. May 5th. The prisoner's counsel moved for a new trial, Mr. Emmett arguing the case for the prisoner and Mr. Whiting for the people. On May 12th, a new trial was denied. The appeal was taken to the Supreme Court on July 16th at Utica. The case was argued before that tribunal, and the judgment approved. September 27th. The prisoner was brought up to receive sentence, the courtroom being crowded with spectators. Asked if he had anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed on him, Colt handed a paper to the judge, which contained charges that the trial had been unjustly conducted and that the evidence had been trampled on by the jury. Judge Kent. I am sorry that any unjust allusions have been made as to the conduct of the jury. It is due to justice, and it is due to one of the most intelligent juries that ever sat in a court of justice, that I should not allow them in this their proud tribunal to be insulted without entering a solemn protest against it. The jury were selected out of 300 of our most respectable citizens, taken indiscriminately from the city, selected under the most vigorous exercise of the peremptory challenge by the prisoner, and in every instance where objections were raised and allowed, it was in favor of the prisoner. Their demeanor in court was such as to entitle them to the highest consideration of the tribunal in which they took part. They had been separated from their families and from their business, confined in a sort of prison for eleven days, and I never saw one of them exhibit the slightest impatience. On the contrary, they bore with almost exemplary patience the tedious, even unnecessary, delays in the progress of the trial. Calmly, honestly, unfalteringly earnest in their efforts to discover the truth from the mass of evidence spread before them. Had these men been followed to their rooms, we would have seen the same calm, unimpassioned inquiry characterizing their deliberations. As far, therefore, as the paper expressed dissatisfaction with the conduct of the court and jury, it was the court's conscientious opinion that the asseverations are untrue and unjust. I will now allude to the offense for which the prisoner has been convicted. No man ever doubted that it was a crime of the greatest magnitude and enormity. It was a crime, too, which had sunk deep in the community. Leaving out of view all the appalling circumstances, with which I will not distress the prisoner or myself in recalling, no doubt could exist but that the deed was executed under the influence of ferocious passions and sanguinary cruelty. Colt said that if the judge had read the document, he would find that he, Colt, did not charge the jury with willful wrong, but that they were mistaken. As to any allusions made by the judge, he could assure him that he would rather leave his case with God than with man. He never did a deed in his life, but he would repeat had it to be gone over again. I am not the man to be trampled down in my own office and look tamely on. It was not my intention to kill the man, but he made the assault and must take the consequences. I am sorry the court thought proper to make the remarks it has. For myself, I had intended to say something more, but not expecting to be sentenced today, I was not prepared. I am ready to receive sentence, knowing that it cannot be avoided. Judge Kent. 
Sentence will now be pronounced with expressions of deep regret entertained by the court at the callous and morbid insensibility exhibited in your last speech, and which shows that any further remarks would be lost. John C. Colt, the sentence of the court is that on the 18th of November next, you will be hanged till you are dead, and may God have mercy on your soul. The prisoner was then removed. During the sentence, he assumed a bold and careless air. His suicide. From the date of Colt's sentence up to the day set down for his execution, the most energetic efforts were made upon the part of his friends to have the death penalty commuted to imprisonment for life. But the governor could not be moved. Application was also made to the chancellor to have the case removed to the court of errors, but the application was denied. Several attempts were now made to release the prisoner from jail. One evening, one of his friends went to the tombs attired in women's clothes, the plot being matured to let the prisoner walk out of the tombs in the female costume, while the latter should remain in his place. Rooms were prepared in Brooklyn for the reception of cult, and every arrangement made so that he should be hidden when he again emerged into freedom. But the plot was discovered. On the party arriving at the tombs and applying for admission, they were informed that their conspiracy was well known and they were advised to withdraw and nothing would be said about the movement. A doctor of the city undertook to resuscitate Colt after he was hanged in case the body was not too long suspended. This doctor asserted that Colt's neck was of such thickness that it would require a longer period than is usual in such cases before the unfortunate man would be strangled. A room was taken at the Shakespeare Hotel where the body was to be brought direct from the tombs, and there all efforts made for its resuscitation. Caroline Henshaw was faithful to the last and visited him daily, and on the morning of the day set for his execution, Colt married her in his cell. At one o'clock, Caroline Henshaw, the execution was set for four, took leave of the unfortunate man. Deputy Sheriff Hillier shortly after entered the cell and bade Colt farewell. He was the last man that saw him alive. A few minutes before four o'clock, Sheriff Hart, Deputy Sheriff Westervelt, and Reverend Dr. Anthon proceeded to the cell in order to inform Colt that his hour had come. On opening the cell door, the visitors started back in horror. Lying at full length upon his couch was John C. Colt, a corpse. A small clasp knife, with the handle slightly broken, was stuck in his heart. The body was still warm, but the spirit had departed. Just then a cry of fire was heard. The cupola of the tombs was found to be in flames. The body was removed by the friends of the deceased and placed in the vaults of St. Mark's Church. It was widely asserted that Colt had not committed suicide at all and that the setting fire to the tombs was simply a ruse in order to facilitate the escape of the prisoner and that he had escaped but these were subsequently authoritatively shown to be false. Footnote. An interesting account of the circumstances anterior to and succeeding the suicide of Colt was subsequently written by Mr. L. Gaylord Clark as follows. I have no doubt that hundreds and hundreds of people in this state and in border states are at this moment in the full and undoubting belief that John C. Colt who took the life of Adams in 1842, is still in existence, that he never entirely killed himself, but that he was spirited away from the triple-barred and triple-guarded strong immures of the tombs and is now in a foreign land safe from further peril. Why, not two months since, I heard a magistrate from one of the lower counties of New Jersey say, a man accustomed to deliberate and carefully weigh evidence, that he has no more doubt that John C. Colt was among the living than he was that he himself was alive. And I have heard at least 50 persons affirm the same thing. Few persons took a deeper interest in the case of Colt from the very beginning than myself, firmly believing that the killing was never premeditated, but was the result of a quarrel and a blow suddenly given when the parties stood face to face with each other. And this was shown by the cast of the head, showing the mark made by the hatchet which Dr. Rogers and a committee of which I was one took up to Albany and laid before Governor Seward. 
I say firmly believing all this, I never could consider Colt a deliberate murderer, nor was he. He was convicted for concealing the body of his unfortunate victim. Does anyone suppose that if Colt had rushed out into the hall after having struck the fatal blow and said, I have killed a man, we have had a little difficulty, I have struck him with a hatchet and have killed him, does anyone now believe he would ever have been convicted? Never. But this apart. I believe I am the only survivor of those who left John C. Colt in his cell at the tombs, in company alone with his brother Samuel, some three-quarters of an hour before the time appointed for the execution. The late Reverend Mr. Anthon, John Howard Payne, Samuel Coat, the unhappy condemned, and myself were the only persons in the cell at this time. It was a scene never to be forgotten. The condemned had on a sad-colored morning gown and a scarf tied loosely around his neck. He had a cup of coffee in his hand and was helping himself to some sugar from a wooden bowl, which stood on an iron water pipe near the head of his bed. His hand was perfectly steady as he held the cup and put in the sugar, and the only sign of intense internal agitation and excitement was visible in his eyes, which were literally blood-red and oscillated, so to speak, exactly like the red and incessantly moving eyes of the albinos. Our interview was prolonged for half an hour, which was passed in conversation with Dr. Anthon, Mr. Payne, and his brother. And when we were about to depart, and someone, looking at his watch, said that he thought he must be some ten minutes fast, poor John replied, May you never see the time when those ten minutes will be as precious to you as they are to me, but after all, we have all got to go sooner or later, and no man knows when. As we close the cell door, leaving him alone with his sorrowing, faithful brother, the unhappy man kissed us all on each cheek and bade us farewell with emotion too deep for tears, for not a drop moistened his throbbing, burning eyes. We made our way with difficulty from the tombs, by the aid of the surrounding police who opened a space for our carriage through the crowd, which in every direction for two or three blocks filled the adjacent streets and reached on Franklin Street nearly, if not quite, to Broadway. I resided at that time in 7th Street, between 8th and 9th Avenues, and Reverend Dr. Anthon lived in St. Mark's Place in 8th Street. We deposited the good doctor at his door and after calling at the same time to acquaint the family with the last sad scene we had witnessed, Mr. Payne and I were driven quickly over to the New York University, in the southern tower of which, in the upper story, Mr. Samuel Colt had his incipient pistol manufactory, or rather his invention and improvement office. As we entered, he was sitting at a table with a broad-brimmed hat drawn over his brow, his hands spread before his eyes, and the hot tears trickling through his fingers. After a few moments' silence at his request, I took a sheet of paper and commenced at his dictation a letter to his brother Judge Colt, then of St. Louis. I had not written more than five lines when rapid footsteps were heard on the stairs and a hackman rushed into the room, exclaiming in the wildest excitement, Mr. Colt, Mr. Colt, your brother has killed himself, stabbed himself to the heart, and the tombs are afire. You can see it a-burning now. Thank God, thank God, exclaimed Mr. Colt, with an expression almost of joy. We raised an eastern window of the tower, stepped out upon the battlement, and by a short ladder stepped out onto the roof of the chapel, or main edifice, and saw the flames licking up and curling around the great fire tower of the tombs. There was something peculiar about the air, the atmosphere on that day, one felt as one feels on a cold autumnal night while watching, uncovered in the open air, the flickering of the aurora borealis in the northern sky. As early as half-past three o'clock that afternoon, two stars were distinctly visible through the cold, thin atmosphere. This was regarded at the time as a remarkable phenomenon. Now everybody knows, or should know, that the body of John C. Colt was found exactly as described by the hackman, that life was totally extinct, that the corpse was encoffined, removed, buried, and so remains unto this day. The tomb's tower caught fire from an overheated stove, and yet all the doubters of Colt's suicide, whom we have ever met, contend that the burning was part of the plan, that it was hired to be set on fire, and that in the confusion the condemned man escaped.
End of section 48, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, April 29, 2023. Section 49 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Fournier, Sandia Park, New Mexico. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson. Trials of Bridget Bishop and George Burroughs for Witchcraft, Salem, Massachusetts, 1692. Part 1. The Narrative Witchcraft, the acquiring of supernatural power by a compact with evil spirits, was until somewhat recent times believed in implicitly by all the common people and by many of the learned. Several papal bills have been issued against it, and thousands of persons suffered death on account of it down to the 17th century. Henry VIII, Elizabeth, and James I thundered against it, even the great Bacon supported laws against it, and in 1665, Sir Matthew Hale, one of the grandest names on the role of English judges, and whose genius, learning, and purity of character have never been questioned, tried and sentenced two women to die for this offense. The last victim in England perished in 1716, and the last in Scotland in 1722. The Puritan colonists of New England carried with them, in an exaggerated form, the superstitious feelings with regard to witchcraft which then prevailed in the mother country. In the spring of 1692, an alarm of witchcraft was raised in the family of the minister of Salem, and several black servants were charged with the supposed crime. Once started, the alarm spread rapidly, and in a very short time, a great number of people fell under suspicion and many were thrown into prison on very frivolous grounds, supported, as such charges usually were, by very unworthy witnesses. The new governor of the colony, Sir William Phipps, arrived from England in the middle of May, and he seems to have been carried away by the excitement and authorized judicial prosecutions. The trials began at the commencement of June, and the first victim, a woman named Bridget Bishop, was hanged. A few weeks later, George Burroughs, a minister of the gospel whose chief crime seems to have been a disbelief in witchcraft itself, was tried and executed. His fate aroused much sympathy, which was, however, checked by Cotton Mather, who was present at the place of execution on horseback, and addressed the crowd, assuring them that Burroughs was an impostor and was guilty. Many people, however, had now become alarmed at the proceedings of the prosecutors, and among those executed with Burroughs was a man named John Williard, who had been employed to arrest the persons charged by the accusers, and who had been accused himself because, from conscientious motives, he refused to arrest any more. He attempted to save himself by flight, but he was pursued and overtaken. Eight more of the unfortunate victims of this delusion were hanged on the 22nd of September, making in all 19 who had suffered thus far, besides one who, in accordance with the old criminal law practice, had been pressed to death for refusing to plead. The excitement had indeed risen to such a pitch that two dogs accused of witchcraft were put to death. A certain degree of reaction, however, appeared to be taking place, and the magistrates who had conducted the proceedings began to be alarmed, and to have some doubts of the wisdom of their proceedings. Cotton Mather was called upon by the governor to employ his pen in justifying what had been done, and the result was the book, The Wonders of the Invisible World, in which the author gives an account of seven trials at Salem, compares the doings of the witches in New England with those in other parts of the world, and adds an elaborate dissertation on witchcraft in general. This book was published at Boston, Massachusetts, in the month of October, 1692. Other circumstances, however, contributed to throw discredit on the proceedings of the court, though the witch mania was at the same time spreading throughout the whole colony. In this same month of October, the wife of Mr. Hale, minister of Beverly, was accused, although no person of sense and respectability had the slightest doubt of her innocence, and her husband had been a zealous promoter of the prosecutions. This accusation brought a new light on the mind of Mr. Hale, 
who became convinced of the injustice in which he had been made an accomplice. But the other ministers, who took the lead in the proceedings, were less willing to believe in their own error. And equally convinced of the innocence of Mrs. Hale, they raised a question of conscience, whether the devil could not assume the shape of an innocent and pious person, as well as of a wicked person, for the purpose of afflicting his victims. The assistance of Increase Mather, the president or principal of Harvard College, was now called in, and he published the book, A Further Account of the Trials of the New England Witches, to which is added cases of conscience concerning witchcrafts and evil spirits personating men. The greater part of the cases of conscience is given to the discussion of the question just alluded to, which Increase Mather unhesitatingly decides in the affirmative. The scene of agitation was now removed from Salem to Andover, where a great number of persons were accused of witchcraft and thrown into prison, until a justice of the peace named Bradstreet, to whom the accusers applied for warrants, refused to grant any more. Hereupon they cried out upon Bradstreet, and declared that he had killed nine persons by means of witchcraft, and he was so much alarmed that he fled from the place. The accusers aimed at people in higher positions in society, until at last they had the audacity to cry out upon the lady of Governor Phipps himself, and thus lost whatever countenance he had given to their proceedings out of respect to the two Mathers. Other people of character, when they were attacked by the accusers, took energetic measures in self-defense. A gentleman of Boston, when cried out upon, obtained a writ of arrest against his accusers on a charge of defamation, and laid the damages at a thousand pounds. The accusers themselves now took fright, and many who had made confessions retracted them, while the accusations themselves fell into discredit. When Governor Phipps was recalled in April 1693 and left for England, the witchcraft agitation had nearly subsided, and people in general had become convinced of their error and lamented it. But Cotton Mather and his father persisted obstinately in the opinions they had published, and looked upon the reactionary feeling as a triumph of Satan and his kingdom. In the course of the year, they had an opportunity of reasserting their belief in the doings of the witches of Salem. A girl of Boston, named Margaret Rule, was seized with convulsions, in the course of which she pretended to see the shapes of specters of people exactly as they were alleged to have been seen by the witch accusers at Salem and Andover. This occurred on the 10th of September, 1693, and she was immediately visited by Cotton Mather, who examined her and declared his conviction of the truth of her statements. Had it depended only upon him, a new and no doubt equally bitter persecution of witches would have been raised in Boston. But an influential merchant in that town, named Robert Califf, took the matter up in a different spirit, and also examined Margaret Rule, and satisfied himself that the whole was a delusion or imposture. Caliph wrote a rational account of the events of these two years, 1692 and 1693, exposing the delusion and controverting the opinions of the two Mathers on the subject of witchcraft, which was published under the title of More Wonders of the Invisible World, or The Wonders of the Invisible World Displayed in Five Parts, an account of the sufferings of Margaret Rule, collected by Robert Caliph, merchant of Boston in New England. The partisans of Mathers displayed their hostility to this book by publicly burning it. And the Mathers themselves kept up the feeling so strongly that years afterwards, when Samuel Mather, the son of Cotton, wrote his father's life, he said sneeringly of Caliph, There was a certain disbeliever in witchcraft who wrote against this book, his father's wonders of the invisible world, but as this man is dead, his book died long before him. Caliph died in 1720. The witchcraft delusion had, however, been sufficiently dispelled to prevent the recurrence of any other such persecutions, and those who still insisted on their truth were restrained to the comparatively harmless publication and defense of their opinions. The people of Salem were humbled and repentant. They deserted their minister, Mr. Paris, with whom the persecution had begun, and were not satisfied until they had driven him away from the place. Their remorse continued through several years, and most of the people concerned in the judicial proceedings proclaimed their regret. The jurors signed a paper expressing their repentance, and pleading that they had labored under a delusion. 
what ought to have been considered still more conclusive, many of those who had confessed themselves witches and had been instrumental in accusing others retracted all they had said and confessed that they had acted under the influence of terror. Yet the vanity of superior intelligence and knowledge was so great in the two Mathers that they resisted all conviction. In his Magnalia, an ecclesiastical history of New England, published in 1700, Cotton Mather repeats his original view of the doings of Satan in Salem, showing no regret for the part he had taken in this affair and making no retraction of any of his opinions. Still later, in 1723, he repeats them again in the same strain in the chapter of the Remarkables of his father, entitled Troubles from the Invisible World. His father, Increase Mather, had died in that same year at an advanced age, being in his 85th year. Cotton Mather died on the 13th of February, 1728. The general course of proceedings at these trials was entirely consistent with the character of the court and the nature of their business. After pleading to the indictment, if the prisoner denied his guilt, the afflicted persons were first brought into court and sworn as to who afflicted them. Then the confessors, that is, those who had voluntarily acknowledged themselves witches, were called upon to tell what they knew of the accused. A thing, said Brattle, who wrote at this time, which I believe was never heard of in this world, that such as confessed themselves to be witches, to have renounced God and Christ and all that is sacred, should be allowed and ordered to swear by the name of the great God? Proclamation was then made for all who could give any testimony, however foreign to the charge, to come into court and whatever anyone volunteered to tell was admitted as evidence. The next process was to search for witch marks, the doctrine being that the devil affixed his mark to those in alliance with him, and that this point on the body became callous and dead. This duty was performed by a jury of the same sex, who made a particular return of the appearance of the body, and whether there were any preternatural excrescence. A wart or a mole on the body of a prisoner was often conclusive against him, when the evidence was otherwise doubtful. These examinations in the case of women were made by a jury of matrons, aided by a medical man as foreman. They were very minute, and in some respects, the most cruel and disgusting part of the proceedings. The unhappy prisoners were not only subjected to the mortification of a gross exposure before the jury of examination, but when any witch mark was found, it was punctured with pins to ascertain whether there was any feeling. There were usually several examinations of the same individual. In one instance, a woman was examined at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The jury certified that they had again examined her and that her breast, which, in the morning search, appeared to us very full, the nipples fresh and starting, now at this search all lank and pendant, of the nine women who were on this jury, but one could write her name. The remainder made their marks. Evidence was also received respecting the appearance of the accused at the preliminary examinations, and the various signs of witchcraft which then appeared were detailed with much more particularity. It was a great sign of witchcraft to make an error in the Lord's Prayer, which the accused on those occasions was required to repeat, and if they made a single error, it was brought up at their trial as evidence against them. Thus, one repeated the prayer correctly in every particular, excepting that she said, Deliver us from all evil, which was looked upon as if she prayed against what she was now justly under. Upon making another attempt, she said, Hallowed be thy name, instead of hallowed be thy name. And this was counted a depraving the words, as signifying to make void and so a curse rather than a prayer. The appearance of the accused, and of those supposed to be bewitched, also had an effect against the prisoner. Sometimes the witnesses were struck dumb for a long time. At others they would fall into terrible fits, and were insensible to the touch of all but the accused, who they declared tormented them. Sometimes the accused were ordered to look on the afflicted, when the latter would be immediately thrown into fits. It was thought that an invisible and impalpable fluid darted from the eyes of the witch and penetrated the brain of the bewitched. A touch of the witch attracted back the malignant fluid, and the sufferers recovered their senses. 
Another sign of witchcraft of great consideration was an inability of the accused to shed tears. On the trial of George Burroughs, the evidence was of a very loose and general nature, consisting in a great measure of things said and done by his shape or apparition when he was not present as to the body. Attempts were made in this way to prove that the prisoner had murdered two wives and other persons. Testimony was also received respecting great feats of strength performed by the prisoner. But what made against him very much was the appearance of the witnesses when they gave their testimony. They fell into terrible fits and were struck dumb. "'Who hinders these witnesses?' said the Chief Justice. "'From giving their testimony!' "'I suppose the devil,' answered Burroughs. "'How comes the devil?' retorted Stoughton. "'So loath to have any testimony borne against you!' And the question was decisive against him. The following is the testimony of most of the witnesses at this trial, condensed from original documents. There was one species of evidence which was of great effect in these persecutions and which it was impossible to rebut. Witnesses were allowed to testify to certain acts of the accused when the latter was not present in the body, that they were tormented by apparitions or specters of the accused which pinched them, robbed them of their goods, caused them to languish and pine away, pricked them, and they produced the identical pins which were used for their purpose. The cases of Bridget Bishop and George Burroughs will illustrate these terrible trials, the others being in nearly every respect similar, both in procedure, evidence, and penalty. End of section 49 Section 50 of American State Trials, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Fournier, Sandia Park, New Mexico. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trials of Bridget Bishop and George Burroughs for Witchcraft, Salem, Massachusetts, 1692, Part 2. The Trial in the special court of Oye and Termine for the counties of Suffolk, Essex, and Middlesex, Salem, Massachusetts, 1692. Judges William Stoughton, Chief Justice Nathan Saltonstall Jonathan Kerwin John Richards Bartholomew Gedney Waite Winthrop Samuel Sewall Peter Sargent Footnote it was a popular tribunal. There was not a lawyer concerned in its proceedings. Stoughton and Sewall had been educated clergymen. Winthrop and Gedney were physicians. Richards was a merchant. Sargent was an influential man in the colony. And Saltonstall, who refused to proceed against those suspected of witchcraft, was an educated man, graduated at Cambridge in 1659, and afterwards became distinguished as a military commander. End footnote. June 20. Bridget Bishop, or Oliver, was indicted for that on April 19th, and at divers other times and days as well, before as after, she used, practiced, and exercised certain detestable arts called witchcraft and sorceries, at and within the township of Salem, in, upon, and against one Mercy Lewis of Salem Village, by which wicked arts the said Mercy Lewis was hurt, tortured, afflicted, wasted, and tormented against the peace of our sovereign lord and lady, the king and queen, and against the form of the statute in that case made and prescribed. There were four other indictments against her for the same crime in afflicting persons. She pleaded not guilty. Anthony Checkley and Thomas Newton for the king. Witnesses for the Prosecution Deliverance Hobbs Having confessed myself a witch, the specter of the prisoner was now tormenting me on account of my confession and tempting me to sign the book again and to deny what I confessed. The shape of the prisoner whipped me with iron rods to compel me. This bishop was at a general meeting of the witches, 
in a field at Salem Village, and there partook of a diabolical sacrament in bread and wine then administered. John Cook About five or six years ago, one morning about sunrise, I was assaulted in my chamber by the shape of this prisoner, which looked on me, grinned at me, and very much hurt me with a blow on the side of the head. On that same day about noon, the same shape walked into the room where I was, and an apple strangely flew out of my hand into the lap of mother, six or eight feet away. Samuel Gray About fourteen years ago, I walked on a night, and saw the room where I lay full of light, and then saw plainly a woman between the cradle and the bedside, which looked upon me. I rose, and it vanished, though I found the doors all fast. Looking out at the entry door, I saw the same woman in the same garb again, and said, In God's name, what do you come for? I went to bed, and had the same woman assaulting me. The child in the cradle gave a great screech, and the woman disappeared. It was long before the child could be quieted, and though it was a very likely thriving child, yet from this time it pined away, and after divers months died in a sad condition. I know not Bishop, nor her name, but when I saw her after this, I knew by her countenance and apparel and all circumstances that it was the apparition of this bishop which had thus troubled me. John Bly Bought a sow of Edward Bishop, the husband of the prisoner, and was to pay the price agreed unto another person. Prisoner, being angry that she was thus hindered from fingering the money, quarreled with me. Soon after which the sow was taken with strange fits, jumping, leaping, and knocking her head against the fence. She seemed blind and deaf, and would neither eat nor be sucked, whereupon a neighbor said she believed the creature was overlooked, and sundry other circumstances concurred, which made me believe that Bishop had bewitched it. Richard Cohen Eight years ago, as I lay awake in bed, with a light burning in the room, I was annoyed with the apparition of the prisoner, and of two more that were strangers, who came and oppressed me, so that I could neither stir nor wake anyone else. The night after, I was molested again in like manner. Bishop, taking me by the throat, and pulling me almost out of bed. My kinsmen offered for this cause to lodge with me, and that night, as we were awake discoursing together, I was once more visited by the guests which had formerly been so troublesome. My kinsmen, being at the same time struck speechless and unable to move hand or foot. I had laid his sword by me, which those unhappy specters did strive much to wrest from me, but I held it too fast for them. I then grew able to call the people of the house, but although they heard me, yet they had not power to speak or stir, until at last one of the people crying out, What is the matter? The specters all vanished. Samuel Shattuck In the year 1680, this Bridget Bishop often came to my house upon such frivolous and foolish errands that we suspected she came indeed with a purpose of mischief. Presently my eldest child, which was of as promising health and sense as any child of its age, began to droop exceedingly, and the oftener that Bishop came to the house, the worse the child grew. As the child would be standing at the door, he would be thrown and bruised against the stones by an invisible hand, and in like sort knock his face against the sides of the house and bruise it after a miserable manner. Afterwards, this bishop would bring me things to die, whereof I could not imagine any use. And when she paid me a piece of money, the purse and money were unaccountably conveyed out of a locked box and never seen more. The child was immediately hereupon taken with terrible fits, whereof my friends thought he would have died. He did almost nothing but cry and sleep for several months together, and at length his understanding was utterly taken away. Among other symptoms of an enchantment upon him 
one was that there was a board in the garden whereupon he would walk, and all the invitations in the world could never fetch him off. About seventeen or eighteen years after, there came a stranger to my house, who, seeing the child, said, This poor child is bewitched, and you have a neighbor living not far off who is a witch. He added, Your neighbor has had a falling out with your wife, and she said in her heart, Your wife is a proud woman, and she would bring down her pride in this child. I then remembered that Bishop had parted with my wife in muttering and menacing terms a little while before the child was taken ill. The aforesaid stranger would needs carry the bewitched boy with him to Bishop's house on pretense of buying a pot of cider. The woman entertained him in a furious manner and flew also upon the boy, scratching his face till the blood came and saying, Thou rogue, what dost thou bring this fellow here to plague me? Ever after, the boy was followed with grievous fits, which the doctors themselves generally ascribed unto witchcraft, and wherein he would be thrown still into the fire or water if he were not constantly looked after. And I verily believe that Bishop was the cause of it. John Louder Upon some little controversy with Bishop about her fowls, going well to bed, I awoke in the night by moonlight and saw clearly the likeness of this woman grievously oppressing me, in which miserable condition she held me unable to help myself till near day. I told Bishop of this, but she utterly denied it, and threatened me very much. Quickly after this, being at home on Lord's Day, with the doors shut about me, I saw a black pig approach, which, endeavoring to kick, it vanished away. Immediately after, sitting down, I saw a black thing jump in at the window and come and stand before me. The body was like that of a monkey, the feet like a cock's, but the face much like a man's. I being so extremely affrightened that I could not speak, this monster spoke to me and said, I am a messenger sent unto you, for I understand that you are in some trouble of mind, and if you will be ruled by me, you shall want for nothing in this world. Whereupon I endeavored to clap my hands upon it, but could feel no substance and it jumped out of the window again, but immediately came in by the porch, though the doors were shut, and said, You had better take my counsel. I then struck at it with a stick, but struck only the groundsel and broke the stick. The arm with which I struck was presently disabled, and it vanished away. I presently went out at the back door and spied this bishop in her orchard going toward her house but had not the power to set one foot forward unto her. Whereupon returning into the house, I was immediately accosted by the monster I had seen before, which goblin was going to fly at me, whereat I cried out, The whole armor of God be between you and me! So it sprung back and flew over the apple tree, shaking many apples off the tree in its flying over. At its leap, it flung dirt with its feet against my stomach, whereon I was struck dumb, and so continued for three days together. William Stacy Receiving money of this bishop for work done by me, I was gone but a matter of three rods from her, and looking for my money, found it unaccountably gone. Sometime after, bishop asked whether my father would grind her grist for her. I demanded why. She replied, Because folks count me a witch. I answered, No question, but he will grind it for you. Being then gone about six rods from her, with a load in my cart, suddenly the off-wheel slumped and sunk down into an hole, upon plain ground, so that I was forced to get help for the recovering of the wheel. But stepping back to look for the hole which might give this disaster, there was none at all to be found. Sometime after, I was waked in the night, but it seemed as light as day, and I perfectly saw the shape of this bishop in the room, troubling me. But upon her going out, all was dark again. Charged bishop afterwards with it, and she denied it not, but was very angry. Quickly after, having been threatened by bishop, as I was in a dark night going to the barn, 
I was very suddenly taken or lifted from the ground and thrown against a stone wall. After that, I was again hoisted up and thrown down a bank at the end of my house. After this, again, passing by this bishop, my horse, with a small load, striving to draw, all the gears flew to pieces, and the cart fell down, and going then to lift a bag of corn of about two bushels, I could not budge it with all my might. Many other pranks of this bishop I am ready to relate. I verily believe bishop was the instrument of my daughter Priscilla's death. William Bly being employed by Bridget Bishop to help take down the cellar wall of the old house wherein she formerly lived, I did, in holes of the old wall, find several poppets, made of rags and hog's bristles, with headless pins in them, the points being outward. Whereof the prisoner could give no account unto the court that was reasonable or tolerable, an examination of the prisoner was made by a jury of women, who reported that they found a preternatural teat upon her body, and on making a second examination within three or four hours, there was no such thing to be seen. The poor woman undertook to explain the circumstances which had been related against her, but she was constantly harassed, and becoming confused, she apparently prevaricated somewhat, and all she said made against her. She seems to have been a woman of violent temper, who had long lived on ill terms with her neighbors for many years, and who had long had the reputation of being a witch. Those of her neighbors who had suffered from her uncomfortable disposition were nothing loath to attribute all their misfortunes to her, and she thus stood little chance of a fair trial. She was convicted and sentenced to be hanged, and was remanded to prison to await her doom. As she was under a guard, passing by the great and spacious meeting-house of Salem, Cotton Mather relates this, she gave a look towards the house, and immediately a demon, invisibly entering the meeting-house, tore down a part of it, so that though there was no person to be seen there, yet the people at the noise running in found a board, which was strongly fastened with several nails, transported unto another quarter of the house. She was executed on the 10th of June, solemnly protesting her innocence to the last. August 5 On this day the trial of George Burroughs took place. The indictment set forth that the prisoner, on the ninth day of May and divers other days, as well before as after, certain detestable arts, called witchcraft and sorceries, wickedly and feloniously hath used, practiced, and exercised, at and within the township of Salem, in the county of Essex aforesaid, in, upon, and against one Anne Putman, Dinglewoman, by which wicked arts the said Anne Putman, the ninth day of May, and divers other days and times, as well before as after, was and is tortured, afflicted, pined, consumed, wasted, and tormented, against the peace of our Sovereign Lord and Lady, the King and Queen, and against the form of the statute in that case made and provided. There were three other indictments against the prisoner, to all of which, on his arraignment, he pleaded not guilty. Witnesses for the Prosecution Anne Putnam On 9th May, 1692, I saw the apparition of George Burroughs, who grievously tortured me and urged me to write in his book, which I refused. He told me his two first wives would appear to me presently and tell me a great many lies, and I should not believe them. Immediately there appeared forms of two women in winding sheets and napkins about their heads, at which I was greatly affrighted. They turned their faces towards Mr. Burroughs and looked very red and angry at him, telling him that he had been a cruel man to them, and that their blood cried for vengeance against him, that they should be clothed with white robes in heaven when he should be cast into hell. Immediately he vanished. As soon as he was gone, the two women turned their faces towards me, looking as pale as a white wall. They said they were Mr. Burroughs's first wives, and that he had murdered them. 
One of them said she was his first wife, and he stabbed her under the left arm and put a piece of sealing wax on the wound, and she pulled aside the winding sheet and showed me the place, and also told me that she was in the house where Mr. Paris now lives when it was done. The other told me that Mr. Burroughs and his present wife killed her in the vessel as she was coming to see her friends, because they would have one another, and they both charged me that I should tell these things to the magistrates before Mr. Burroughs's face, and if he did not own them, they did not know but they should appear there this morning. Mrs. Lawson and her daughter appeared to me and told me that Mr. Burroughs murdered them. This morning there also appeared to me another woman in a winding sheet and told me that she was Goodman Fuller's first wife, and Mr. Burroughs killed her because of some difference between her husband and himself. Prisoner on the ninth of May, at his first examination, most grievously tormented and afflicted Mary Walcott, Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, and Abigail Williams, by pinching, pricking, and choking them. Elizabeth Hubbard One night there appeared to me a little black-bearded man in dark apparel, who told me his name was Burroughs. He took a book out of his pocket and bade me set my hand to it. I refused. The lines in the book were as red as blood. He then pinched me and went away. He has often appeared to me since and threatened to kill me if I would not sign the book. He tortured me very much by biting, pinching, and squeezing my body and running pins into me. At his first examination, on May 9th, he did most grievously afflict and torment the bodies of Mary Walcott, Mercy Lewis, Anne Putnam, and Abigail Williams. If he did but look upon them, he would strike them down or almost choke them to death. I believe in my heart that Mr. George Burroughs is a dreadful wizard. Sarah Viber On the 9th of May, as I was going to Salem Village, I saw the apparition of a little man, like a minister, with a black coat on. He pinched me by the arm and bade me go with him, but I would not, and when I came to the village, I saw Mr. George Burroughs, whom I never saw before. Then I knew that it was his apparition which I had seen in the morning. He tortured me several times during the time of his examination. I also saw him, or his appearance, torment and afflict Mary Walcott, Mercy Lewis, Elizabeth Hubbard, Anne Putnam, and Abigail Williams, by pinching, twisting, and almost choking them to death. I believe in my heart that he is a dreadful wizard. Mercy Lewis on the 7th of May, in the evening, I saw Mr. George Burroughs, who urged me to write in his book. He told me that the devil was his servant, and mentioned several whom he had bewitched. He tortured me dreadfully, and threatened to kill me, for he said I should not witness against him. He also told me I should not see his two wives if he could help it, because I should not witness against him. On the ninth of May, Mr. Burroughs carried me up into an exceeding high mountain and showed me all the kingdoms of the earth and told me that he would give them all to me if I would write in his book, and if I would not, he would throw me down and break my neck. I told him they were not his to give, and I would not write if he threw me down on a hundred pitchforks. Benjamin Hutchinson On the 21st of April, Abigail Williams told me there was a little black minister who lived at Casco Bay, who told her he had killed two wives for himself and one for Mr. Lawson, and that he could hold out the heaviest gun in Casco Bay in one hand, although any other man can scarcely hold one out in both hands. I asked her where this little man stood. She said, just where the cartwheel went along. I had a three-grained iron fork in my hand, and I threw it where she said he stood, and she presently fell into a fit, and when it was over, said, You have torn his coat, for I heard it tear. Whereabouts? said I. On one side, said she. Then we came to the house of Lieutenant Ingersoll, and I went into the great room. Abigail came in and said, 
There he stands. I said, where, where? And presently drew my rapier. But he was immediately gone, as she said. Then she said, there is a gray cat. I struck with my rapier, and she fell into a fit. When it was over, she said, you have killed her. Simon Willard Being at the house of Mr. Lawrence at Falmouth in Casco Bay in September 1689, he was commending the strength of Mr. Burroughs, saying that none of us could do what he could. For, said he, Mr. Burroughs can hold out his gun with one hand. Mr. Burroughs, being present, explained where he took hold of the gun to hold it out, but he did not hold it out then. The gun was near a seven-feet barrel and very heavy. I could not hold it out with both hands long enough to take sight. In 1689, being in Captain Sergeant's garrison, Mr. Burroughs said he had carried a barrel of molasses or cider from a boat to the shore. Samuel Weber About eight years ago, I lived at Casco Bay, and George Burroughs was then minister there. Having heard much of his great strength, I conversed with him about it, and he then told me that he had put his fingers into the bung of a barrel of molasses, lifted it up, and carried it round him, and set it down again. Samuel Harris I formerly lived at the house of Burroughs in Falmouth, and often when he was absent conversed with his wife. He knew what was said, and told her on his return. There appears to have been some further testimony of which there is no record. The prisoner said little, made some attempt to explain away the testimony against him, but became confused. He handed in a paper to the jury, in which he utterly denied that there was any truth in the received notions of witchcraft. The jury returned a verdict of guilty, and he was sentenced to die. The Execution On the 19th of August, he was carried in a cart through the streets of Salem with others who were to die, Upon the latter, he made a calm and powerful address to the multitude, in which he asserted his innocence, with such solemn and serious expressions as were to the admiration of all present. He then made a prayer, concluding with the Lord's Prayer, which he repeated in a clear, sonorous tone, with entire exactness, and with a fervency that astonished. Many were affected to tears, and it seemed as if the spectators would hinder the execution, but the accusers cried that the devil assisted him. The execution proceeded, and the husband, the father, and the minister of God was violently sent to his long home. Cotton Mather, on horseback in the crowd, addressed the people, declaring that Burroughs was no ordained minister, insisted on his guilt, and asserted that the devil had often been transformed into an angel of light. When the body was cut down, it was dragged by the halter to a hole about a foot deep. It was stripped of its garments, and some old clothing of one executed being put upon the body, it was thrown in with two others, a part of it being left uncovered. After the death of Burroughs, it was related that the night before his execution there was a great witch-meeting at which the sacrament was administered, that Burroughs was present and took leave of his companions, bidding them hold fast to the faith, and make no confession. End of section 50。section 51 of American State Trials, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1. By John D. Lawson. Trial of Commander Alexander S. Mackenzie for murder before a naval court of inquiry, Brooklyn, New York, 1842, Part 1. The Narrative The Summers, a brig of war of the United States, sailed from New York on the 12th of September, 1842, under the command of Commander Alexander Slidell Mackenzie an officer for nearly thirty years in the service of his country. Footnote. 
Alexander Slidell Mackenzie, 1803 to 1848, born in New York City, was the son of John Slidell and the brother of the Louisiana senator of the same name who, going to England as a plenipotentiary from the federal government, was captured and taken from the British steamship Trent by Captain Wilkes in 1861, which incident came near causing war between the United States and England. The name of Mackenzie, that of his mother, he added in 1837 at the request of a maternal uncle. He entered the United States Navy as a midshipman in 1815, became lieutenant in 1825, and commander in 1841. After his acquittal by the court-martial, he was sent by President Polk on a mission to Cuba in 1846. He commanded a division of artillery in the Mexican War. Later he attained note as an author. His, A Year in Spain by a Young American, was very popular both in England and this country. He also wrote many other works of adventure and biography. And a footnote. To a distinguished man in his profession, he joined honors obtained in other fields of exertion, and the fame of the successful author enhanced the well-deserved reputation of the officer. The brig was small, a very swift sailor, with raking masts and mounting ten guns. Her crew consisted of 120 men, of whom 12 were officers, 9 ordinary seamen, 6 landsmen, and the remainder apprentice boys between the ages of 13 and 18 years, who had been detached from the receiving ship, North Carolina, lying at the port of New York on board of which was the naval school, holding the rank of a midshipman. Among the officers was Philip Spencer, son of Honorable John C. Spencer, at that time Secretary of War, and a conspicuous member of the cabinet of President Tyler. Footnote John Canfield Spencer, 1787 to 1855, born in New York, member of Congress, 1816, member of State Assembly, 1820, 1832, elected Secretary of State of New York in 1832, and appointed United States Secretary of War in 1841, was a successful lawyer and achieved his highest fame from his connection with the revision of the Statutes of New York. End of footnote. Before sailing, Commander Mackenzie had heard of previous misconduct on the part of Spencer, which had incurred the severe censure of the Navy Department. The circumstance, said Commander Mackenzie, of his connection with the high and distinguished officer of the government, by enhancing, if possible, his baseness, increased my desire to get rid of him. The brig's destination was the coast of Africa, where she was to convey dispatches to the sloop of war Vandalia, and to join that vessel in protecting our commerce. On our outward passage as far as Madeira, the usual regularity and order prevailed, the crew under good discipline, the rules of the service rigidly enforced, its exercises such as firing at targets and maneuvering the guns strictly attended to. In short, the brig was in as effective a condition as could have been expected, seeing that the crew was made up to so great an extent of young apprentices. Spencer did his duty and was treated by the commander like the other midshipmen. Perhaps, the commander said, he had reproved Spencer somewhat less than the others for slight deviations from the line of duty because he had little hope of essentially serving one who had proved to be so decidedly his own enemy. It was observed, however, that Spencer was in the habit of associating very little with the other officers, but was continually intimate with the crew, was in the habit of joking with them. He seemed to shun with care the company of his superiors, while he courted that of the older boys and the ordinary seamen of the vessel giving them occasionally money, and endeavoring to amuse them and attach them to himself. He drew from the purser a large quantity of tobacco and cigars, far more than any other officer, which he distributed among the apprentices and seamen, whose favor he seemed desirous to secure. On the day before leaving New York, he gave money to small and ordinary seamen, 
on the passage out, he gave money to Cromwell, the boatswain's mate, and he also corrupted the wardroom steward and induced him at different times to steal brandy, which he drank himself and distributed among his favorites of the crew. After the summer stopped at Madeira on her passage to the coast of Africa, a change took place in the conduct of the crew, and the influence of Spencer seemed to be gaining an ascendancy. In conversation he often betrayed his desire to have command of a vessel of his own. At the same time, his intimacy with Cromwell, Small, and others of the crew was observed to increase. His manner towards his messmates became more reserved, but among the crew he was loud and blasphemous in his abuse of the commander, declaring that it would give him real pleasure to roll that officer overboard from the round top. With the purser's steward, James W. Wells, the commander once had a trifling difficulty, which probably led Spencer to believe that this person could be drawn over to his designs. The attempt to do this resulted in the discovery of the plot. The brig had left Cape Palmas on the 11th of November for the United States, intending to stop at St. Thomas in order to take in a fresh supply of provisions and other necessaries. On the night of the 25th of November, between 6 and 8 o'clock in the evening, Wales was standing on deck when Spencer came up, and after a few remarks about the weather, asked him to get on top of the booms, as he had something very important to communicate. Wales, accordingly, contrary to a regulation of the ship, mounted the booms with him, and, after taking an oath of the most solemn secrecy, which, to his astonishment, was prescribed by Spencer with great seriousness, he obtained from the latter a full account of his plans. According to this account, Spencer was then lead with about twenty of the brig's company to take the brig, murder all her officers, and enter upon a career of piracy. The plan and stations of the men were arranged in a paper concealed in his cravat. He requested Wales to feel his neck handkerchief, who felt a rumpling there which showed it that there was paper in the back part of it. The affray was to be commenced some night when Spencer had the mid-watch. Several of his men would engage in a fight on the forecastle. He was to order them up to the mast, and under pretense of settling the difficulty, to call Mr. Rogers, the officer of the deck, whom they were to seize as soon as he came to the gangway, and throw overboard. They would then have the brig in their own possession. The keys of the arm chest, he said, he could lay his hands on at any moment. This was to be opened and the arms distributed. He was next to station his men on the hatches to prevent anyone from coming on deck, and then to proceed to the cabin and murder the commander with the least noise possible. He was then, with some of his men, to penetrate to the wardroom, and they have murdered the officers. The officers of the wardroom, he said, had no arms, except the first lieutenant, who had an old cutlass, which he should take care to secure before the affray commenced. This accomplished, he said he should go on deck and cause the two afterguns to be slewed round, so as to command the vessel from a raking position. He would then cause all the crew to be called up, and select from them such as would serve his purposes. The remainder, particularly the small boys, he should cause to be thrown overboard, as useless consumers of biscuit. This done, the brig was to proceed to Cape San Antonio, or to the Isle of Pines, and there take on board one who was familiar with their intended business, and who was ready and willing to join them. Then was to commence the career of piracy. Spencer dwelt with complacency upon the course to be pursued, and the pleasures to be enjoyed. Prizes were to be captured, and after taking from them whatever would be of use, all on board were to be murdered, except the women reserved for a more brutal purpose, and the ships scuttled, so that no tale of their fate should reach the shore. At this relation, Wales was too much astonished to make any reply. Spencer then called up Small, seaman with whom he had been intimate through the voyage. He addressed him in Spanish, but Wales could not tell, as he did not understand the language, what they were talking about. 
Small looked surprised, however, at what was told him. Spencer then remarked in English, Oh, you need not be under any apprehension or fear on his account, as I have sounded him pretty well, and find him one of us. Small seemed pleased, and remarked that he was very glad to hear it. He was then called away about his duty. Before going, Spencer remarked that he should have the mid-watch that night, and wished to have some further conversation relative to their plans. He desired Small, in the meantime, to see that foretop man, without naming him. Spencer then made overtures to Wales and offered, if he would join in the conspiracy, to give him the post of third officer in command. He then asked Wales what he thought of the project, to which the latter replied, thinking it prudent to dissemble in order to gain further information, that he was favorably disposed to it. Spencer remarked that they would have another interview on the next day, when he would exhibit the plan which he had drawn up. He followed Wales to the gangway, saying that if he lisped a syllable of what had been communicated to him, he should be murdered, either by Spencer himself or by other persons engaged in the plot, that, go where he might, his life would not be worth a straw. Wales promised secrecy, but resolved at once to communicate to his commander all that he had heard. He found himself so closely watched by Small and Spencer that he was foiled in his attempts that night. But the next morning, he succeeded in imparting it to the purser, Heiskell, who related it to Lieutenant Gavisport, by whom it was communicated to the commander. The latter received the communication with great coolness and expressed doubts of its truth. In his official dispatch, he says, that the whole affair seemed to him so monstrous that he treated it with ridicule. His impression was that Spencer had been amusing himself in Wales with some mere story of piracy and murder. He directed the lieutenant, however, to keep a careful watch upon Spencer and to report everything that appeared suspicious in his movements. At a later period of the day, the lieutenant, who had been an anxious observer of what passed, urged upon the commander the necessity of taking some active measures. The latter still replied that he wished to do nothing hastily, that they would keep a sharp lookout, and when the drum beat for evening quarters, decided what course it was best to pursue. On the drum beating to quarters, in the presence of all officers on the quarter deck, the commander directed the lieutenant to arrest Spencer and place him in irons, ordering further that he should be put to instant death if he was detected in speaking to or having communication with any of the crew. Spencer was searched, but nothing was found upon him except a few scraps of paper. On searching his locker, however, a razor case was found, and inside of it a piece of white paper on which were written what appeared to be strange characters, but which proved to be Greek, of which language Spencer had some knowledge. This paper was read by Midshipman Rogers and converted into English characters as follows. Certain. P. Spencer. Andrews. McKinley. Wales. Doubtful. Wilson. McKee. Warner. Green. Ganey. Wilson. Sullivan. Godfrey. Galea. Howard. To be kept, Nolens Volens, Sybil, Strummer, Scott, Van Brunt, Smith, Whitmore, Gazerly, Blackman, Waltham, Rodman, Clark, Nevers, Caesar, Corning, Richardson, the Doctor, Grieven. Those marked doubtful, with the cross opposite their names, will probably join before the plot is carried into execution. The remainder marked doubtful will probably join when the thing is done. If not, they must be forced. Any not marked down, who may wish to join after the thing is done, we will pick the best out and dispose of the rest. Wheel, McKee. Armchest, McKinley. Cabin, Spencer Small, Wilson. Wardroom, Spencer. Steerage, Spencer Small, Wilson. Small, as we have already seen, was an accomplice of Spencer. Various circumstances directed the suspicions of the officers towards Cromwell. Both of these persons were accordingly placed under arrest on the 28th of November. 
The anxieties of the officers continued to increase. The crew gathered from time to time in knots. Spencer was observed endeavoring to hold communication with some of them. On the 30th of November, four others, McKee, McKinley, Wilson, and Green, were placed under arrest. The prisoners, now amounting to seven, were all confined on the quarter deck. Owing to the contracted dimensions of the brig, there was no other place on board, which was more secure against an attempt at a rescue. But here it was difficult to prevent them from communicating with each other, and they interfered essentially with the management of the vessel. At the time they were confined, it was the evident intention of the commander to take them to the United States, to be delivered up to the justice of their country. To effect his desired object, he tried every measure that a brave, prudent, and skillful officer could adopt. But during the confinement of the prisoners, sullenness, discontent, inattention to duty, disobedience to orders, often, as seamen know, and naval records establish, the precursors of open acts of violence were manifested by the crew. Feeling the necessity of immediate action and desiring all the counsel the officers of the vessel could give him, Commander Mackenzie, on the 30th of November, addressed to his officers a letter in which he called upon them to take into deliberate and dispassionate consideration the present condition of the vessel and the contingencies of every nature throughout the remainder of the crew, and then furnish him their united counsel as to the course proper to be pursued. On the receipt of this letter, they assembled in the ward room and commenced the examination of witnesses. These were duly sworn in their testimony written down and subscribed by each witness after it had been read over to him. The officers passed the whole day in the performance of this duty. Without interruption or without food, the commander remained in charge of the deck, with the three young midshipmen on constant duty. On the morning of Thursday, the 1st of December, the officers again assembled in the cabin and, after a further consultation, addressed the commander the following letter, expressing their unanimous opinion that the safety of the brig required the immediate execution of Spencer, Cromwell, and Small. Sir, in answer to your letter of yesterday, requesting our counsel as to the best course to be pursued with the prisoners, acting midshipman Philip Spencer, boatswain's mate Samuel Cromwell, and seaman Elijah Small, we would state that the evidence that has come to our knowledge is of such a nature that, after as dispassionate and deliberate a consideration of the case as the exigency of the time would admit, we have come to a cool, decided, and unanimous opinion that they have been guilty of a full and determined intention to commit a mutiny on board of this vessel of a most atrocious nature, and that the revelation of the circumstances having made it necessary to confine others with them, the uncertainty as to what extent they are leagued with others still at large, the impossibility of guarding against the contingencies which, a day or an hour may bring forth. We are convinced that it would be impossible to carry them to the United States, and that the safety of the public property, the lives of ourselves, and of those committed to our charge, requires that, giving them a sufficient time to prepare, that they should be put to death, and a man of best calculated as an example, to make a beneficial impression upon the disaffected. This opinion we give, bearing in mind our duty to our God, our country, and to the service. The commander concurred in the opinion of his officers. The three chief mutineers were the only persons capable of navigating the vessel, and their execution would leave the rest without knowledge or confidence. By their execution, the very eye of the mutiny would be put out, and the monster left dispirited to grope in darkness. It is not necessary to dwell long on the painful scene which ensued. The three prisoners were executed on the 1st of December, 1842. At the time of the execution, the brig was 525 miles distant from St. Thomas, at which place she arrived on the 5th of December. Previous to their death, Spencer and Small both confessed their guilt, 
in the presence of the officers and crew, and acknowledged that their punishment was just. Spencer added that he had attempted a mutiny on board the two national vessels in which he had last sailed, and that his piratical propensity was a sort of mania. On his arrival in New York, Commander Mackenzie asked for a court of inquiry on his conduct. This court was composed of three officers, than whom none were more distinguished in our naval service. Captain Stewart, President, Commodore Dallas, and Commodore Jones. They were authorized to inquire into all the facts touching the alleged mutiny on board the Summers, and the conduct of Commander Mackenzie in ordering the execution of Spencer, Cromwell, and Small, and to report to the Department their opinion as to the right and propriety of those proceedings. During nineteen days, they examined every officer, seaman, and apprentice belonging to the Summers, with the exception of ten of the crew who were in confinement. The unanimous opinion was that a mutiny had been organized on board the Summers to murder the officers and take the brig, that Spencer, Cromwell, and Small were the ringleaders, that the execution of the three was necessary for the safety of the lives of the officers and crew, and that the commander's act was justifiable and necessary. Later, a court-martial was ordered, which lasted forty days, but whose conclusions were the same, and the honorable acquittal of the commander was confirmed by the President of the United States. The Trial Footnote Bibliography Proceedings of the Court of Inquiry appointed to inquire into the intended mutiny on board the United States Brig of War Summers on the high seas, held on board the United States ship North Carolina lying at the Navy Yard, New York, with a full account of the execution of Spencer, Cromwell, and Small, on board said vessel, reported for the New York Tribune. New York, Greeley and McElleth, 160 Nassau Street. Tribune Buildings, opposite the park, 1843. The pamphlet has a full-page woodcut of Commander Mackenzie, taken by an excellent artist while attending the Court of Inquiry. It has also two cuts of the different decks of the Summers, also a full-page picture of the Summers under full sail. It has also a facsimile of the paper found in Spencer's locker. End of footnote. Before the Naval Court of Inquiry, Brooklyn, New York, December 1842. Captain Charles Stewart, President. Commander A.J. Dallas. Commander Jacob Jones. Footnote. Charles Stewart, 1778-1869. Born in Philadelphia, a midshipman, afterwards lieutenant and commander, took part in the Tripolitan War, 1804. Captain of the famous Constitution called Old Ironsides, 1814, awarded the thanks of Congress for his services in the War of 1812. Commander of Mediterranean Squadron, 1820. Pacific Squadron, 1824. Philadelphia Navy Yard, 1854-61. Became Rear Admiral, 1862. Alexander James Dallas, 1791 to 1844. Born in Philadelphia, became Lieutenant U.S. Navy, 1810. Took part in the War of 1812. Port Captain, 1828. Commander West Indies Squadron, 1835. Pacific Squadron, 1843. Jacob Jones, 1768 to 1850. Born in Delaware. Graduated from U.S. Naval Academy with Commodore Barry and at Tripoli, where he was captured, later captured by the British, 1812, with fleet that defeated the Day of Algiers. Later commander of the Mediterranean Pacific U.S. Squadron, was in command of the Baltimore Station and port captain of New York. End of footnote. December 28th. The Court of Inquiry appointed by the Secretary of the Navy to investigate the mutiny on board the United States Brig of War, Summers, met today on board the receiving ship, North Carolina, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Ogden Hoffman, Judge Advocate for the Government. Footnote. Ogden Hoffman, 1793-1856, to 1856, 
born in New York City, graduated from Columbia College 1812, entered U.S. Navy as midshipman 1814, and resigned in 1816, studied law and was admitted to bar in 1826, became a law partner of Hugh Maxwell, then District Attorney of New York City, and succeeded him in that office in 1829, Member of Congress 1836, U.S. District Attorney 1845, Attorney General of New York 1853. He has been styled the Erskine of the American Bar. He was probably the most consummate criminal lawyer that America has produced. In the history of the bench and bar of New York, it is said, Robinson, indicted for the murder of Helen Jewett, a gay woman, was acquitted wholly owing to Hoffman's eloquence and tact. The evidence against him being apparently overwhelming. See Post, Volume 3, Richard B. Robinson. His son was federal judge of California from its admission as a state until 1891. John Hone of the New York Bar appeared at the request of Commander Mackenzie, not as counsel, but to take minutes of the proceedings of the court. The judge advocate read the warrant from Secretary Upshaw, constituting the court and authorizing it to inquire into all the facts touching the alleged mutiny on the Summers and the conduct of Commander Mackenzie in ordering the execution of Midshipman Philip Spencer, Samuel Cromwell, and Elijah Small, and to report its opinions as to the right and propriety of these proceedings. Footnote. Abel Parker Upshaw, 1790 to 1844, born in Northampton, Virginia, admitted to Richmond Bar, 1824, member of state legislature, 1826, judge of general court, Virginia, 1826 to 1841, member of the state constitutional convention, 1829, secretary of the Navy and President Tyler's cabinet, 1841 to 1843, Secretary of State, 1843 to 1844, author of the State Rights Theory of the Constitution, 1840, also a number of political papers, was accidentally killed by the explosion of a gun on board the United States Man of War, Princeton, on the Potomac River, February 28, 1844. The following are the Articles of the Naval Law of the United States in reference to mutiny on board the men of war. Article 24, Law of 1789, Mutiny and Sedition. Any officer, seaman, marine, or other person who shall disobey the orders of his superior or begin, excite, cause, or join in any mutiny or sedition in the ship to which he belongs, or in any ship or vessel in the service of the United States, on any pretense whatsoever, shall suffer death or such other punishment as a court-martial shall direct, and farther, any person in any ship or vessel belonging to the service aforesaid, who shall utter any words of sedition and mutiny, or endeavor to make any mutinous assembly, on any pretense whatsoever, shall suffer such a punishment as a court-martial shall inflict. Article 13, Law of 1800. If any person in the Navy shall make or attempt to make any mutinous assembly, he shall, on conviction thereof, by a court-martial, suffer death. And if any person force it shall utter any seditious and mutinous words, or shall conceive or connive at any mutinous or seditious practices, or shall treat with contempt his superior, being in the execution of his office, or being witness to any mutiny or sedition, shall not do his utmost to suppress it, he shall be punished at the discretion of a court-martial. Article 14. No officer or private in the Navy shall disobey the lawful orders of his superior officer, or strike him, or draw, or offer to draw, or raise any weapon against him while in the execution of the duties of his office, on pain of death, or such other punishment as a court-martial shall inflict. End of footnote. End of section 51. Section 52 of American State Trials, Volume 1. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Commander Alexander S. McKenzie for murder before a naval court of inquiry, Brooklyn, New York, 1842. Part 2. December 30th, Commander Mackenzie's Statement The President called upon the commander for his narrative of the case, which he handed to the judge advocate who read it as follows. Since my arrival at this port, I have been diligently engaged in preparing for the department at Washington a full and detailed narrative of all the circumstances connected with the mutiny on board the U.S. Brig of War, Summers, on her recent voyage from Africa, but having been frequently interrupted, especially by the solicitude of friends, I have been forced to relinquish my first intention and to confine myself entirely to a sketch of the principal occurrences. After leaving the Azores and Madeira in October, I proceeded, according to orders, to Tenerife and Porto Praia. Thence I went to Liberia, expecting to find the U.S. sloop of war Vandalia, but on arriving there I learned that she had sailed on the 5th of October for the United States as I understood, the dispatches with which I was entrusted for her, being thus rendered of no use, were left with the U.S. agent, whose receipt for them is enclosed. On the 11th of November, I sailed to the United States via St. Thomas, where I thought it necessary to take in a supply of bread, water, and other refreshments. On Saturday, the 25th of November, Lieutenant Gens aboard came into the cabin and informed me that he had learned from midshipman Wales that a conspiracy existed on board the ship to capture the vessel, to murder the captain, bring over as many of the crew as possible, murder the rest, and convert the vessel into a pirate and that midshipman Spencer was at the head of the conspiracy. This, Lieutenant Gans of Wood, said, had been told to him by midshipman Wales, whose narration was as follows. On the night of the 25th of November, between six and eight o'clock in the evening, Wales said he was aroused by Spencer, who asked him to go upon the booms, as he had something to say to him. He got up, and on arriving at the booms, he was asked by Spencer, Do you fear death? Do you fear a dead man? Do you fear to kill a man? Wales, with admirable coolness, induced Spencer to go on, took the oath of secrecy, and entered into all his plans. Spencer told him that he had about twenty men in his plot, that they would easily get possession of the ship, murder the commander and officers, and commence piracy. He gave Wales all the details of his plan, which were admirably suited for his purpose, and arranged much better, Mr. Wales said, than he could have done it himself. As an inducement to embark in the enterprise, Spencer said that a large box of wine on board contained a large amount of gold and other treasure. His object was to go to the Isle of Pines, where one of his associates, who had been a pirate before, had a confederate that he would attack no vessels that he could not capture, and destroy all he captured, that he would select from them such females as were proper, use them, and then dispose of them, that he had all the details of the plan drawn out on a paper, which was in the back of his cravat. He showed money to Mr. Wales, and, before separating, threatened him with instant death if he ever revealed what he had told him. Such was the purport of the information which I received. To me, the whole affair seemed so monstrous that I treated it with ridicule and believed that Spencer had been amusing himself and Wales with some story of piracy he had learned from some novel or tale of murder. Still, I could not help feeling that it was sporting with the serious subject and that my duty required me to be upon my guard, and I resolved closely to watch the movements of Spencer. I directed the first lieutenant to observe him very narrowly. I learned that in the course of the day Spencer had been in the wardroom for some time and had busied himself in examining a chart of the West Indies 
and that he had made some inquiries concerning the Isle of Pines. The lieutenant told him that he believed it was a place much frequented by pirates, and dryly asked him if he had any acquaintances there. Spencer passed the day sullenly, and was often observed to be examining a paper, and writing with a pencil, and making rings with his penknife. Lieutenant Gaines of Worth soon after made some excuse for following him to the foretop, when he found him engaged in working some love devices upon his arm. He expressed a desire to learn the rate of the chronometer, and was referred to the Master of Marines. He was frequently seen engaged in holding secret conferences with both in Cromwell and Small, and was known to have given money to different persons of the crew. He had also incited the steward to steal brandy, which he had given to the crew, and with which he had once or twice got drunk himself. I have thought it due to the wardroom officers to state the circumstances connected with their having brandy on board. When the vessel was first equipped, I told the first lieutenant that it was my desire that no liquor should be used in the steerage of the vessel, and gave as a reason for this that the obligations of hospitality always fell upon the captain and his under-officers, and that upon such occasions all should have their share. This hint had its intended effect, and I never had occasion to use compulsion, knowing that Lieutenant Gaines of Ward viewed the matter in the same light I did not interfere with the arrangements of the wardroom, and if I had done so, it would only have been in the way of friendly advice. It now appears that when the vessel was ordered to the coast of Africa, a supply of brandy had been ordered on board by one who had previously been on the same voyage, and who thought it would be a good defense against the malaria of that coast. By accident, as I then thought, but by design, as subsequent developments have made probable, the steward ordered the brandy from two different grocers, so that double the quantity required was brought on board. None of this was used by the mess or by any others than Spencer and those whom he endeavored to corrupt. Spencer had the faculty of throwing his lower jaw out of joint and of thus playing with it a variety of musical airs, and he was frequently found thus amusing the crew. In his intercourse with me, he was servile to the last degree, but among the crew I learned that he was loudly and blasphemously vituperative against me, and that he had often abused me in the most outrageous and violent terms, and declared that it would give him real pleasure to roll me overboard from the round top. I found that he had drawn a representation of a black flag, and asked members of the crew what they thought of it that he had often said the vessel could be easily taken, that he had not long before examined the palms of the hands of one of the midshipmen to tell his fortune, and had predicted for him a speedy and violent death. These things induced me to look back over all I had heard or observed of the summers, when young Spencer first reported himself to me for duty on board my vessel. I gave him my hand and welcomed him on board. I heard not long after that he had been involved in difficulty when on the Brazil station, and that he had been dismissed for drunkenness. Upon hearing this, I earnestly desired his removal from my vessel, principally on account of the young men I had with me, two of whom were connected with me by blood, two by alliance, and four were entrusted to my especial care. The circumstance of his connection with the high and distinguished officer of the government, by enhancing, if possible, his baseness, increased my desire to get rid of him. On this point, I beg that I may not be misunderstood. I revere authority, and in this Republican country I regard its exercise as an evidence of genius, intelligence, and virtue. But I have no respect for the base son of an honored father. On the contrary, the conduct of that man who sullies by his crimes, the pure fame and the high honor of his parent, seems to me to be far more base than one equally guilty from a humbler station. But I wish nothing to do with baseness in any shape, least of all on board a vessel belonging to the United States. On this account, I wish to get rid of Spencer. Two others soon after joined the vessel. 
and thus seven were obliged to occupy the space fitted only for five. I had heard that Spencer had expressed a willingness to be transferred and hoped that he would now consent. I desired Lieutenant Gansaford to state to Mr. Spencer that if he would apply to Commodore Perry to detach him from the Summers, I would second his application. The application was accordingly made, and I seconded it, earnestly urging that it might be granted in order to secure the comfort of the young officers. Commodore Perry, however, declined to detach Midship and Spencer, but said he would consent to detach Mr. Rogers. I could not, however, consent to part with Mr. Rogers, whom I had long known to be an accomplished seaman, a gentleman and an officer of the highest attainments, both in and beyond his profession. The summers accordingly sailed with seven in the steerage. They could not all sit down together at the table. Two of them had no lockers, but slept upon the steerage deck, and subjected themselves to considerable inconvenience, to all which, however, they readily submitted without the slightest murmur or complaint, and performed every duty which fell to them to the perfect satisfaction of all the officers. All these things I called to recollection and endeavored carefully to review the whole conduct of Spencer. I had treated him precisely as I treated other midshipmen, though I had perhaps reproved him somewhat less than the others, a slight deviations from the strict line of his duty. This arose from my conviction that there could be but little hope of essentially serving one who had proved to be so decidedly his own enemy. I observed that he was in the habit of associating but little with the other officers, but that he was continually intimate with the crew. He was often in the habit of joking with them and smiling whenever he met them, with a smile never known but on such occasions, and I had frequently observed in him a strange flashing of the eye. Recalling these things in addition to what had been revealed, I resolved at once to make myself sure of his person, though I thought that I would first let Mr. Wales have another interview with him and obtain further knowledge of his mutinous plans. If he was really in earnest enough, however, was already known. In the evening I gave orders to Mr. Perry, my clerk, to have all the officers come aft upon the quarter-deck. When they were brought up, I approached Spencer and addressed him thus. I understand, sir, that you aspire to the command of the Summers. With a deferential air, he replied, Oh, no, sir. Did you not, said I, tell Mr. Wills that you had a mutinous project on foot, that you intended to kill the commander and the officers of the Summers, and such of the crew, as you could not seduce to your plans and to enter upon a course of piracy? I may have told him something like that, he replied, but it was only a joke. You admit, then, that you told him of such a plan. Yes, sir. This, sir, I continued, you must know, is joking upon a forbidden subject. This joke, sir, may cost you your life. Be pleased, sir, to remove your neck handkerchief. He did so. I took it and opened it, but there was nothing in it. I asked him what he had done with the paper that was in it. The paper, he said, which had been in it contained my day's work, and I destroyed it. It is a strange place, sir, said I, to keep your accounts. He acquiesced with an air of the greatest deference and blandness. I said to him, Your design was to make yourself commander of this vessel. You must have been aware that you could compass it only by passing over my dead body and over the dead bodies of all the officers of the Summers. You had laid out for yourself, sir, a great deal to do. It is my duty to confine you. Turning to Lieutenant Gronzeport, I said, Arrest Mr. Spencer and place him in double irons. Lieutenant Gansaford would step forward and receive from Mr. Spencer his sword. Mr. Spencer was then ordered to sit down. He did so. Double irons were then put upon him, as were also handcuffs for the sake of greater security. I directed the Lieutenant Gansaford to place a watch over Mr. Spencer and to give orders to put him to instant death if he was detected in speaking or holding any communication with any of the crew. 
the nature of these orders was told to Mr. Spencer. At the same time, I directed him to allow him every possible indulgence consistent with his safekeeping. The task was executed by Lieutenant Gansford with the greatest kindness and humanity, while he watched with an eagle eye over all his movements and was ready at a moment's warning to take his life upon a violation of those conditions on which his safety depended. He attended to all his wants, covered him with his own garment from the squalls of rain by which we were visited, and ministered in every way to his comfort with all the tenderness and acidity of a woman. The officers were then remanded to quarters, the crew and batteries were inspected, the orders were repeated, and the retreat was beaten. The officers of the watch were all directed to be fully armed with cutlasses and pistols, with rounds of ammunition, and everything was put in order for the night. On searching the locker of Spencer, a razor case was found in it, which he had recently drawn from the purser. On opening it, there was no razor within, but in its stead a piece of paper in which was rolled another. On the inner paper was written a string of characters, afterwards found to be Greek letters, with which Spencer was known to be familiar. It fortunately happened that there was on board another individual, who was well acquainted with the Greek, one whose knowledge of this, as of everything else, was devoted wholly to the service of his country. The Greek characters, on being converted into our own language by Mr. Henry Rogers, proved to contain the plan for the proposed mutiny. There was a list of the different members of the crew, some of whom were marked certain and others doubtful. Some were marked to be kept at all events, and others to be destroyed. Those were designated who were to do the work of murder in the various apartments. Others were to open the arm chest, and the stations of all were assigned. The following day was Sunday, and all were to be inspected at ten o'clock. I took my station aft for the purpose of observing Cromwell and Small, as they should come along upon the quarter-deck. The persons of both were faultlessly clean and neat, they being determined that their appearances should provoke no reproof on account of fault in that particular. Cromwell stood up to his full stature, carrying his battle-axe firmly and steadily, his cheeks pale, but his eyes fixed to starboard. He wore a determined and dangerous air. Small presented a very different figure. His appearance was ghastly, his manner uneasy. He shifted his weight from side to side and his battle axe from hand to hand. His eye was never for a moment fixed, but always turned from me. I attribute his conduct to fear, though I now believe the business upon which he had entered was repugnant to his nature, but that his love for money and rum was too strong for his fidelity. Five bells, or ten o'clock, was the time for divine service. The first lieutenant asked if he should call the roll. I told him it would be best to wait till the time was up. Five bells struck and all were called to muster. The crew were all present, were unusually attentive, and their responses were more than ordinarily full and audible. In the examination, their countenances exhibited nothing to excite distrust. In the afternoon, the sky sails and studding sails were set. Gaisley, one of the best of the apprentices, was sent aloft on the royal yard to make some alteration in the rigging. At once a sudden jerk was given to the brace by Small and another, who has not been discovered, and the fore top mast with the top sail, gallant stay sail and head gaff top sail, at once came down. Gaisley was on the royal yard. I scarcely dared to look to see the spot where the boy should fall. The next moment his shadow appeared at the masthead, and I presently discovered him examining, with admirable coolness, what was to be done. I did not dare to believe this carrying away of the topmast, the work of treachery, but I knew that an occasion of this sort, such as the loss of the boy, which should create confusion and interrupt the duty of the officers, would be sought by them if they were bent on the prosecution of the enterprise. All possible measures were taken to prevent confusion, the rigging was immediately restored and the sails bent afresh. Every member of the crew was employed, 
and all things were made to go on with regularity. To my astonishment, upon the occurrence of this disaster, all the conspirators who were named in the program of Spencer, no matter in what part of the vessel they were engaged at the time, immediately mustered at the mainmast, whether animated by some newborn zeal to serve their country, or intending to carry out their designs, I cannot say. This circumstance at once confirmed my belief in the continued existence of the danger. The eye of Spencer traveled continuously to the masthead, and he cast quick and stealthy glances about, as he had not done before. The wreck was soon cleared away and supper piped. After supper, the same persons mustered at masthead, and the sails were set. After quarters, they dispersed. Still, I did not think it safe to leave Cornwall at liberty during the night, which was emphatically the season of danger. After consulting with Lieutenant Gans aboard, I determined to arrest Cromwell. An officer was sent to guard the rigging. I met Cromwell at the foot of the Jacob's Ladder, going aft, and stopped him. I asked him about the conversation he had had with Spencer. He denied that it was he, and said, It was not me, sir. It was small. Cromwell was the tallest man on board the vessel, and Small the shortest. Cromwell was immediately put in irons. Small, being thus accused by an associate, was also ironed. The utmost vigilance was enjoined upon the officers. All were armed, and either myself or the first lieutenant was constantly on deck. The next morning, which was Monday the 28th of November, two crimes of considerable magnitude came to light. One of the men had been detected in stealing from a boat, and the steward had stolen money and given some of it to Spencer. This was no time to relax the discipline of the ship, and both the men were punished to the extent of the law. It was soon after found that a man named Waltham had told McKinley where three bottles of wine were placed and offered them to him. McKinley was stationed near the arm chest and reported this to the first lieutenant. Punishment of Waltham, however, was postponed till the next day. Punishment of the other two being over, I thought that a fit opportunity to endeavor to make an impression upon the crew. I could reason to think that the danger of the conspiracy was not over. I believed that a majority of the crew might be said to be, in general, disaffected and disposed to resist discipline. Some mysterious agency had evidently been at work since his departure of the summers from New York, and this was now disclosed. I explained to the crew the general nature of Spencer's plot and the atrocious character of the designs he had formed. I took a special care not to betray a suspicion that I thought any particular one of them was deeply implicated, but exhorted all of them to repent of their intentions and attend faithfully to their duty. I took care to assure them that the majority of the crew must at all events share the fate of the officers. I strove to divert their minds from the pictures of success of vice which Spencer had presented to them. I brought up before them the images of friends at home. I endeavored to impress upon their minds the endearing nature of those ties of kindred from which Spencer had sought to sever them forever, and expressed the hope that within three weeks we would all be again among our friends. I thanked God that he had provided them all with dear friends who were deeply interested in their welfare, and that they had the prospect of so soon becoming once more among them. The effect of my address on them was various. Many of them seemed delighted at their narrow delivery, and others seemed struck with horror at the thought of the terrible danger they had escaped. Some seemed overwhelmed with terror at the anticipation of punishment, that awaited them. Others were overcome by thoughts of returning home, and wept profusely at the mention of the friends they hoped so soon to see. I could not help believing that all the crew were now tranquil, and that the vessel was again safe. Having observed that Spencer was endeavoring to hold intelligence with some of them, I directed the faces of all prisoners to be turned aft, and that no tobacco should be allowed them, when the supply they had upon their persons at the time of their arrest should be exhausted. I told them that I would see that they had everything necessary for their comfort, that each should have his ration, that they should be abundantly supplied with everything necessary 
for their health and convenience. But I told them that tobacco was only a stimulant, and that, as I wished their minds to become as quiet and tranquil as possible, I could not allow them to use it. The day after Spencer's tobacco was stopped, his spirit gave way. He would sit for a long time with his face buried in his cloak, and when he raised his head, his face was bathed in tears. He was touched by the kind attention of Mr. Gans of Wood. He told him that he was not then in a state to speak of anything, but that he would the next day tell him all, would answer any question that might be put to him. End of section 52 Section 53 of American State Trials, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson Trial of Commander Alexander S. McKenzie for murder before Naval Court of Inquiry, Brooklyn, New York. 1842, Part 3 On Tuesday after quarters, all hands were again called to witness punishment, and Waltham was punished to the extent of the law for offering three bottles of wine to McKinley. I then spoke to the crew of the necessity of conforming in all particulars to the orders of the vessel which were known. I told them that every punishment inflicted on board must be made known to the Secretary of the Navy, and that the less they were in amount, the greater would be the credit that would attach to the commander and the crew. But the whole crew, I soon found, were far from tranquil. They collected in knots upon the deck. Seditious words were heard among them, and they assumed an insolent and menacing tone. Some of the petty officers were examined and found to be true to the colors, but it was the general impression that the vessel was far from being safe. There was reason to fear that, on that very night, a rescue would be attempted. I obtained a variety of intelligence concerning conferences among the disaffected. Individuals whom I had not supposed to be implicated were found closely associated with several who were known to be among the disaffected, and several times there were symptoms that they were about to strike the blow. Mr. Wills, once detected C. A. Wilson in drawing out a hand spike from his place, and on presenting his cock pistol at him, he only offered some lame excuse. I became exceedingly anxious and remained constantly on deck. At twelve o'clock the watch was called. McKinley Green and one or two others missed their muster. They could not be asleep, and why they should be absent just at that time, when they never had been before was not easy to be seen. When they appeared, they all had some lame excuse. They probably had agreed to meet at that time and to commence some act of violence. Green said he could not get aft. I sent him forward and ordered him to take the forward lookout for four hours. I directed a close watch to be kept up and distributed the others in a similar manner. At four o'clock, others missed their muster. I heard of this with the greatest uneasiness. Where, I asked, was this to end? If the men upon a bright night like this see muteness and disposed to undertake the rescue of those confined, on a bad night, in a storm, in the midst of utter darkness, how much greater will be the probability of a rescue? If all suspected should be ironed, would the danger be over? What sympathy might not be felt for the prisoners? These matters crowded upon my mind. I considered the imminent peril which hung over the lives of the officers and crew. I thought of the seas traversed in every direction by merchantmen, unharmed and defenseless. I thought of what was due to the interest of commerce, to the safety of the lives of thousands upon the deep, to the sanctity of the American flag entrusted to my care, and to my own honor. All these considerations impressed me with the absolute necessity of adopting so far the means of security for the vessel which had been given to my charge. I took counsel with the first lieutenant and was fortified in my purposes 
I finding his opinion identical with my own. In so grave a case involving so many interests and such high responsibilities, I felt desirous of having the opinion of all my officers upon the matter, though not a shadow of doubt remained on my mind of the guilt of the prisoners, should the execution be deemed necessary. I did not forget that the officers were still boys, and that all the responsibility of the proceeding must rest upon the older and higher officers. Still, I felt desirous to have their opinion, and accordingly addressed them the following letter. U.S. Brick Summers, November 30th, 1842. Gentlemen, I am desirous of availing myself of your counsel in the very responsible position in which I find myself placed. You are aware of the circumstances which have resulted in the confinement of Midshipman Spencer, of Boston's mate Cromwell, and of Seaman Small, and I purposely abstain from entering into details concerning them. Necessarily ignorant as I am of the extent of disaffection among the crew, who have so long been tampered with, and knowing the suspicion which attaches to some of the crew who are at large, I address you and ask your united counsel as to the best course now to be pursued, and I call upon you to take into deliberate and dispassionate consideration the conduct which will be necessary for a safe continuance of the remainder of our course, and to enlighten me with your opinion as to the proper method to be pursued. I am your obedient servant, Alex Slidell Mackenzie, Commander, Lieutenant Gansevoort, and others. After I had written this letter, but before I had sent it at about nine o'clock, Wilson, being foiled in his attempt to get up an outbreak at night, and feeling that he was narrowly watched and was no longer left at liberty, came forward and made some lame and worthless confession, and requested that he might not be put in irons. I told him that if he had made any real confession in sincerity and truth, he should not be molested, but that it was an insult to his officer to offer him so lame a story as that he had told. Nothing more could be got out of him, and he was immediately put in irons. While on the African coast, I knew that he had procured an extraordinary knife, broad in the middle, and running to a point. He had made it very sharp on both sides. It was a singular weapon, of no use except to kill. He had been seen also the day before sharpening his battle-axe with a file, and had brought one part of it to an edge. This was a thing never allowed or known before on board. McKinley was now arrested. He was evidently the individual in every way, the most formidable of all concerned. McKee was also put in irons. They were made to sit down, and when the irons were put on, I walked around the batteries followed by Lieutenant Gans aboard and made a careful inspection. On the receipt of my letter, the officers immediately assembled and entered upon the examination of witnesses, who were sworn in their testimony written down. In addition to this, each witness signed the evidence he gave. In this employment, the officers passed the whole day without interruption and without taking the least food. I remained myself in charge of the deck. The officers were excused from watch duty, and the watches were so arranged that two in succession fell to me. On the 1st December, the first lieutenant resented me with the following letter. U.S. Brig Summers, December 1st, 1842. Sir, in answer to your letter requiring our counsel as to the best course to be pursued with regard to the prisoners Spence, Cromwell, and Small, we have the honor to state that the evidence which has come to our knowledge after the most careful, deliberate, and dispassionate consideration which the exigency would allow is of such a nature as to call for the most decided action. We are convinced that in the existing state of things it will be impossible to carry the prisoners to the United States. We think that safety, our lives and honor to the flag entrusted to our charge, requires that the prisoners be put to death, as the course best calculated to make a salutary impression upon the rest of the crew. In this decision, we trust we have been guided by our duty to God, to our country, 
enter the service. Respectfully, your obedient servants, Lieutenant Gansevoort and others. Commander Mackenzie. I at once concurred in the justice of this opinion and made preparations to carry the recommendation into effect. Two other conspirators were almost as guilty as the three singled out for execution. They could be kept confined without extreme danger to the ultimate safety of the vessel. The three chief mutineers were the only ones capable of navigating and sailing the vessel. By their removal, all motive to capture the vessel and carry out the original design would be at once taken away. Their lives were justly forfeited, and the interest of the country, the safety of the sea, and the honor of the flag required the sacrifice. In the necessity of my position, I found my law, and in that necessity I trust for justification. I thought it best to arm the petty officers. On this point only the first lieutenant differed from me, and I found that he was of the same opinion with some of the petty officers themselves. They said that since I could not tell whom to trust, it would be best to trust no one. I made up my own mind, and judged of the characters whom I could trust, and determined to arm them. I ordered to be issued to each a cutlass, a pistol, and cartridges. I ordered preparations also to be made for the execution of the three. All hands were called to witness punishment. The whips were arranged. The officers were stationed about the deck, and the petty officers were directed to cut down everyone who should let go his whip or fail to haul when ordered. I put on my full uniform, came on deck, and proceeded to execute the most painful duty that ever devolved upon any officer in the American Navy, the announcement to the prisoners of the fate that awaited them. I approached Spencer and said to him, you are about to take my life, Mr. Spencer, without provocation, without cause or the slightest offense. You intended to kill me suddenly, in the night while I was buried in sleep, without giving me a single moment to send one word of affection to my wife, one prayer to God for her welfare. Your life is now forfeited, and the necessity of the case compels me to take it. I do not intend, however to imitate you in the mode of claiming the sacrifice. If there be in your breast one feeling true to nature, you will be grateful for the premature disclosure of your horrible designs. You surely ought to be thankful that you have been prevented from the terrible deeds you meditated. If you have any word to send to your father, any satisfaction to express to him that you were not allowed to become a pirate, as you ought to do, you will have ten minutes granted in which to write it. Midshipman Thompson was then directed to note the time and inform me when it had expired. Spencer seemed overcome with emotion. He burst into a flood of tears, sank on his knees, and said he was not fit to die. I repeated to him his catechism and begged him to offer sincere prayers for the divine forgiveness. I recommended to him the English prayer book assuring him that he would find in it something suited to all his necessities. Cromwell fell upon his knees, protesting his innocence and invoking the name of his wife. Spencer declared that Cromwell was innocent and begged that this might be believed. This, I confess, staggered me, but the evidence of his guilt was conclusive. Lieutenant Gansevoort said that there was not a shadow of a doubt of it. The petty officer said he was the one man from whom real apprehension was entertained. He was at first the accomplice of Spencer, and was then urged on by him, and had been by him turned to his account. I tried to show him how Spencer had endeavored to use him, and told Spencer that he had made remarks about him he would not consider flattering. He expressed great anxiety to know what they were. I told him Cromwell had said of him, and another person, that there was a damned fool on one side and a damned knave on the other, and told him that Cromwell would have allowed him to live only so long as he could have made him useful to himself. This roused him, and from that time he said no more of Cromwell's innocence. Subsequent circumstances made me believe that Spencer wished to save him, 
probably from the hope that he would yet get possession of the vessel and carry out his original design, and perhaps that Cromwell would in some way affect his rescue. He endeavored at the same time to persuade me that Small was only an alias for someone else on his list, though this was proved to be false. Small alone was the one we had set down as the poltroon of the three, yet he received the announcement of his fate with great composure. He was asked what preparations he wished to make. He said he had none. Nobody cares for me, said he, but my poor old mother, and I would rather she should not know what has become of me. I returned to Spencer. I asked him what message he had to send to his friends. He said none. Tell them that I die wishing them every blessing and happiness. I deserve death for this and my other crimes. There are few crimes I have not committed. I am sincerely penitent for them all. I only feel my repentance is too late. I asked him if there was anyone whom he had injured to whom he could make reparation, anyone who was suffering obliquely on his account. He said no, but this will kill my poor mother. I did not know before that he had a mother and was touched by his allusion to her. I asked him if it would not have been far more dreadful if he had succeeded in his attempt if it were not much better to die as he would than to become a pirate and to steep himself so terribly in blood and guilt. He said, I do not know what would have become of me if I had succeeded. I told him that Cromwell would soon have made away with him and that McKinley would probably have destroyed them both. He said he feared this would injure his father. Had you succeeded, I replied, the injury you would have done him would have been much greater. If it had been possible to take him home, as I at first intended, I told him that he would have got clear, as in America a man with money and influential friends would always be cleared, that the course I was taking would injure his father less than if he should go home and be condemned yet again escape. Perhaps this is an extreme and erroneous opinion, and not just, but I am merely stating facts, what passed on the occasion. He said that he had attempted the same thing on board the John Adams and the Potomac, but had been unsuccessful. He asked if I had not exaggerated the danger. I told him, no, that his attempts to corrupt the crew had been too widely successful, that I knew of the existence of the conspiracy, but did not know how extensive it was. I recapitulated to him his acts. He was startled when I told him of his stealing brandy. He admitted the justice of his fate, but asked me if I was not going too far and too fast. Does the law justify you? said he. I replied that his opinion was not unprejudiced, that I had consulted all the officers, and they had given their opinion that it was just, that he deserved death. He asked, what would be the manner of his death. I explained it to him. He requested that he might be shot. I told him that it could not be, that he must be hung. He admitted that it was just. He objected to the shortness of the time and requested that an hour might be given to prepare. I made no answer to this, but allowed much more than the hour he asked for to elapse. He requested that his face might be covered. I granted his request and asked him what it should be covered with. He said a handkerchief. In his locker was found a black one, which was put on his face. Cromwell and Small made the same request, and frocks were taken from their lockers with which their heads were covered. Spencer asked for a Bible and prayer book. They were given to him. He said, I am a believer, but do you think that my repentance will be accepted? I called to his mind that the thief on the cross and told him that God's mercies were equal to all his wants. He kneeled down and read from the prayer book and asked again if I thought his repentance would be accepted, saying that his time was short. I told him God not only understood his case, but could suit his grace to it. He begged that I would forgive him. I told him I did most sincerely and cordially and asked if I had done anything which made him seek my life, or whether his hatred was unfounded. He said 
He thought it was only fancy. Perhaps, he added, there was something in your manner which offended me. I read over to him what I had written down. He wished me to alter the passage in which I said that he offered as an excuse that he had attempted the same thing on the John Adams of Potomac. He only mentioned it as a fact, he said. More than an hour had now elapsed. Spencer, as he met Cromwell, paused and asked to see Mr. Wales. As he passed Cromwell, he said not a word of his innocence, nor did he make any appeal in his favor. Spencer said, Wales, I hope you will forgive me for tampering with your fidelity. Wales replied, overcome with emotion, I do forgive you from the bottom of my heart, and I hope God will forgive you also. Wales was weeping, and Spencer in passing met Small at the gangway. He extended his hand and said, Small, forgive me for having brought you into trouble. Small answered, No, by God. Spencer, I cannot forgive you. Spencer repeated his request. Small said, How can you ask that of me after having brought me to this? We shall soon be before God and shall there know all about it. Spencer said, you must forgive me. I cannot die without it. I went to Small, asked him not to cherish any resentments at such a time, and asked him to forgive him. He relented, held out his hand to Spencer, and said, I do forgive you, and may God forgive you also. Small then asked my forgiveness. I took his hand and expressed my forgiveness in the strongest terms. I asked him what I had done, that he should seek my life. If I had been harsh either in deed or word to him, he exclaimed, What have you done, Captain Mackenzie? What have you done to me? Nothing, but treated me like a man. I told him of the high responsibilities under which I acted, of the duty I owed my government, and the ship with which it had entrusted me, of his offense toward his commander and the boys he intended to put to death and of the high duty I owe to the flag of my country. Right, he exclaimed, God bless that flag and prosper it. Now, said he, give me a quick and easy death. Spencer said to Lieutenant Gans aboard that his courage had been doubted, but he wished him to be a witness that he died like a brave man. He asked what would be the signal for his execution. I told him that I was desirous of hoisting colors at the instant to show that the flag of the Summers was fixed to the masthead, and that I intended to beat the call to hoist colors and then roll off, and at the third roll a gun would be fired as the signal. He asked leave to give the signal. I at once succeeded. He asked if it was the gun under him. I told him it was, but one removed. He asked if it would be fired by a lock and wafer. I was told the preparations had been made to fire it with a match, and immediately ordered a supply of live calls and fresh calls to be passed constantly, and then assured him that there should be no delay. The time was now wearing away. Small requested leave to address the crew. Spencer, having had leave to give the signal, was asked if he would give Small the leave he asked. He said yes. Small then said, Shipmates and topmates, take warning by my example. I never killed a man, but only said that I would do it, and for that I am about to die. Going in a guinea man brought me to this. Take warning and never go in a guinea man. Turning to Spencer, he said, I am ready to die, are you? Cromwell's last words were, Tell my wife that I die innocent. I die an innocent man. From the appearance of this man and assuming to be innocent, it would seem that Spencer took all the risk of the affair, and Cromwell intended to profit by it. I placed myself where I could take in the whole deck with my eye. No word was given by Spencer. He finally said he could not give the word and wished me to do it. The word was accordingly given, and the execution took place. The crew was ordered aft when I addressed them. I called their attention to the fate of the young men who had just been hung in their presence. I spoke of the distinguished social's position Spencer had held at home and held up before them, the career of the usefulness and professional honor 
to which a course of faithful duty would have raised him. After having been but a few months at sea, he criminally aspired to supplant me in a command I had earned by thirty years of faithful service. Their own future fortunes, I told them, were within their own control. I opened to them the stations of respectability and a future honor to which they might rise, but told them that it could only be step by step in a regular course. I called their attention also to Cromwell's course. He had received a handsome education, and his handwriting was even elegant, but he had also failed through his love of gold. The first fifteen dollars he had received from Spencer had bought him, and the hope of great plunder had secured the purchase. An anecdote had been told to me by Collins of Cromwell, which carried its own moral with it, and which I desired Collins to repeat. He did so. He told them that he once went to India with Cromwell, and that they took on board there a keg of doubloons for Mr. Thorndyke. Collins alone knew of its being aboard, and kept it a secret till they went ashore. He then told Cromwell of it, who laughed at him and said that, if he had known about it, he would have run away with the keg. I told the crew they had only to choose between the two, Collins and Cromwell. Small also had been brought up to better things, but had not been able to resist temptation, and had died invoking blessings on the flag of his country. All hands were then called to clear ship and give three hearty cheers. Three heartier cheers never went up from the deck of an American ship. In that electric moment, I verily believe, the purest and loftiest patriotism burst forth from the breast even of the worst conspirators. From that moment, I felt that I was again completely master of my vessel, and that I could do with her whatever the honor of my country required. Dinner was piped, and I noticed with feelings of pain that some of the boys, as they passed the bodies, laughed and sneered at them. I still desired that Spencer should be buried in a coffin, and gave orders to have one built. But Lieutenant Gansevoort offered to relinquish a mess chest. He had, for that purpose, which was soon converted into a substantial coffin. The watch was set, and the bodies were lowered. They were received by their messmates, to be decently laid out for burial. The midshipmen assisted in the duty. Spencer was laid out clothed in his complete uniform, except his sword, which he had forfeited the right to wear. I noticed that upon the hands of one of the others a seaman had tied a ribbon, with the name upon it of that Summers, who so distinguished himself by his gallantry, patriotism, and skill. On Cranwell's face a saber cut was visible, and on removing his hair four or five more were discovered, which showed that he had been where wounds were given. He was said to have been in a slaver, and in Morro Castle in Havana, and it was the general impression that he had been a pirate. A squall of rain soon sprang up, which rendered it necessary to cover the bodies with tarpaulins. They were arranged according to their rank, and all hands were called to bury the dead. The American ensign was lowered to half-mast. Night had now set in. All the lamps were lit and distributed among the crew, and placed in the bows, in the gangway, and in the quarter-boat. The service with the dead was read, and the bodies were committed to the deep. The offices were closed by reading that beautiful prayer, so suitable to the occasion. Preserve us from the dangers of the seas and the violence of enemies. Bless the United States. Watch over all that are upon the deep, and protect the inhabitants of the land in peace and quiet, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In reading this, I sincerely thank God for the protection of the summers, and felt a firm faith that he would sanction the deed of that day. On the following Sunday, the 4th of December, after the laws for the government of the Navy had been read, according to invariable custom on board the summers, I took occasion to allude to the lessons to be drawn from the fate of those who had suffered. I led the minds of the crew back to their youthful days, and showed them how they had trampled underfoot the wise counsel and admonition of their friends. In Small's locker were letters from his mother, expressing the joy she felt that he was so happy on board the summers. 
This was before Spencer had joined. There was also a Bible, in the leaves of which he had copied some verses from the Sailor's Magazine in praise of its holy precepts. These verses I read to the crew. I thus showed them how Swan valued his Bible, but that he did not resist temptation. I urged them to read it closely and attend faithfully to its precepts. I endeavored to show that there could be no such thing as honest atheism. I held up before them how Spencer had injured many people, and especially his parents. He had lacked filial piety and piety towards God, two principles which would never have suffered him to go astray. In conclusion, I called on them, as they had given three cheers for their country, now to give three cheers for God, as they would do by singing his praise. The colors were then hoisted, and above the American ensign was raised the banner of the cross, the only flag that ever floats above it from any vessel under my command. The hundredth psalm was sung, after which the crew dispersed. I could not help, on that day of peaceful Sabbath worship, contrasting the condition of my vessel with that she would have resented, had she fallen into pirate's hand. Nor could I avoid observing the marked effect produced upon the ship's company by the proceedings. I was satisfied at once that all danger was past, and the mutiny broken for ever. In closing this report, there yet remains the pleasing duty of adverting to the conduct of the under-officers. The first lieutenant, throughout the whole difficulty, has borne himself with courage and sustained a lofty and chivalrous part. Always armed, his pistol often cocked. Only in a single instance has any accident occurred, and that arose from the accidental discharge of his pistol while arresting Cromwell. Next in rank to the commander on board the vessel, he was my equal in the discharge of every duty. Never since the existence of the Union has a commander been more ably and zealously seconded by a first lieutenant. Where all behave so well, it may seem invidious to particularize, yet I cannot avoid reference to the conduct of Persa Haskell and Surgeon Lincock. Both were in delicate health and the latter especially was not in a fit condition to go to sea. He had returned to the dolphin from the coast of Africa, and had suffered from the fever in the river Nunez. But he did duty through the difficulty. Both obeyed the order to go armed and kept watch without the slightest murmur. I would respectfully suggest that the thanks of the department be presented to all the officers of the Summers. The opinions they gave were their own, if they were erroneous. The responsibility is not theirs. The opinions, the acts, and the responsibility are mine alone, and I freely meet that ordeal to which my conduct will undoubtedly be subjected, trusting to that consciousness of rectitude in my own bosom, which has never for one moment forsaken me, or wavered in the slightest degree. I submit that J. W. Wales, by his coolness and presence of mind and firm integrity, has rendered to the American Navy a memorable service. I had some difficulty with him at Puerto Rico, and on that account he was singled out and tampered with, but he remained true to the flag of his country. A purse's post or a handsome pecuniary recompense would be a small compensation for the services he rendered. Sergeant Gartry proved himself worthy of the noble corps to which he belonged. He rose from his hammock, where he had been confined by sickness, and did duty through the whole affair. And when this was done, his malady returned, and he was again disabled. I respectfully suggest that Sergeant Gartry be promoted to a second lieutenancy in the Marine Corps. I also recommend the other officers to the notice of the department. I believe that their promotion will be beneficial to the Navy. If they prove to be unworthy of it, the service they have now rendered cannot be injured by that. It will be remembered in the Navy that when a mutiny occurred, and they remained faithful to their trust, their services were not forgotten. If they prove unworthy of it, this will not be recorded with it. If it be deemed that I have had any merit for the preservation of the Summers from the treacherous toils by which he was surrounded 
both since and before her departure from the United States. I respectfully beg that it may accrue without reserve to my nephew, Mr. Perry, and that he be placed in the situation left vacant by the death of Mr. Spencer. I pledge myself for the entire faithfulness and zeal with which he will discharge its duties. For myself, I only ask that, whatever may be thought of the services rendered to the flag of my country, which should be the first considered, my own honor may also meet with due consideration. I ask only that I may not be deprived of my command until I am found to be unworthy of it. End of section 53Section 54 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Commander Alexander S. Mackenzie for murder before a naval court of inquiry. Brooklyn, New York, 1842, Part 4. Examination of Witnesses James W. Wales was Persis Stewart on board the Summers in her late cruise, was informed on the night of the 25th of November last of an intended mutiny on board that vessel, was standing forward by the bits when Mr. Spencer came forward and after some few remarks relative to the weather, requested me to get on top of the booms, telling me at the same time that he had something very important to communicate to me. He commenced the conversation by asking me, Was I afraid of death? And did I fear a dead man, and dare I kill a person? I was very much surprised at these remarks, and looked up to see if he was in earnest. He seemed very serious, and very much in earnest. I replied that I was not particularly anxious to die quite yet, that I had no cause to fear a dead person, and that did a man sufficiently abuse or insult me, I thought I could muster sufficient courage to kill him, if necessary. Mr. Spencer replied, I don't doubt your courage at all. I know it. But, said he, can you keep a secret? And will you keep one? If so, he added, take the oath. He then dictated an oath, the purport of which was that I should never make known to any person the conversation which was about to take place between us. I took the oath as directed by Mr. Spencer, by word of mouth, no Bible being used. He then went on to state that he was leagued with about twenty of the brig's company to take her, murder all her officers, and commence pirating. The plan and stations of the men, he said, he had all arranged in secret writing, done up in his neck handkerchief. He requested me to feel of his neck handkerchief. Did so, and there was a rumpling which showed that there was paper in the back part of it. He went on to state to me the plan he should pursue. The affray would commence some night when he had the mid-watch. Some of his men would get into a fight on the forecastle. He, Spencer, was to bring them up to the mast and call Mr. Rogers, the officer of the deck, to pretend to settle the difficulty. As soon as Mr. Rogers had got to the gangway, they were immediately to seize and throw him overboard. They would then have the vessel in their own possession. The keys of the arm chest, he said, he could lay his hands on at any moment. The arm chest was to be opened and the arms distributed to his men. He was then to station his men at the hatches to prevent anyone from coming up on deck, and he should proceed to the cabin and murder the commander with the least noise possible. He should then proceed with some of his men to the ward room, and then murder the ward room and steerage officers. He said the officers had no arms in the ward room, with the exception of the first lieutenant, and all the arms that he had there was an old cutlass, which he should secure before the affray commenced. This accomplished, he said he should go on deck, have the two after guns slewed around so as to command from a raking position, the deck. He would then cause all the crew to be called on deck and select a number from them, 
such as would suit his purposes. The remainder he should cause to be thrown overboard. This done, he should commence clearing the deck, beginning by throwing overboard the launch and all the spare spars and rigging of the vessel, as they only tended to lumber up the deck, that should they stand in need of any spare spars or rigging, they could take them for vessels that they would capture. Then the brig was to proceed to Cape San Antonio, or to the Isle of Pines, and there take on board one who was familiar with their intended business, and who was ready and willing to join them. The name of this person was not mentioned. Then they were to commence cruising for prizes, that whenever they took a vessel, after taking from her that which would be of use to them, they were to murder all on board and scuttle the vessel, so as to leave no traces of her. Should there be any females on board of the vessels they would take, they would have them removed to the brig for the use of the officers and men, using them as long as they saw fit, and then making way with them. Spencer then called up Elijah Small, seaman on board. He commenced talking to him in Spanish, could not tell what they were talking about as I did not understand the language. Small looked surprised, however, at what he told. Spencer then remarked to Small in English, Oh, you need not be under any apprehension of fear on his, witness's account, as I have sounded him pretty well, and find he is one of us. Small remarked that he was very glad to hear it. Small was then called away to execute some order. Before going, Spencer told him that he, Spencer, should have the mid-watch that night, and wished to have some further conversation with him, Small, relative to their plans, and desired Small to see that poor top man, meantime. After Small left, Spencer made overtures to me, saying that if I would join them, he would give me the post of third officer in command. He said the commander had a large amount of money on board, which, with what the purser had, would make a pretty little sum to commence with. He asked me what I thought of the project, thought it prudent to dissemble as much as possible in order to gain further information, and told him that I was favorably disposed towards it. Spencer remarked that we would have another interview on the morrow, when he would show me the plan he had drawn up. He followed me to the gangway saying that if I lisped a syllable of what he had communicated to me, I should be murdered, that if he did not do it himself, those connected with him would, that go where I might, my life would not be worth a straw. I said, no, I would not make any mention of it. This conversation lasted upwards of an hour, nearly two hours. I took the first opportunity that I could to make the matter known to Commander Mackenzie. It was about nine o'clock at night when I left Mr. Spencer, and he went below to turn in. It was very light, moonlight, I think, proceeded as intended to communicate the intelligence to Commander Mackenzie, but I observed Small watching me closely, that I would try to get into the wardroom, but there I was again put off, for Spencer put up his head and wanted to know what the devil I was about cruising around there or something to that amount. Spencer's hammock was hung right over the wardroom door, and to reach the door I had to pass by it. Made no reply, but pretended to be getting into the purse's storeroom. I then went on the first deck again. One hour after I went again to the steerage and found Spencer still awake. I had returned there with the intention of getting into the wardroom. I saw that the lights were out, and that the wardroom gentleman had retired. I let the matter rest till morning, but did not go to sleep, though I tried. In the morning, as soon as I could get in before breakfast, about seven o'clock, I should think, I communicated the matter to Purcell High School, and then went on deck and told the first lieutenant that the purser wished to see him immediately in the wardroom. I gave the purser to understand that there was a mutiny on foot, and wished him to get it to the commander as soon as possible. I condensed Spencer's statement and went up to the first lieutenant of my own accord, but fear the person would neglect it. I was watched as closely as possible by Small, Cromwell, Wilson, McKinley, and Spencer, and therefore kept out of the way of the officers as much as possible. 
I noticed them clubbing together and believed they knew I was playing them false. Had no farther interview with Spencer, though I endeavored to do so. He was continually engaged with the forecastle man, Benjamin F. Green, on the foretop, so that I could not see him. Heard nothing from any of the other men, nor did I see anything to implicate them after my conversation with Spencer, though I had, on the 26th, seen him talking with Cromwell, Small, Neville, Wilson, and McKinley. They were all collected together, could hear none of their conversation, which was carried on in the usual tone. Saw Commander Mackenzie and Spencer together on the quarter-deck, just previous to Spencer's arrest. The commander told him that he understood he, Spencer, aspired to the command of that vessel, and that he did not know how he could accomplish his object, except by riding over the dead bodies of her officers. I heard nothing more of the conversation except that Mr. Spencer said, Yes, sir, and then I was sent away to attend to getting out some irons. That was all of the conversation I heard. I brought the irons on deck. After they were brought up, no conversation took place. Spencer's sword was taken away, and the irons put upon him, to which he appeared willingly to submit. At the time the irons were put on, some of the officers were on the quarter-deck. The men were at quarters. The officers were all called out, and some of the men, I do not recollect who they were, were stationed at the guns. After he was ironed, Spencer was taken to the larboard arm chest. After this, I observed dissatisfaction among the men. When an order was given, it had to be repeated several times, and even then they obeyed it sullenly, as if they did not care a farthing whether the order was executed or not. Cromwell, whose hammock was slung next to mine, was called by some officer to go on deck, and went muttering. The same evening, I observed Wilson McKinley and three or four others collected on the forecastle talking together, and when the officers went towards them, they would separate and go to other parts of the ship. Next day I noticed nothing suspicious in the conduct of the men, except that they were surly about doing their duty. In the morning, while wholly stoning the deck, I being officer over the prisoners, I observed signs pass between Spencer, Wilson, and McKinley. They put their hands to their chins, and Cromwell, who was lying on the arm chest, rose up. I told him my orders were to shoot him down, and should do so if he did not lie still. He lay down. I then went back with my pistol cocked to the launch, where Wilson was poking about, and found that he had a number of holy stones out, and that he was taking out a hand spike. I told him that if I saw him making any farther signs, I would blow his brains out. He said nothing, did not put the hand spike back, but went to draw some water. I put the hand spike back myself. I expressed my fears to Commander Mackenzie and the First Lieutenant, telling them, that I thought it dangerous to leave the holy stones about, as they might be easily used. I went to the commander to tell him this, while Spencer was at irons near the battle-axe rack. I observed him trying how he could work one, moving the axe up and down. Cromwell and Small were at this time confined. After I told this to the first lieutenant, he told it to the commander, and the battle-axes were removed to the arm chest. That morning, Wilson, McKinley, McKee, and Green missed their muster and congregated round the stern of the launch. The next day, at morning quarters, they came forward and made some acknowledgment. They were then put in irons. It was then nine o'clock. After they were put in irons, I could see that the men and boys were still surly. They went to work when orders were given with evident dissatisfaction. This dissatisfaction kept on till the execution, when the whole feeling changed. Those who before had been slow to execute an order were, after that, the first to run to obey it. After the arrest of Spencer and previous to the execution, this dissatisfaction was evidently on the increase, so much so as to be perceptible from day to day. More than half the crew, I should think, exhibited it was present at the time of the execution, did not hear any conversation between Commander Mackenzie and Spencer 
and Cromwell, though I heard him ask Small to forgive Spencer. Small sat on the gangway. Spencer said, Small, I hope you will forgive me. Small replied, Mr. Spencer, how can you ask me that when you have brought me to this? Commander Mackenzie said to Small, Don't go out of the world with any hard feelings at your heart. Forgive him. Small replied, Since you requested, sir, I forgive him. Small then bade Lieutenant Gans aboard farewell. Commander Mackenzie said, Small, what have you against me that you will not shake hands with me and bid me goodbye? Small said, Nothing, sir, only I did not think that you would shake hands with a poor fellow like me and bid him goodbye. He reached out his hand, shook that of Commander Mackenzie very cordially, and bade him farewell. I heard Small say, looking up to the flag, God bless that flag. He was then addressing his shipmates, having asked permission to do so of the commander, which had readily been granted him. I cannot recollect the words of his address, though I heard him warn them from his fate, and heard him say that his sentence was right and just, and that it was right that he should die. He then looked up and said, God bless that flag, and asked Mr. Spencer if he was ready to die, saying, I am. Spencer made no reply at all. He had permission to give the order to fire the signal gun, but waited some time, not being able to do so. Previous to this, Commander Mackenzie told me that Spencer wished to speak with me. I went up to him, and he said to me, Mr. Wales, I sincerely hope that you will forgive me for tampering with your fidelity. Commander Mackenzie was standing by his side. I replied that I did and hoped that God would forgive him. He then shook my hand and said farewell. I had no other conversation with either of them. While we were at Messerado, going ashore on the boat, on the 11th of November, Spencer was officer of the boat, and I was with him. I believe Mr. Rogers was also in the boat, though I am not sure. The commander had told Spence before he got into the boat that he was not in uniform. He was just going into the boat as this was said. He muttered some reply, but I could not hear what it was. After we had got some twenty or thirty yards from the brig, the captain hailed us and asked if we had the American ensign in the boat. Spencer replied that he had not got it, and added, Not however so the captain could hear, that he'd be goddamned if he was going back after it either, for the damned old humbug. Go to hell. He continued cursing all the way to shore, though I cannot call to mind the particular expressions that he used. Spencer's remarks seemed to please the crew. About two weeks before the mutiny, while bound for Messerado to St. Thomas, Mr. Spencer had the watch on deck. Mr. Rogers hung out, let go some brace. Spencer was talking with Cromwell, who was bosun's mate of the watch, and some others of the crew. None of them paid any attention to the order. Mr. Rogers called out again and again. They paid no attention. Mr. Rogers then came forward and gave the order himself. They were as near Mr. Rogers as I was, and could hear as well. Captain Mackenzie, who was on deck, noticed it and sent for Spencer to come aft. I did not hear the conversation between them, but when Spencer came forward, he was muttering curses against the commander. I asked him, Spencer, what's the matter? Said he, the commander says that I don't pay attention to my duty and urges me to pay better attention hereafter. God damn him. I'd like some of these dark nights to catch him on top of that roundhouse and plunge him overboard. It would be a pleasing task for me, and he muttered between his teeth, God damn him. I'll do it yet. I made no reply. He went forward and began talking with some of the men, four or five. I went below. I did not repeat this language to any of the officers. Other officers were near and must have heard his words. At Madeira, when we were getting under way, Cromwell spoke against Captain Mackenzie. The commander asked why some rigging had not been attended to. Cromwell was forward and the captain went aft. Cromwell then said he did not care a damn about the rigging. 
Captain Mackenzie was desirous of getting too much work out of the crew, that there was no necessity of getting underway that night at all. At the same time, wishing Commander and the brig farther in hell than they were out. This he said loud enough to be heard by all forward. Shortly after we left New York, Cromwell, while giving some money to the sergeant of marines to take care of, told me that Spencer had given him fifteen dollars. He mentioned no purpose, though he said something about its being a pretty good present. Spencer also drew some fifteen or twenty dollars worth of tobacco and cigars during the cruise, which he distributed to the crew, the tobacco rather to the boys than the men. He gave Cromwell a bunch or two of cigars at one time, and also to Small. I saw him give money to Small at Santa Cruz while going ashore. I saw two silver pieces, though I could not see how much there was. I have seen Spencer give Green and Van Velcher a pound of tobacco at a time, and to others, smaller amounts. The President informed Commander Mackenzie that he had the privilege of cross-examining the witness by question in writing to be approved by the court. The Commander handed the following questions. Did you ever hear Cromwell speak of his wife? I have. Two or three days after we were out, we had a heavy gale. Cromwell came down and began to speak of our friends at home. He spoke of his wife in a very light manner for a man who had just been married, at least. The words he used indicated that he cared nothing for her chastity while he was gone. The judge advocate asked why Commander Mackenzie wished to ask it. Commander Mackenzie said it was merely to counteract any feeling of sympathy that might be sought to be drawn from his wife and family. The judge advocate said that purpose was already sufficiently answered. Did you hear Mr. Spencer make any remark about dead men tell no tales? I did. He said that his motto was, dead men tell no tales. He alluded to this in connection with what he said of scuttling vessels that he might capture. Was anything said about small fry and eating biscuit in that conversation? Yes, sir. He said that they would eat considerable, and that he would make them walk the plank. They would be useless on board. He meant the small boys, the smaller apprentices. They were some very small on board. What effect, if any, did Mr. Spencer's remark about throwing command of Mackenzie overboard have on the crew? It rather pleased them. I saw smiles upon the faces of several of them. Cromwell and Small were among them. What was the conduct of Commander Mackenzie generally during the difficulty on the summers? He appeared to labor under no fear, was humane, and did everything he could for the comfort of the prisoners. During the continuance of the difficulty on board the summers, did you observe any conduct in Commander Mackenzie exhibiting unmanly fear, a despotic temper, or any quality unbecoming a commanding officer and a gentleman? No, sir, I did not. December 31st, J.W. Wales. Cromwell, when the vessel first sailed from New York, was very tyrannical toward the apprentices, having no conversation with them, and keeping aloof from them altogether. And when called upon to inflict punishment, he would strike with all his might, as though it was pleasing to him to whip them. He whipped them hard the same as though they were men instead of boys. I frequently heard Commander Mackenzie censure him for whipping them so hard, and he has often ordered him to stop. Just previous to our arrival at Madeira, I noticed a sudden change in his manner toward the boys. He then made free with them and let them talk and play with him and pull him about. When Mr. Spencer gave the tobacco to the men and boys, he would say that if Captain Mackenzie would not let them have it, he could accommodate them. I've seen Mr. Spencer several times throw money upon the deck, a shilling or so, and tell the boys to scramble for it. Cromwell and Small frequently told of having been enslavers. Cromwell said he had been taken in a slaver, carried to Havana, and confined in the Morro Castle. He was there for some time and was finally liberated by a woman, 
who had considerable influence with the governor of the island. Between New York and Madeira, the crew was very good indeed. But after we left Madeira for Santa Cruz, it could be seen that dissatisfaction was arising, and it continued to increase during the whole interval, up to the execution of the men. I noticed a change instantly after that. Those who had been the most surly immediately turned about. The treatment after leaving Madeira was the same as it had been before. The same rules and regulations were enforced, and the same duties were performed. I saw the paper purporting to be the list of persons engaged in Spencer's plans. The knight was taken out of his locker. Lieutenant Gert Gansefort was first lieutenant on board the brig Summers. They were on board the following officers, twelve in number, viz. Commander Mackenzie, first lieutenant Gansefort, Dr. Lincock, Purser Heiskell, Acting Master Perry, Midshipman Rogers, Hayes, DeLong, Tillotson, Spencer, and Mr. Oliver Perry, who did midshipman's duty. In the morning of the 26th of November, at about 10 o'clock, I met Mr. Wales at the forehatch, was told by him that the purser wished to see me, went down to the wardroom and found Mr. Heiskell. He asked me if I was aware that a plot existed on board to take the vessel out of the hands of her officers, and murder them all. I told him no. He, high school, told me that Mr. Spencer had taken Mr. Wales on the booms between the hours of six and eight of the previous evening, and had there, after swearing him, made known his plots. He told him that there were twenty men concerned with him in the plan of taking the vessel out of the hands of the officers. The plan was to make a row on the forecastle in his mid-watch, and then to call Mr. Rogers to quell the disturbance. They were then to seize and throw him overboard, to go aft and enter the cabin and murder the commander and officers. Was anxious to make it known to the commander and did not stay to hear all he had to say. I immediately entered the cabin and mentioned the circumstances. He received it with great coolness, said that the vessel was in good discipline, and expressed his doubts as to the truth of the report. I asked him if I should see Mr. Wales myself and get the information from him. He said no, he did not wish me to do so or to say anything about it, but ordered me to keep a strict lookout upon Mr. Spencer and the crew generally, which I did. About dinner time, I missed Mr. Spencer from the deck. This was about two o'clock. I discovered that he was in the foretop, and immediately went up to see what he was about. He was sitting on the lee side of the top, with his chin resting on his breast, apparently in deep thought. He did not observe me till I had got into the top and was standing erect. He raised his head, and as soon as he discovered me, got up and evinced some confusion. He asked me some questions about the rigging, and about the foremast head, asked him if he didn't dine. He said he didn't care about it just then, came on deck and left him in the top. About an hour after I discovered Green in the top with him, he appeared to be engaged in pricking India ink in Spencer's arm. The crew were employed in slinging clean hammocks. I hailed the top and ordered Green to come out. Mr. Spencer put his head over the top rail, and from his manner I thought he wished Green to remain, though asked no question. I repeated the order and then ordered Spencer to send Green and the other men that might be on the top on deck. Green came down immediately, but no others. Spencer remained in the top, had not ordered him to come out, saw no others in the top. I ordered Green to sling his hammock. He answered that he had done so already. I was engaged in mustering the men for the purpose of having the hammock stowed. When I got abreast of the Jacob's ladder on the starboard side forward, I observed Mr. Spencer sitting on the ladder. I turned my eye towards him and immediately caught his eye, which he kept staring upon me for more than a minute, with the most infernal expression I have ever seen upon a human face. It satisfied me at once of the man's guilt, reported the circumstances to the commander, and told him that I thought something should be done in order to secure him. 
He replied that he would keep a sharp lookout, that he did not wish to do anything hastily, and that by evening quarters he would decide what was best to do. Just before the drum beat to quarters, he asked me what I would do if I were in his situation as commander of the vessel. I told him that I would bring that young man aft, alluding to Mr. Spencer, and iron him and keep him on the quarter deck. He told me that that was the course which he intended to pursue, and that he was very glad to find that I agreed with him, directing me to order all the officers aft except one, which I did, leaving Mr. Hayes forward on the forecastle. When the officers had assembled aft on the starboard side of the after deck, the commander said to Mr. Spencer, I understand that you aspire to the command of this vessel. How are you to arrive at it? I don't know, unless by walking over my dead body and those of my officers. I think Mr. Spencer said, no, it's all a joke. The commander said, it's a very serious joke, sir, and one which may cost you your life. Do you deny having had frequent conversations with Small and Cromwell? I thought Mr. Spencer appeared confused. He said, no, it was all a joke. The commander asked him if he had not a paper concealed in his neck handkerchief. He replied, no. His neck handkerchief was then overhauled, and there was nothing found in it. The commander then ordered me to iron him. I laid my hand upon his sword, disarmed him, and ordered him to come out from among the officers. He did so, and I ordered a seaman doing the duty of armorer to bring up the irons. Mr. Spencer commenced rolling up his sleeves as if to bear his wrist, and was first put in hand irons. When these were on, I asked him if he had arms concealed about him. He said he had not, but perhaps I had better overhaul him, as he supposed I would not believe anything he said. I searched him but found nothing except a few scraps of paper. The commander ordered me to arm the officers of the deck with two pistols each, and, I think, with cutlasses. The orders were, if Mr. Spencer attempted to make his escape or to communicate with any of the crew, to blow out his brains. I told Mr. Spencer these orders. The next day in the morning I had a conversation with some of the men. The carpenter's mate Dickerson said, that big fellow forward is more dangerous than the rest. He ought to be confined. I asked him whom he meant, and he said Cromwell, the boatswain's mate. In the afternoon of that day, in looking aloft, I saw Cromwell, Small, Wilson, Golding, and some others, whom I had previously suspected of being engaged in the plot, collected about the masthead and in the cross trees. Cromwell, who is generally very noisy and blustery on occasions of that sort, now said very little. I do not recollect hearing his voice. The men seem to have gone aloft more for conversation than for work. A short time after the commander said he thought it necessary to confine Cromwell, I told him I agreed with him, and that I believed him to be a dangerous person. As soon as he came upon the Jacob's ladder, I cocked my pistol and pointed it at him, and when he got on deck I told him the captain wished to see him. He was told by the commander that he would be confined in the same way with Mr. Spencer and taken home, where he would be tried by the laws of his country and acquitted if he was innocent. If guilty, he would be punished. He replied, Yes, sir, but I don't know anything about this. I assure you that I don't know anything about it. Something else passed, which I do not at this time recollect. The commander then said something to me about Small, and asked if I did not think it best to confine him. I told him I thought it was, and he then told me to order him aft. Nearly the same conversation then passed as with Cromwell. The commander told him he would be confined as the others were, brought home and tried. Small did not deny having had conversations with Spencer. The captain said to him, Spencer has talked with you about the plot, in which Small acquiesced and said, Yes, sir. Small was then confined in irons. All the officers were armed when Cromwell first came down from the rigging, 
and was stationed above the mast on different parts of the deck, ready for action in case of any attack. They wore their arms afterwards until their arrival here. On the 28th or 29th, Wilson, McKinley, McKee, and Green were confined. Wilson had had a knife in a bag, which he bought on the coast of Africa, and King told me the night before he had kept it concealed about the guns. I came up and found King and Dickinson talking together. King said to me, Has Wilson drawn two or three knives from the storeroom lately? I told him none that I knew of. He said, I heard that he had several knives in his sail bag, and I think it would be a good plan to overhaul it. He has had his gab there at the after part of that gun, where Mr. Spencer is nearly all day, and a knife hid away in the rigging, which he thought he intended to put into the hands of Mr. Spencer. I overhauled the sail bag and found no other knife than an African dirk, very sharp, and having the appearance of having been lately sharpened. I had several conversations with King, Dickinson, I think Browning, and Anderson, captain of the forecastle, and they all thought Cromwell the most dangerous man concerned in the plot. They told me what they had seen, that before the affair they had seen Cromwell talking frequently with Spencer, that they were very intimate. January 3rd, 1843. Commander Mackenzie handed to the court a communication of which the following is the substance. May it please the court. As in all the mutinies that are on record, it appears that they have been provoked by gross tyranny on the part of the commanding officers. It seems proper that I should be allowed to show that no such circumstances existed in this case. The mutiny on board the British frigate Hermione during the French Revolution grew out of no disloyalty on the part of the mutineers, but was provoked by the long course of grievances. And although the principal offenders were executed, the grievances were afterwards redressed by the action of the proper court. The mutiny grew out of the systematic cruelty of the captain and was provoked immediately by an act of cruelty, which resulted in the death of two men. The mutiny on board the British frigate Bounty grew out of the brutality of the captain and directly out of an insult to one of the officers. That which arose among the crew of the French frigate Medusa was provoked by the gross weakness and incapacity and want of calmness of the commanding officer. It concerns me, therefore, and my professional honor to show that there has been on board the Summers and of every vessel I have had the honor to command. No cruelty, no disregard of the comfort or the feelings of any of the crew, no weakness, no incapacity which could provoke or encourage any of the crew to this act of mutiny. My object in this application is to state that Lieutenant Charles Henry Davis, who has been for two years upon the same vessel with myself, is now in the city and on his way to Washington upon urgent public business, and my wish is to request that after the testimony of Lieutenant Gansevoort is closed, Mr. Davis may be examined. The judge advocate said that as nothing could be done about this until Mr. Gansevoort's testimony should be closed, and as he wished to say a few words concerning the principle involved in the application, he thought the application itself should be postponed until that time. The court assented. End of section 54. Section 55 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Commander Alexander S. Mackenzie for murder before a naval court of inquiry. Brooklyn, New York, 1842, Part 5 Lieutenant Gansevoort On the morning of the first, the day on which the men were executed, Commander Mackenzie ordered me to arm all the petty officers whom I thought to be true to the flag. He had expressed a wish that they should be armed before, but not having myself full confidence in them, 
I had until now discouraged it. On that morning I obeyed the order and armed the petty officers that were true. There were seven of them. I had no means of telling whether the officers were true or not, except by judging from my conversation with them, and this in a great measure removed my suspicions that they were not true. The orders of Commander Mackenzie to the officers were that, that if they saw an attempt made to rescue the prisoners, to blow out the brains of both prisoners and those making the attempt, if they saw the prisoners forward of the mainmast and in communication with the crew, they were to destroy them. They were to keep a watchful eye upon the crew, and if they saw any mutinous attempt, they were to use their arms upon them. He then ordered them forward. A letter was addressed by Commander Mackenzie to the officers, and sent the day before, the 30th, ordering us to give him our opinion as to the guilt of Spencer, Cromwell, and Small, and as to the best course to be pursued. We collected in the ward room where we spent the day in examining witnesses. About six o'clock, I think, the commander ordered me to break up the council, as he considered the vessel in danger and wished to show a force about the decks. In examining the witnesses, I administered an oath, of which I have a copy, and took down the testimony as they proceeded. After hearing them read, three of those who could write signed the depositions, those who could not made their marks. The original minutes are in the hands of Mr. Highschool. The copies are in the possession of Commander Mackenzie. The investigation was continued on the next morning at about nine o'clock. On the previous day, we examined eight or nine of the crew, I believe. Most of them were petty officers, some from among the apprentices whom I suspected to be concerned in the plot. The commander was exceedingly anxious to know the result of the investigation, which occupied not a great while the next day. I was not present during the whole of it, it being necessary for me to be on deck. The witnesses examined on the second day were not the same as had been on the day previous. As soon as the council came to a decision, I repeated the result to the commander, telling him that I would hand it to him in writing as soon as it was published. I told him what opinion we had come to, and that it was unanimous. He expressed a wish that the letter we were drawing up should be put immediately into his hands. He read it and showed it to Midshipman Spencer. I was not near enough to hear the reply which Mr. Spencer made to Commander Mackenzie's remarks. When I saw them again, Mr. Spencer had a Bible in his hand, and the commander was seated near him with a paper upon which he appeared to be writing. The commander had detailed the different men who were to take the men under the main yard, on which they were to be executed. He told me that the two of the highest rank were to take Mr. Spencer. I went up to Mr. Spencer, who took my hand in both of his, and begged me very earnestly to forgive him for the many injuries he had done me. He said he did not object to the sentence. He thought it was right and that his punishment was just. He said that he deserved death but did not like the way the commander had chosen to put him to death, or words to that effect, and added that he should have been glad to have a longer time to prepare. They were then taken to the gangway, Mr. Spencer and Small in the starboard gangway, and Cromwell in the larboard. While I was standing in the gangway, near Small, he asked me if I would bid him goodbye, and if I would forgive him. He told me that he was guilty and deserved his punishment. I think the commander said to him, Small, what have I done to you, that you won't bid me goodbye? Small replied, I did not know that you would bid a poor bugger like me goodbye, sir. I think the commander asked him if he had ever treated him badly, or something to that effect, and told him that he was sorry he had to take the course he did, but that the honor of the flag and the safety of the crew required it or something to that amount, to which Small replied, Yes, sir, and I honor you for it. God bless that flag. Mr. Spencer then asked Small if he wouldn't forgive him. Small replied, Ah, oh, Mr. Spencer, that's a hard thing for me to do, but you brought me to this. The commander said, Forgive him, Small. Don't go out of the world with any hard feelings in your heart. 
did not hear Small's reply, but went to the other side of the deck. Cromwell was sitting on the hammock cloths with the whip around his neck. I bade him goodbye. He asked me to forgive him and seized my hand, grasping it very violently. He said that he was innocent and hoped that we'd find it out before six months or words to that effect. I then went over into the starboard gangway again, and Mr. Spencer called to me. Mr. Spencer said, as near as I can recollect, you may have heard that I'm a coward, and you may think that I'm not a brave man. You can judge for yourself whether I die like a coward or a brave man. Small asked permission to address the crew. The commander gave permission, and he said, Messmates and shipmates, I am no pirate. I never murdered anybody, but I only said I would. Now see what words will do. Take warning by me. He said that his punishment was a just one. Mr. Spencer had asked permission to give the order to fire the gun. The commander gave him permission. Mr. Spencer afterwards told Browning, the boatswain's mate, who was holding him in the gangway, that he had not power to give the order, and wished the commander to give it. The commander immediately gave the order, Fire! Or stand by, fire! I forget which. I sung out, Whip! And the men were run up the main yard. The whips were belayed, and the order given to pipe down and pipe to dinner. Previous to the men going to dinner, the commander asked how I thought it would do to give three cheers. I told him I thought it would do well, as it would be easy perhaps to tell from that among those who were left, who were wrong, and who were right. When the men assembled after, he told them to give three cheers for the American flag, which they did, and hearty ones they were. Went to dinner, and after the prisoners had hung about an hour, the commander ordered me to deliver them over to their respective messmates and have them decently laid out. After they were laid out, the commander and myself walked round and inspected them. They were afterwards sewed up in hammocks, and Mr. Spencer laid in a coffin, which had been made from two mess chests. They were buried by candlelight, on the second day watch, at about seven. It had been squally in the afternoon, and we had covered the bodies over with tarpaulin. Had a conversation with Mr. Spencer some time after he was confined, two or three days after, I think. He commenced by saying that he had formed this plot on board of every vessel he had been in, both in the John Adams and in the Potomac. He said he knew that it would get him into difficulty, that he had tried to break himself of it, but it was impossible. It was a mania with him. I think he wished me to mention it to the commander. I did so, though I think not immediately. The Judge Advocate was there any change in the conduct of the crew after this execution from what it had been before? There was, sir. I think orders were obeyed with more alacrity, and there was less sullenness than there had been before in the manner of some of the men. Judge Advocate, had you observed any change in the general conduct of the crew, and at what time did it take place? Before we reached Madeira, their conduct was very good. But after leaving there, the crew were very slack, and I had frequently to drive them to their work. They would frequently disobey small orders, such as putting clothes away, etc., and this continued to increase up to the day of execution. Before, if I told them to put away an article of clothing, they would do it readily. After that, paid no attention to it. Judge Advocate after their arrest, what circumstances led you to think a rescue was intended? The men whose names were in the paper found in Spencer's locker were McKinley, McKee, Green, Gilderman, and Sullivan, and some others I do not recollect. I had seen looks passing between Mr. Spencer and McKee, McKinley. Judge Advocate Was the conduct of the rest of the crew after the arrest of Spencer, Cornwell, and Small improved or otherwise. Otherwise, decidedly, and from them I drew my conclusion that a rescue was intended. They continually hovered about the mainmast, collecting in knots and talking together on the forecastle and in gangways, and often separating on my appearance, and never talking so that I could hear. 
so far as I could judge, it was and is my firm belief that an attack and a rescue were intended. Judge Advocate, have you the list that was taken from Spencer's locker, and were you present when it was found? I was present when it was taken. It was found on the night when Spencer was confined. In his locker, contained in a paper looking glass case furnished with a drawer, was a razor case, which I opened and saw inside such a piece of paper as comes around razors, and inside of that paper was the list. No razor was in the case. This was the list found in the case. The names were in Greek characters. Mr. Spencer had told me that he had an alphabet of his own, which no one else could read. I showed the list to the commander immediately, but not to Mr. Spencer till some days after. I had previously told Mr. Spencer that these papers had been found. He answered that he presumed so. A smaller piece of paper with several names written on it, among them Roberts, was found in the case, but as none of the names were those of officers on board, I thought it had no connection with the matter. Commander Mackenzie. After the discovery of the intended mutiny and before the examination of the ringleaders, was the Summers in a condition to go into action with any prospect of sustaining the honor of the American flag? No, sir, I do not think she was, and I should have been very sorry to have had her make the attempt. Commander Mackenzie, from what you observed and knew of the spirit and feelings of the crew, and of the progress of the mutiny up to the time of the execution of the ringleaders, did you then, or do you now believe that the Summers could, or could not have been safely brought into port unless the ringleaders were executed? I did believe that you could not have been otherwise brought into port, and I do believe so now. I think she never could have reached port in the hands of her officers if the execution had not taken place. I thought so then. I think so now. Do you distinctly recollect that the commander gave orders to blow Mr. Spencer's brains out or to put him to death if any rescue was attempted? The language I used was my own. The commander's orders were to destroy them, to put them to death. He did not tell me to give the orders to blow out their brains, but I passed the order in that form because these were young officers, and if an attempt were made to rescue the prisoners, I felt the importance of putting them to death. I thought that if the shot was wasted and the prisoners only wounded and taken forward, this might excite and drive on the mutineers to the accomplishment of their purpose. My object was to have them killed at once, that those who were attempting the rescue might see it and be deterred from their object. My purpose was to save shot, as we had none to waste, and at once to destroy the dangerous persons. Commander Mackenzie, did you see the commander or any of the officers of the Summers during the difficulties? Any traces of unmanly fear, of a despotic temper, or any qualities unbecoming an American officer? I saw nothing of the kind. The conduct of the commander throughout the whole was of the most unexceptional character, and I considered the country fortunate in having had such a commander, a man of so much decision, at such a time and under such circumstances of responsibility and danger as then existed. Too much praise cannot be awarded to all the officers. January 4th, M.C. Perry was on board the Summers on her late cruise in the capacity of acting master. The discipline on board after leaving Madeira was good until reaching Porto Praia, after which time, until the execution of Midshipman Spencer, it was not so good. The elder portion of the crew was surly and morose in their manner. Orders had to be repeated several times before they were obeyed. It daily grew worse until the execution. I first heard of the intended mutiny immediately after evening quarters on the 26th of November, the same evening that Spencer was arrested, and while they were putting the irons upon him. The logbook contains a true and faithful account of the occurrences of that voyage. Nearly all the entries are in my handwriting. They were entered at the end of each sea day. 
The book has not been out of my possession, nor have any alterations been made in it since that time. I heard the commander tell Cromwell that he allowed him ten minutes to live, and that he should then hang him to the main yard arm. Cromwell said, I am innocent. Lord of the universe, look down upon me. I went forward to my station. The whips were taken aloft and secured, two to the starboard yard arm and one to the larboard. In about an hour, I saw the prisoners brought forward to the gangway. I then saw Spencer and Small speaking to each other, but heard nothing. They were then lifted on the hammock netting and the ropes secured to their necks. The commander then told me that Mr. Spencer would give the order to fire the gun and directed me to have live coals at hand in case the match would not go, and also to make the crew clap on with both hands to the whips. I obeyed all these orders and told the crew not to let go, but when they got forward to stand still and hold the rope to order to belay, the commander soon after called out, Stand by! I took the apron off the gun, drew a pistol and cocked it, thinking that some of the crew would attempt to rescue. He then gave the order, Fire! The gun was fired. The prisoners run to the yard arm, and the ensign and pennant hoisted. All hands were called to cheer ship, and three hearty cheers were given to the American flag. They were then piped down and piped to dinner. In about an hour, the watch were called, and orders given to lay out the dead for burial. This was done, and at six o'clock that evening all the lanterns were lighted and distributed. I was ordered to see that the crew had their prayer books and responded. The dead were buried according to the Episcopal forms. All hands were piped down and the watch called. The same orders were passed respecting the four prisoners that were left, as had been before concerning the three. Nothing more happened till we arrived in the United States. Previous to the arrest of Spencer, heard Mr. Rogers report Green disobedience several times. There was a great falling off in the discipline previous to the arrest. Parties of the crew mustered together in different parts of the ship. Mr. Spencer's familiarity with those suspected and his keeping aloof from his messmates were also noticed. I knew of his giving small tobacco. This familiarity was chiefly with Cromwell, Green, Warner, and Small, and others whom I do not remember. He was continually laughing and joking with them in a manner not usual with officers. This had attracted my notice before the arrest. A short time before, he was often sitting to the forecastle, having marks pricked in his arms and breast. I sometimes spoke to him about it in an indirect way, to which he only replied that he meant to have it done though perhaps he should be sorry for it. He seemed surly towards his messmates and smiling to the men. Never heard from him, Cromwell or Small, any declarations as to their intentions. After the prisoners were confined, I was led to believe that a rescue was intended by the facts that those whose names were upon Spencer's paper were continually about the mainmast in sight of the prisoners and collected in knots about the vessel that they did not obey their orders with the same alacrity as previous to the arrest of Mr. Spencer, and by the general disposition of those found upon the paper. When the men were collected in knots, they never permitted me to hear what they were saying, though sometimes they would speak up loudly upon some other subject. Their manner on such occasions was very unusual. After the arrest and before the execution, the insubordination, as far as I could judge, was on the increase. It grew worse daily, and after the execution the change was very marked. The discipline was then as good as I have ever seen it. Commander Mackenzie Was the duty of the summers conducted with regularity? Did we fire at targets with great guns and exercise with the broadsword, etc.? And was the summers in an effective condition? We did, and the vessel was in an effective condition. Commander Mackenzie, was attention paid to health and general education? Yes, sir, more than I had ever seen on any other occasion. I know of no Navy regulations which were not perpetually enforced on board the Summers. Commander Mackenzie, do you know of any place on board the Summers 
where three prisoners could be kept in safety beyond the reach of rescue from the crew? I do not, sir. Commander Mackenzie, at the time of the execution, did you or do you now believe that the Summers could have been brought into port if the execution had not taken place? I did not then think so, and I have been confirmed in the opinion since. I think now that you could not have been brought into any port if the execution had not taken place. H.M. High School I was purser on board the Summers, and first heard of the intended mutiny on the morning of the 26th November from Mr. Wales, who came into the wardroom and said to me in a low tone that Spencer had on the evening previous revealed to him the plan of the mutiny. The officers were all to be murdered, and he was to be appointed third officer on board, and the vessel was to be made a pirate. He did not say much to me as he was afraid of being seen talking to any of the officers. He wished me to make the matter known to Mr. Gans aboard. I replied that, as soon as he should come into the wardroom, I would do so. He soon came in, and I told him of it. Through the day, the communication between Mr. Gans aboard and Mr. Wales was through myself. The matter was made known to the commander by Mr. Gans aboard. Through the day, I made known to Mr. G., Facts as they came to my recollection, and he repeated everything to the commander. In the evening, while the doctor and myself were in the wardroom, we were called on deck, and immediately afterward, Commander Mackenzie came up to Mr. Spencer and addressed him, as he had been already stated. Mr. Spencer acknowledged that he had aspired to the command, but that it was only a joke. He was then placed in double irons. Three or four weeks before this, I saw Spencer tear up a piece of paper in the wardroom, upon which were written secret characters, though what they were I could not tell. From the remarks made then, I think, by Mr. Spencer himself, I knew they were secret characters, though I could not see them. The paper was about as large as half a sheet of letter paper, and there were a number of lines upon it. About ten days before the plot was discovered, Mr. Spencer and myself were standing by the forward hatch when he commenced speaking about piratical vessels and remarked that if he were on board of one, he would cruise on the Spanish main and would make it a rule never to chase a vessel if there was another in sight, and, I believe, never to attack one unless he was certain of overpowering her. I think he added that he would not carry any spare spars or sails, but supply himself from the vessels that he might take and that he would destroy all traces of the vessels taken. When he wished to retire from that line of life, he said he would mislead his men when on shore by going in a contrary direction from the one he would tell them he intended to pursue. I do not remember what led to this conversation. I had no conversation with Spencer Cromwell or Small, before or subsequent to the arrest, nor with any other of the crew, touching the alleged mutiny. The crew consisted of 120 persons, of whom seven were officers in the steerage, including Mr. Spencer, four in the wardroom, and the commander. There were eight petty officers, and four rated as seamen, making twelve, nine ordinary seamen, six landsmen, and seventy-four apprentices, rated as boys, making in all 120. The boys were rated in three classes according to their capacity. Commander Mackenzie, how much tobacco, cigars, and soap did Mr. Spencer draw from you during the cruise? From September 12th to November 26th, he drew 725 cigars, 11 pounds of tobacco, and four bars of soap. This was a very unusual quantity, much more than any other officer drew except of soap. Commander Mackenzie, as purser, do you know whether the commander took pains to see that the provisions served to the crew were of good quality? And if so, can you remember any circumstances illustrative of the fact? I can. While at Monrovia the supply of bread was small, I found there was some hard bread to be had there, and took a sample of it to the vessel. In the afternoon I received an order from the commander to purchase as much as one of the cutters would carry. 
When it came on board, it was found not to be equal to the sample and was thrown overboard. Commander Mackenzie, did you believe and do you now believe that the summons could have been brought into port if the execution had not taken place? I thought then, and still think, that there was great danger every moment that those persons were on board. Commander Mackenzie, did you observe in the commander or other officers an indication of unusual fear, a despotic temper, or any of the qualities unbecoming an American officer? No, sir. January 5th. Commander Mackenzie then submitted the following request to the court. May it please the court, as all the mutinies on record have been provoked by injustice towards the crew, or by gross tyranny or incapacity on the part of the commanding officer, it concerns me to show that no such causes existed on board the Summers. The mutinies in the British fleet during the wars of the French Revolution grew out of no disloyalty, but long-continued grievances, which, although the ringleaders were executed, were afterwards solemnly redressed. The mutiny of the Hermione was occasioned by the systematic cruelty of her captain and broke forth in consequence of an act of barbarity which occasioned the death of two of his men. The mutiny of the bounty grew likewise out of the brutality of the captain to both his officers and men. It was directly provoked by an outrageous insult to one of his officers. The mutiny among the shipwrecked crew of the French Medusa was occasioned by the incapacity and want of calmness of the commander and his officers. It therefore concerns my professional honor to prove that on board the Summers and the other vessels I have had the honor to command. There has been no cruelty, no disregard for the personal comfort or for the feelings of those under my command, none of the weaknesses or incapacity which might provoke insubordination or give it encouragement to go on, no want of humanity. This evidence is rendered more necessary by a statement having gone the rounds of the newspapers, as I am informed, that I was cruel and oppressive on board the Independence as First Lieutenant and as Acting Commander of the Fairfield. It has been said by the court that it has nothing to do with what is stated in the newspapers, but the press is a great manufactory of public opinion. The fabric which it produces is of very various quality, but no American can claim to be indifferent to it. Public opinion has been let in to act upon this whole matter, and willing as I am that my whole conduct should be laid before the world, I am glad that the court came to this decision. I am prepared, therefore, to prove that, as First Lieutenant of the Independence, I was opposed to punishing myself, and that all the punishments in that ship were inflicted by order of the Commodore himself, until it became too irksome to him, and of his own motion he devolved the greater part of it on me, that as commanding officer of the Dolphin, I enforced the law of Congress which restricts the power to punish to the commander alone, and requires it to be inflicted by his order and in his presence at a time when the practice of flogging by the first lieutenant and the officer of the deck was universal in the service, as it continued to be, until the circular Mr. Secretary Paulding, requiring the rigid observation of the law of Congress on this subject, was issued. I am prepared to prove that both in the Dolphin and in the Fairfield I was attentive to the rights, the comfort and the happiness of my crews, and that they were eminently orderly, cheerful and contented, that both these vessels were in high order and efficient men of war. As my humanity may be impeached on account of the transactions which the court has under consideration, I am prepared to prove that when the Brazilian city of San Salvador was entered by storming by the imperial troops, and the insurgents within the town, expecting and deserving no quarter, were firing the city and resisting in every direction, I got the Dolphin under way from her anchorage near the British and French cruisers, and crossing the fire of one of the batteries and an imperial cruiser that was attacking it, brought the Dolphin to anchor under the walls of the town opposite the residence of the American consul, receiving him on board with his family, and gave refuge to all who fled on board of her 
from the sanguinary onset of the assailants, from the conflagration and its drunken and desperate perpetrators. I was also prepared to prove that on the termination of the Civil War in the Oriental Republic of, when the constitutional government was overthrown and Ribera was about to enter the city of Montevideo at the head of a horde of ferocious Indians, I gave refuge on board the Dolphin to more than twenty individuals, including several high officers of state, who were deeply compromised, abandoned to the females of their family the exclusive use of my cabin, and conveyed them to a place of safety. That, in like manner, in the Fairfield, I withdrew from threatened death at Buenos Aires, several individuals compromised for political offenses, and that I did this without forfeiting the favorable regard for myself and for my country. Of the authorities of Buenos Aires, conciliated by the energetic measures which I had taken to resist the attempt of the French admiral to encroach on our neutral rights and to extend the rights of belligerents beyond the limits assigned to them by the laws of nations. These various facts I am prepared to prove by witnesses now in attendance on the court and who have urgent calls of duty at a distance from New York. If it be the pleasure of the court, I would be glad that these witnesses should be now examined and suffered to depart. Captain Stewart said that so far as any testimony related to occurrences on board the Summers, or as to his conduct on board that vessel, it was admissible, but no other testimony could be received by the court, as they were restricted to an inquiry into the occurrences on board the Summers, and could not travel beyond it. The judge advocate said that it was his opinion also, and he most fully concurred with Captain Stewart. Those witnesses of Commander Mackenzie's, therefore, who were not required to testify as to what occurred on board the Summers, could be discharged. Dr. Lincock was on board the Summers as past assistant surgeon, first heard of the intended mutiny on the evening of the 26th of November, when I was called on deck at evening quarters. The commander then accused Mr. Spencer of an intention to seize and take the vessel out of possession of the officers. He also accused him of having a conversation with Mr. Wales on the subject. He acknowledged that he had such a conversation with Mr. Wales, but I believe he said it was in jest. It was one of the counsel who examined witnesses, and we came to the conclusion that it would be eminently hazardous to attempt to carry the prisoners home for fear of a rescue being made and the vessel seized. On the morning of the 26th of November, Small presented himself to me to go on the sick list, complaining of nausea and vomiting. I put him on the list and gave him some medicine. The same day Mr. Wales' evidence on Mr. Spencer's case came to my knowledge, implicating also Small. The next morning, Small again presented himself when I saw the sick and still complained of vomiting. From his appearance, tone of voice, and the quivering of his hand when I felt his pulse, I perceived he was laboring under manifest fear and anxiety. I then made some inquiries of persons on the deck as to whether he had been seen to vomit or throw up his food. Nobody having seen him do so, and believing he was feigning sickness, I refused to keep him on the list longer and discharged him. Don't think the disorder he complained of would have produced the effects he showed. He never requested any medical aid after his arrest, and although I had my watch over the prisoners, I never saw him in want of any. I never heard any conversations, tending to show whether there was a mutiny or not on board the Summers, the grounds which induced me to form the opinion that a rescue was to be attempted and that the execution was necessary, were that there were a great many prisoners on the quarter-deck and I did not know how many more were leagued with them among the crew, and also from the testimony I received from the seamen examined before the council, who thought they were very dangerous characters, thought also that the men were dilatory in stirring and performing their duties during the time the whole of the prisoners were in irons on the deck. This, I think, disappeared entirely after the execution. Commander Mackenzie was the commander intentive to the comfort of the sick, and did he ever ask you 
to send for food from the captain's table for those in delicate health. He was uniformly attentive, and I recollect his sending food from his table to the sick. Commander Mackenzie, did the commander in every port ask you to make requisitions for fresh fruit for the sick and crew, and did he show a desire to save the public expense in other ways? I think at every port we went he desired me to make requisitions for fresh fruit and such other articles as would administer to the comfort of the sick. Commander Mackenzie, was there any unnecessary punishment on board the Summers, and was the punishment of the crew cruel or humane? It was no unjust punishment, and the punishment of the crew was humane. Commander Mackenzie, do you believe that from the arrest of Spencer to the execution, the Summers could have been taken into action with the prospect of honor to the American flag? I do not. Commander Mackenzie, do you believe that the Summers could have been brought into port by her officers if the execution had not taken place? I think it would have been eminently hazardous, almost impossible. Midshipman Henry Rogers was senior midshipman on board the Summers during the last cruise and first heard of the mutiny on the 26th of November, immediately after the arrest of Mr. Spencer. I assisted in searching Mr. Spencer's lockers, where they found the razor case with the paper in it, with writing in Greek characters of words in English. This was a list of his accomplices, headed certain, doubtful, and those to be retained on board Nolan's Volans. There were also three explanatory paragraphs. These the first lieutenant took, and I shortly afterward deciphered them for the commander. Between three and four o'clock on the 27th, I heard the officer at the deck give the order to set the sky sails and shortly afterwards take them in again. When the top gallant mast was carried away, I went on deck and saw Cromwell, Small, Wilson, and several others in Mr. Spencer's list, collected about the main top masthead. They were out of their stations and were not usually zealous on such occasions and it therefore struck me that they had gone aloft either for the purpose of plotting or putting in execution some previously formed plot. As soon as it became dark, the first lieutenant armed each of the officers with pistols and a cutlass and stationed me at the lee gangway, with orders to watch that rigging strictly, as he expected they would come down that way. They, however, came down the weather rigging, and Cromwell and Small were arrested and confined in irons as soon as they came on deck. Mr. Spencer was a messmate of mine, and messed in the steerage. The day before his arrest, he came up to me, where I was sitting in the steerage, and asked me abruptly if our chronometer was a good one. I told him I did not know, but supposed it was a very good one. He then asked me if I knew the rate of it. I replied that I did not, and he dropped the conversation. Two or three weeks previous to his arrest, he was speaking of fortune-telling, and said that he could tell fortunes. I asked him if he could tell mine by examining my hand. He said he could, and having examined my hand, he told me that my death would be a violent and sudden one, my life would be short, and that I would be a gambler. He told Midshipman Thompson's and Mr. Delon's fortunes at the same time, in my presence, but I do not recollect what theirs was. He was in the habit of speaking very disrespectfully of the commander in the steerage, but was much too obsequious in his presence. I remember his saying that if the commander should have another S to his initials, it would spell his character. He seemed to be the most familiar with Cromwell, Small, Green, and McKee, and with most of those whose names I subsequently found on his list. He was frequently conversing with them, when he was on duty during his watch, laughing and talking with them in a more familiar manner than became an officer or gentleman. This familiarity had attracted my attention previous to my discovery of the mutiny, and I had made observations on it to my messmates. He was on my watch, and was not attentive to the duties on deck. I frequently had to give orders several times without their being obeyed, I was often under the necessity of going forward myself to put my own orders in execution. 
On each occasion, I generally found him either standing by himself or talking to some of the crew. He was morose and quarrelsome in his disposition, so much so that none of his messmates would have more to do with him than was unavoidable. He associated more with the crew than he did with his messmates. His manner to the crew was the same as to his messmates. I've heard Mr. Spencer make use of mutinous expressions towards his commander among the crew previous to his arrest, but don't remember the words. The discipline of the crew on our arrival at Madeira appeared to be very good. After leaving there, until the arrest of Mr. Spencer, the state of the crew was growing worse, and also till the execution. The elder part of the crew would collect together in knots about the vessel, and were slow to obey the orders of the officers. Their looks were sullen. If an officer approached one of their knots, they would sometimes remain together and their tone of voice would become louder. The Judge Advocate Are these the letters found in the razor case in Mr. Spencer's locker? They are. Footnote This is a translation. Those marks certain are E. Spencer, Andrew McKinley, and Wales. Doubtful. Wilson, McKee, Warner, Green, Gedney, Wilser, Sullivan, Godfrey, Julia, Howard. To be kept Nolan Follins. Sybil, Strummer, Scott Van Brunt, Smith, Whitmore, Gaisley, Blackman, Waltham, Rodman, Clark, Nevers, Selzer, Corning, Richardson, the Doctor, Glevin. Those marked out for with a cross opposite their names will probably join before the plot is carried into execution. The remainder marked doubtful will probably join when the thing is done. If not, they must be forced. Any not marked down who may wish to join after the thing is done, we will pick the best out and dispose of the rest. Wheel, McKee. Armchest, McKinley. Cabin, Spencer, Small, Wilson. Wardroom, Spencer. Steerage, Spencer Small Wilson. All the names found in this list except Andrew were on board the Summers. End of footnote. End of section 55. Section 56 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Commander Alexander S. Mackenzie for Murder, before a Naval Court of Inquiry, Brooklyn, New York, 1842, Part 6. January 6th, Midshipman Thompson was on board the Summers during the late cruise. Previous to hearing of the mutiny, I had observed the conduct of Mr. Spencer to be singular and too familiar with the men for an officer. I have known him to send the apprentices down to his locker for tobacco. I heard him speak disrespectfully of his commander, previous to his arrest, among the midshipmen, but not among the crew. He told my fortune, but I do not remember what it was. I heard him tell Midshipman Rogers he would die a gambler. I noticed his familiarity with the crew generally. I think he was most so with Green. I noticed Cromwell's manner to be very singular previous to his arrest. It changed very much from what it was in the earlier part of the voyage. I sent for him one day about some duty, and when he came, he fixed his eyes on me and gave me one of the most singular looks I ever saw. His whole soul seemed to be in his countenance. It continued until I had told him what I had to say, and he then appeared to be relieved. I noticed that Small was surly previous to his arrest. Mr. Spencer, on the passage between Madeira and Porto Praia, asked me if I did not think that Summers could be easily taken. He said a person could go in the cabin and murder the captain without detection. He also asked me about pirates rendezvousing in the islands in the Pacific, and whether a vessel could not go in there and refit. The discipline of the crew fell off after leaving Madeira, and grew worse until the execution, when it immediately became better. 
I was induced to think the execution was necessary from the testimony given before the council, the gathering of the crew in groups, their sullenness, the confident manner of the prisoners, their interchanging glances with one another, etc. When they collected in groups, there were three or four in a group. I am 21 years of age and entered the service in 1837. Commander Mackenzie, do you know of any place or apartment on board the Summers where three persons could have been kept beyond the reach of rescue from the crew? No, sir. Midshipman Hayes, I was on the summer during her last cruise. I am 20 years old and entered the service 12th March 1838. I first heard the mutiny on the 26th November in the evening, previous to his arrest. On my making some casual remark to him, he said I should have occasion to remember the name of Spencer some day. He never held any conversations with me about piracies or the Isle of Pines. Never heard him make use of mutinous expressions among the crew. Heard him speak very disrespectfully of the commander among his messmates, but don't recollect the words. I have heard him say he was damned humbug. His conduct previous to his arrest was that he seldom associated with his messmates, except at mealtimes. He was morose and quarrelsome in his temper. I did not use to go forward much, and do not know of his habits of association with the crew. He was most familiar with Cromwell, Wilson, Green, and McKee. I have often seen him talking with Cromwell, but I supposed it was on professional matters. The subordination and conduct of the crew was good between New York and Madeira. After that, there was a great falling off in the attention of duty of some of them. Up to the arrest of Mr. Spencer, it grew worse infinitely. I remarked it in Cromwell, Green, Wilson, and Golderman. It indicated itself by inattention to duty and an inclination to be disrespectful. I did not see any material change after the arrest up to the time of the execution, except the talking in groups. I heard none of their talking. I saw them from the quarter deck. The crew performed their duty as cheerfully as I ever saw them after the execution. I was one of the council of officers, and united in the letter to the commander advising the execution of these men. From the testimony received before that council, I was led to believe that the efficient and greater part of the crew were leaked together to effect a rescue of the prisoners, and the fact of carrying away that mast, and the general demeanor of those who were confined the day previous to the execution, and of others who were out of confinement, their general manner and appearance, I was led to believe, that the safety of the summers depended upon the execution. I heard Spencer ask Small to forgive him, and Small replied, No, by God! I can't forgive you, Mr. Spencer. You have brought me to this end. The commander then came up and told Small he had better forgive Spencer, and Small then said, I do forgive you, and gave him his hand. Small also requested permission to address the ship's company, which was granted. He said, Shipmates, take warning by my fate. I am not a pirate. I have not killed anyone. This is because I said I would do so. Heard Cromwell protest his innocence about an hour or an hour and a half before he was executed. Mr. Spencer, some five or six days before his arrest, showed me the drawing of a brig with a pirate's flag. This was in the steerage. It had a black flag with a skull and bones. Two or three days before Spencer was arrested, a strange vessel was in sight and would be to quarters and cleared for action. Cromwell said, there was damn sight of humbug about this vessel. He had been aboard vessels where shot was fired, and there was not so much humbugging. This was addressed to some of the crew. Midshipman Delond was acting midshipman on board the summers during her late cruise. I am seventeen years old, and have been a year in the service. Mr. Spencer told me when we were off Cape Maserado that he should like to have command of a brig like this would cruise off the West Indies with slavers. I never heard him talk of pirates or piracies, or the Isle of Pines, or of taking the Summers. He showed me a brig which he had painted. It was not the Summers, 
but on a baphrodite brig. I don't remember whether it had any flag. The Summers is a full-rigged brig. I never heard him make use of mutinous expressions against the commander. I have heard him abuse the commander. He said if he had his own way with him, he would dismiss him from the service. The crew were very prompt in obeying orders and in good discipline until we reached Madeira. John H. Tillotson was acting midshipman on the Summers during her last cruise. I am 16 years of age and have been in the service about four years. Previous to Spencer's arrest, I had heard him say that he had characters to write, which nobody could understand but himself. I saw him writing on a piece of paper the night before he was taken, and he said he would not have it seen by anyone on any account. I think he put it in his locker when he had done. When we were bearing down upon the brig America, before our arrival at Madeira, he said he should like to have the launch full of armed men and take possession of her. I have frequently heard him call the captain a humbug, but I don't know that it was in the presence of the crew. He was in the habit of associating more with the crew than his messmates, and have known him to give tobacco to the apprentices and cigars to the men. He was most on terms with McKinley, McKee, Green, Scott, Cromwell, and Small. I have seen him talking privately with Small and Cromwell. I recollect Mr. Spencer striking me, because I did not relieve him quick enough, and I struck him back. Oliver H. Perry was commander's clerk on board the Summers, and doing duty as a midshipman. Previous to Mr. Spencer's arrest, I had heard him say that he expected to command a vessel of his own shortly. I think it was about two weeks before his arrest. The first lieutenant and myself were talking together, and Mr. Spencer said this in the presence of Mr. Gansaford. I have also heard Mr. Spencer speak very disrespectfully of the commander, once when going ashore at Messerato. While we were at Messerato, there was an Italian slave dealer there, whom Mr. Spencer went to see. There were three or four of us there, and I heard Mr. Spencer say that he had derived a deal of information from him. I think he was as intimate with the men as with his messmates. Cromwell, Small, McKee, and Green he appeared most intimate with. He would often send McKee down to his locker to get tobacco. I know he bought a box of cigars when he first came on board and gave them to be distributed among the men. Sergeant Gardy was on board the brig Summers doing duty as master at arms. First heard of the mutiny on the evening of the 26th November, after Mr. Spencer was confined. On the passage between Madeira and Tenerife, I was sitting on the combings of the main hatch, and Mr. Spencer came up and asked me, if I was to go ashore to do duty, wouldn't I be reduced to the ranks? I told him, no, sir, unless I committed a crime. He asked me then if I was not made sergeant for the purpose of going on board the brig to do duty as master at arms, and I told him I was. He then changed the discourse by saying she was a fine vessel. I said she was, and he said at the same time that he could take her with six men. I told him he could not do it with three times six. He said provided he knew where everything lay as well as I did, and the keys of the arm chest. He went on to describe how he could take her. First, he would secure the captain and officers, then take possession of the arms, turn up the crew, and he made no doubt as soon as they saw his men at arms, they would give in to him. I told him then that after the crew had been turned up, they could rush on him, and before there might be six killed, we could throw him and his six overboard, and that he must think us a poor crew to think he could take it with six men. Oh, no, or something like it, he muttered out as they went away. On or about the 6th November, I heard Mr. Spencer ask Cromwell how we would like to sail with him. Cromwell said he'd like it well. About the 20th, as I was sitting on the combings of the fore scuttle, there were a number of the crew standing by, and Cromwell in front of Mr. Spencer. They were talking about one thing or another, and the army was introduced by someone, and I asked Mr. Spencer if it would not be better for him to go in the army than the navy. 
He told me that his father told him he would get him a lieutenant's commission in the Dragoons, that he thought he wouldn't like it, and he thought he was not going to be long in the Navy. He said he was going to have a vessel of his own shortly. January 7th, Sergeant Gardy. Mr. Spencer asked me a few days after about the arms, whether they were all loaded. I told him they were, with the exception of six or seven muskets. He asked me why they were not all loaded, and I told him they would not fit in the arm chest if they were pointed all aft. He asked me how they were situated in the chest, and I told him those that were loaded were pointing aft and those not loaded pointed forward. He asked me if they were all primed, and I told him none of them were. He asked me the same question a day or two after, I believe. I don't recollect any further conversations with Mr. Spencer till he died. So Small and Cromwell, in close conversation together, and I went aft and asked Cromwell if he knew anything about Mr. Spencer's going to take the brig. He said not, as also did Small, whom I asked the same question. After Mr. Spencer was arrested, the iron chest was taken off the berth deck into the wardroom. Mr. Gansford gave me the key and told me to see that there was no clubbing on the berth deck. The next morning, Mr. Gansford ordered me to put wall there, the wardroom steward in irons, which I did. When the council was held in the wardroom, I was examined before it and stated what I knew and gave my opinion of the situation of the brig. Being of opinion that Spencer could not take the brig himself, gave me also suspicions that Cromwell and Small were implicated. They were also melancholy and in bad spirits, as if something laid on their minds. I gave my opinion that the brig was in danger of being taken by Spencer and his associates after the arrest. I was asked whether, if they were put to death, I thought the brig would be safe, and said I thought she would. I believe then, and I believe now, that there was danger of a rescue after Spencer Small and Cromwell were arrested. I believe there were persons at large who would have attempted a rescue if an opportunity had occurred. If such an attempt had been made after the armoring of the officers and petty officers, I believe that it might have been successful in case the officers of the watch were only on deck, but the petty officers might be up aloft. Captain Mackenzie, is it your opinion, from all you know or saw, that a majority of the apprentices were acquainted with the plot and hoped to benefit by it? A number of them were, but I can't say whether a majority were. Charles Stewart was on board the summers during her last cruise and was captain of the forecastle. I did not hear of the mutiny on board the summers before Miss Spencer was arrested. I had often seen Mr. Spencer talking with Cromwell previous to his arrest. They appeared to be very intimate. I have seen them talking on the forecastle and on the Jacob's ladder in a low tone of voice so that I could not make out any of their discourse. I have been standing within five or six feet of them and could not hear what they said, both night and by day. I have seen them talking together a number of times. I can't say how often. I was sworn and made a statement before the Council of Officers on board the Summers. The opinion I gave before that Council was that the vessel was not safe while the prisoners Cromwell, Small, and Spencer were on board. My reasons were because of the number of men confined and the few men that were on board the vessel to guard them. There must have been more of the crew than those arrested who had something to do with it, but cannot say who they were. Charles Rogers was on board the Summers during her last cruise as quartermaster. The first I heard of the mutiny was on the night Mr. Spencer was confined. Before we got to the coast of Africa, Mr. Spencer said to me that he wished he had the launch and ten such men as he could pick out from the crew, and he would make his fortune. This was when a brig was bearing down towards them. I said, Then I think your intent must be for taking the brig which was in sight. And he said yes. I told him it would be hard to find ten of the crew to take that vessel. He said yes. He could find ten men, and then mentioned the names of some of the crew and asked my opinion about them. Some of the names were Wilson and Kavanaugh, and McKinley and Green. 
That was all at that time. One night he asked me if I had been in a slaver, and I told him no. Cromwell and Small were the only ones of the crew that understood navigation, so far as I know. Cromwell told me that Spencer had given him $15. I was examined before the council and gave my opinion that it would not be very safe to try to come to America with all the prisoners on board. We had but few men, and the small boys would be a good many of them on the sick list as the cold weather was coming on, while, so far as I could understand, most all the older boys were engaged in the plot. I thought the older boys were engaged in the plot because I heard from Mr. Gans aboard that most of their names were found on Mr. Spencer's list as going to join him. I had not seen anything in their behavior myself to lead me to such an opinion. On account of my being most of the time apt, and not associated much with the boys. I do not believe that the Summers could have been brought safely into port if those men had not been executed. I thought so then, and think so now. January 9th. William Collins was on board as gunner's mate, and after the confinement of Cromwell as boatswain's mate. The discipline of the crew up to our arrival at Madeira was very good. From that time till the arrest of Mr. Spencer, it was very bad. They were slack in performing their duty, and we had to run about to make them do it. I was on the quarter deck and had to run about and act as boatswain's mate to see that the boys did not skulk. The state of the crew from the arrest to the execution was about the same as before, but rather worse, if anything. The men used to be talking together about the decks in groups of four or five and at the same time looking aft toward the prisoners. After the execution, the discipline was better. The men became attentive to their duty and obeyed orders, was examined before the council of officers, and was asked if I thought the ship would be safer with those men out of the ship. I said I thought she would. Mr. Browning, in Boson's mate, my opinion was asked whether I thought it would be safe to try to bring the brig in with three prisoners, and I told him I thought not. I thought it unsafe, because on dark nights and squally weather the officers might be engaged taking in sail, and it was hard to tell who were engaged in it or not, and it would be easy in a dark night for a parcel of men where the officers were running about the deck for each man to pick out his mark, stick his knife in him, and after killing off the officers but the commander, it was easy to take command of the vessel, and not only that, but I do not believe there was a man forward except those three capable of taking charge of that vessel. They were none more capable of taking charge of that brig than I am of a balloon. Cromwell and Small understood navigation, and I have seen them working it. None others of the crew but those three did. My opinion was asked whether I feared a rescue, and I told them I did. I also said that the cooks about the galley were as much to be feared as any men about the ship as they were as big or bigger than any, and never aft the deck. Do not believe Spencer was seaman enough to sail the brig without the assistance of Cromwell and Small. I do not think he knew a dozen ropes aboard of her. Andrew Stevenson was captain of the forecastle. When the mast was carried away, I ordered a loft and found Cromwell, Small, Goldman, and Wilson, there doing nothing but talking. Asked them several times for assistance, but received no reply from any of them. Our treatment on board was middling good, and it was my decided opinion that if the execution had not taken place, the brig could never have been brought to port. Henry King. The discipline was very bad after the arrest and up to the execution. The larger boys seemed to hang back and were very unwilling to go aloft. I watched them closely, and they seemed to hang about the decks. I observed a great many things during the time that caused me to have suspicion. I observed Wilson stole away an African dirk about gun number five, that is, the after gun on the larboard side, and Mr. Spencer was confined on that side close by that gun. I found also two hand pikes and three heavers, which I had stowed away amidships under the boats, and where I thought nobody could get at them, 
had been taken back to where I had removed them from. Do not believe the vessel could have been brought safe into port by her officers had the execution not taken place. I don't think that had we been taken in a heavy squall, we could have saved the masts. The crew gathered about the decks, and we did not know who were engaged in it. And when we went aloft and left the officers on deck, we were afraid there might be a rush made, and the officers knocked down one after the other as easy as could be. I feared a rescue would be made very much, and was afraid to turn into my hammock at night. The men were about the deck, and we did not know who to trust. I thought then, and do now, that had any confusion occurred, a rescue would have been attempted. I think that such an attempt would have been successful, if made, though the officers were armed. We had to go armed when we went aloft. After the arrest and previous to the execution, we could not get much rest. We did not get our usual rest. I was afraid to go to sleep. I had such a dread on my mind. I never unbuckled my arms from me and slept with them from the time they were given me until our arrival in New York off the Navy Yard. Thomas Dickerson I have often noticed Spencer and Cromwell talking together. For the last ten or twelve days, every opportunity they could get, they were talking together. It was in a very low tone of voice. I have been close by without hearing them. One night it had just gone three bells, and I saw two persons in under the booms by the galley pipe. I passed them and then went forward and then turned about to see who they were. I found it was Mr. Spencer and Cromwell, and another man the other side of the pipe, that I could not tell who it was. They never altered their position till I went aft, which was in about fifteen minutes. January 10th. Thomas Dickerson was carpenter's mate. The conduct of the crew generally led me to suppose a rescue would be attempted. I once carried a couple of single sticks to store in Cromwell's storeroom and told him they belonged to the first lieutenant, and he said he did not care a damn. They should not stay there. On my leaving the storeroom, he said, your time's damn short. Another time he had a rule, which was broke, and he said that one of the carpenters had broken it. I told him they had not, and it got broken in the chest, and as I was going up the ladder, he said, God damn you, I'll fix you. Another time, he had a stick of wood up in both hands and was going to knock a boy's brains out with it. He threw one stick and missed the boy. He then took up another in both hands and swore by God Almighty he would drive it through his heart if he was swung on the main yard the next minute. The boy settled down on his knees, calculating to receive his death wound. I interfered, and he stayed his hand, and then he repeated to me that my time was damn short. William Newell, am an apprentice and rated by Captain Mackenzie as ordinary seaman. The discipline was good to Madeira. I saw little difference from that time to the arrest of Mr. Spencer except that Cromwell behaved better to the boys than he had done before. From the arrest till the execution, the greater part of the crew seemed dissatisfied and gathered about the decks talking about Spencer, Cromwell, and Small. They said they thought it was not right to put them in irons. Previous to Mr. Spencer's arrest between Madeira and Cape Mercurado, he told me he should soon have a vessel of his own and asked me if I would not like to sail with him. I told him I didn't know. He also asked me if I did not think Captain Mackenzie was very hard in flogging the boys. Saw Mr. Spencer and Wales talking together on the booms the night before Mr. Spencer was arrested. I should think they were there two hours. I did not hear what they said. I also saw Small come up and speak to them. I saw Spencer show Cromwell a paper about two weeks before his arrest by the storeroom door on the berth deck. It appeared to be about half a sheet of letter paper. He appeared as if he was pointing with his pencil and explaining something to Cromwell. There were marks with a lead pencil on the paper. It was not common English letters, but looked like crosses or something like it. I could not tell whether it was only writing or only marks Mr. Spencer had been making. I could not swear that the paper I saw at the Commodore's was the one I saw in Spencer's hand. 
but it has the appearance of it, and I believe it is the same. I have heard Cromwell say he had been in a slaver and in a prison for being in one. I have never heard Cromwell or Small talk about pirates. I have heard Small say he had killed a Negro and would kill more. I have heard Mr. Spencer say to Cromwell that the Summers would make a fine slaver. When Spencer asked me if I did not think the commander flogged the boys too much, he called him a damn son of a bitch. I have heard Spencer say he would throw the captain overboard the first time he could get a chance. It was after we left Madeira, and I believe when the captain had been reprimanding him for neglect of duty. It was said, as he was coming forward, not to any one person particularly. There were five or six of the crew around. He was generally in a passion when he abused the captain, but not always. Peter Tyson, am in my nineteenth year, was third-class apprentice on the summers, and this was my first voyage. The first I heard of the mutiny was a conversation the night before Mr. Spencer was put in irons. I was laying aft on the spar deck, between the fourth and fifth guns to the leeward side, about seven o'clock in the evening, and Wilson and McKinley came aft. Wilson had his battle axe in his hand and a sharpening stone and no hat on. McKinley said to Wilson, he had just told that we had spies and we had better be careful. Wilson said, no, he need not fear that. He knows me and knows who I am, and that I have been in too many scrapes. McKinley then said to Wilson, would you join them? He answered, he would not mind it. McKinley then said, I don't know. I think I would rather go on a regular slaving expedition. For there, they had $25 a month and prize money. And when we got to St. Thomas, we would be fitted out. It was against the orders to lie on the leeward side of the vessel, and they had come up to me and saw what I was before they began this conversation. I had a pea jacket on. I was drowsy, and I think they thought I was asleep. I had gone there to try to sleep, and I laid still till this, and I then asked McKinley what was that he was saying about a slaver. He replied that he was talking about a slaver that left St. Thomas and had been gone about three months and had taken three or four vessels. He said that she was fitted out with about as many guns as the Summers. I said I had heard of a slaver being fitted out there, and he said it was a free port, and they were often fitted out there. There was nothing said about pirates. Only McKinley said he would rather go in a regular slaver. Matthias Gedney was seaman on the Summers, am apprentice. I am twenty years old and have been over five years in the service. I heard a conversation between Cromwell and Spencer on the passage between Porto Praia and Monrovia. It was between six and eight o'clock in the evening, on the starboard side of the forecastle. They were talking in a low tone of voice, and I was only about three feet from them. I could only hear part of what they said. I heard Mr. Spencer say he would try that plan. If he succeeded well and good, if not, he'd burst. I don't remember that Cromwell made any answer, and Spencer turned and went away. They were talking about a voyage to the northwest coast. A few evenings after I heard Spencer say to Cromwell, he hoped he would not forget what he had spoken to him about. Cromwell said, Oh, no, sir, and walked away. I remember once that Collins was telling us how he had been on a board of vessel with a quantity of money on board, and he was the only one who knew it and told the captain where to find it. Cromwell said it would not do for him to have that chance, but he should be off with it. George W. Warner was captain of the forecast on the summers, am an apprentice and had been five years in the service. Once heard Spencer asked Cromwell what kind of a slave the brig would make, and he said she would make a good one. Never heard them talking together at any other time, but have frequently seen them together. Mr. Spencer has never said anything to me about taking the brig. He never asked me if I had been in a slaver, and never asked any of the boys in my hearing or said anything to them on the subject. After Spencer Small and Cromwell were boarded in irons, I did not think any attempt would be made to take the brig. 
After Mr. Spencer was put in irons, I thought there was a mutiny on board and that there were others concerned in it. I didn't know then who to think was concerned in it. After Cromwell and Small were put in irons, I thought both of them were concerned in it. I thought so from Cromwell's intimacy with Mr. Spencer and his general character. January 11th. George W. Warner had been a prisoner since the mutiny. I suppose Spencer intended to take the vessel to the northwest coast, because he had often said in my hearing that he liked that country the best. Heard Cromwell say he had been in a slaver had been taken prisoner. I said to the consul that I had no doubt Spencer intended to take the vessel, from what I had heard among the crew. I had heard the carpenter say that he had seen Spencer talking with Cromwell out of sight of everybody, and from that, and hearing the captain, when he flogged Waltham, read off part of the plot. I believe Spencer intended to make the attempt. Charles Van Velzer had been a prisoner since my arrival here. I was captain of the foretop on the summers. I am 18 years of age and have been four years and some months in the service. Spencer never conversed with me previous to his arrest. I have often seen him talking with Cromwell at the forehatch, always on the weather side. It was always by themselves and in a low tone of voice. I never heard them but once, and that was on the forecastle. I then heard Spencer tell Cromwell that he should like to have a vessel to go out on the northwest coast with, and he thought he could raise money enough to get one. Cromwell said he was well acquainted with the northwest coast. That was all I heard. Mr. Spencer was most familiar with Cromwell and some of the small boys. Scott, Stranwell's, Blackman, Paisley. He was most intimate with Cromwell. I believe that if there were any plot, Cromwell was concerned with Spencer, but I did not know of any plot. I thought there was a plot because Spencer and Cromwell were so intimate, and what I had heard on the forecastle. I think the brig could have been brought safe into port without executing those men. I thought so at the time, and I think so still. Edward Fowler in fifteen years of age, I was in Cromwell's watch. Mr. Spencer never had nothing to say to me, nor Cromwell, nor Small. I have very often seen Spencer talking to Cromwell alone, every evening, and sometimes all day. It was in a low voice. They would talk sometimes a couple of hours together, and sometimes more. One evening I heard Cromwell, when on the Jacob's Ladder, ask Small if he had ever been at the Isle of Pines. Small said no, and Cromwell said he had been there once in a band of war, and it was a very nice place. Cromwell said, as how, as there was a good many men of war's men and pirates there. And he then said, never mind, we'll soon see the times, when we'll see it again. Small never spoke to that. That's all I heard them say then. I had to go forward to the forecastle. I have often seen Cromwell and Small talking together. James Dunn objected that the court could not receive his testimony as he was a Negro. The court was thereupon cleared for consideration, and on its reopening he was recalled and sworn, after having been questioned by Commodore Stewart as to whether he professed the Christian religion, and also whether he knew the nature of an oath, to both of which he replied in the affirmative. I am a free man and was Captain Stewart on board the Summers. Never had any conversations with either Spencer Cromwell or Small relative to or touching this mutiny. Have seen Cromwell and Spencer in conversation. Have heard Spencer asking some of the men if they would like a glass of liquor. Had heard nothing from any of the crew that would throw any light on this inquiry. Had not noticed any change in the behavior of the crew. Manuel Howard Negro was steerage steward on the summers. One day after the captain had been reprimanding Spencer for neglect of duty, he came down in the steerage and said, The captain has been reprimanding me, but he shan't do it much longer. I have often heard him say he would soon have a ship of his own, but don't know where he was to get it from. One day I was rubbing his head, and he asked me if I would go with him. He did not say where. I told him I would, and he said, 
I should have nothing to do but rub his head and brush his clothes and clean his boots, and he would give me good wages. He did not say where the vessel was to come from or whether he was to be captain. One day afterwards, Mr. Rogers asked me if I would go on his farm as overseer, and Mr. Spencer overheard it and asked him, I think, if he wanted me, and he said, Oh, damn you now. You're going with Mr. Rogers, not with me. I have known Mr. Spencer get the men tobacco, cigars, and soap. I have seen him with a piece of paper on which he seemed to be writing some names, and he asked Mr. Rogers if he understood Greek. Mr. Rogers said he did, and Mr. Spencer then said, Then you can't see it, or anyone else. After Spencer was arrested, the key came to me and said, I'm sorry Mr. Spencer is arrested. I'm damn sorry. I said to him, You'd better shut up and knock off in time, or maybe you'll be there yourself one of these days. McKee appeared to be interested, and as if something was going on that was not right. The sailmaker and Wilson also appeared dissatisfied. I thought the vessel was not safe before the execution, though they were in irons. That is my opinion now also. William H. Seltzer I am 24 years of age and have been seven months in the service. I think if the execution had not taken place, an attempt would have been made to rescue them and take the vessel. I thought they would attempt to take the vessel because the others who were not put in irons till we got here were talking in a mob. They said it was a shame that they were put in irons. They would be talking three or four together. Although the officers and petty officers were armed, I believe if the attempt had been made, it would have been successful. I don't think the vessel could have been brought safe into port if the execution had not taken place. January 12th to 13th. A number of apprentices with the summers, boys from 15 to 19 years of age, were examined. They testified to expressions of Spencer against the captain of the gathering of the crew and groups after the arrest, and a large majority of them, they were over 25 and all examined, said they were afraid that they would be a rescue attempted, and that the brig could not have been brought safely into port had the prisoners not been executed. Commander Mackenzie presented the following communication to the court on the subject of a publication in the Standard of a list of punishments inflicted by him, May it please the court. A publication was yesterday made in the New York Standard, purporting to give an account of the punishments inflicted on board the Summers. This account could only be derived from the log book, which has been produced in evidence before this court, and has remained in its custody. The publication is evidently designed to excite odium against me, at a moment when I am undergoing a solemn inquiry for a painful discharge of what I conceive to be my duty. I am ready and anxious to prove that no other punishments were inflicted on board the Summers than such as were lawful and necessary, but I cannot but object to garbled statements of them unaccompanied by any explanation of the attending circumstances, and therefore throw myself upon the court for protection from this attempt to prejudge my case and prejudice the public mind by the surreptitious use of documents within the custody of the court for the purpose of this investigation. January 17th, William S. Johnson reside at Brooklyn and was introduced to a Mr. Spencer, a son of John C. Spencer, though I can't tell whether it is the one this inquiry is about or not. He had a blemish in one eye. I gave him, I think, 12 months ago last fall a key to some secret writing. He showed me several keys, one of which I think was Aaron Burr's cipher, and requested me to give him the key I had, which I did. The paper of Spencer's, which had a cipher at the top, was here shown to witness. I do not know that cipher. It is not the one I gave Mr. Spencer. I never heard anything from Mr. Spencer about the summers at that time. It was not then launched. The key I gave Mr. Spencer was one he could speak as well as write, and that made him so anxious to get it. Captain Sands, M., the commander attached to the Navy Yard, 
The summons was fitted out under my superintendence at this yard. She is 266, 14, 96 tons. Measurement. Her beam is 25 feet and a little over. If the crew had possession of the berth deck, they could have cut off communication with all the provisions but bread, which was stowed after. With the ship at sea, and a small vessel like that, to have only one prisoner on either side would be a great inconvenience, and interfere with the management and duties and working of the vessel. Any disturbances would have interfered with the working of the vessel. If the prisoners had been confined in the cabin and guarded from the deck, there would have been no interruption to the release by the crew, but the bulkheads, which a single round shot would have demolished. Had the deck been in possession of the crew and the officers below, one man at each end of the trunk with a bullet of wood in his hand could have prevented the officers from coming on deck. Two men at each end would have been amply sufficient to have kept all below. The ladders are nearly perpendicular. Had the prisoners been confined in the ward room, they would have had access to the powder magazine. The belaying pins would have been a very powerful and efficient weapon to keep the officers below. They are formed of iron, about 15 inches long, an inch in diameter, and thicker at one end than at the other. All small vessels sail from here so full that they have stores and provisions stowed on the berth deck. I now recollect that the Summers had a spare anchor and a stock stowed on the berth deck, which would have been a powerful weapon to have staved in the bulkheads, or even to have staved a hole in the ship's side. I have known prisoners to free themselves from their irons when not strictly looked after by the sentinels in whose charge they were. Acting Master Mr. Perry I have the logbook of the Summers here. It is in the same condition as when I last produced it here. The day we first discovered the mutiny was the 26th November. Astronomical time, 12 o'clock. At the time of execution, we were distant from St. Thomas, 525 and a half miles by log. The state of the weather the day after the execution by log was moderate breezes and pleasant weather. On the day of the execution, after the execution, it appears by the log that from six to eight it was squally with showers of rain. After that, it was moderate and pleasant. From that time till we arrived at St. Thomas, we had no squalls except on the 3rd December, from 8 p.m. to midnight, when we had moderate weather squalls. The occurrences relating to the execution are truly related in the logbook. I observed a confident ear about Spencer Cromwell and Small, which appeared as if they expected a rescue. It showed itself even when the petty officers were arming. They seemed under no fear or apprehensions whatever during the whole time they were in confinement. The articles concerning mutiny on board of man of war were read to the officers and crew once a month. I should think the commander passed two-thirds of his time on deck before the discovery of the mutiny. Afterward, and until the execution, about 18 or 19 hours out of the 24, and after the execution he was not so much on deck as he was indisposed. My opinion respecting the guilt or innocence of the men executed was not influenced at all by the opinions or fears of the commander. After the arrest up to the execution, I noticed a change in the physical appearance of the officers. There seemed a drowsiness and weakness about them, which increased up to the execution. The officers did not get, during the time between the arrest and execution, more than four or five hours sleep, and that not refreshing. End of section 56section 57 of american state trials volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org american state trials volume 1 by john d lawson trial of commander alexander s mackenzie for murder before a naval court of inquiry brooklyn new york 1842 Part 7 January 18th Commander Mackenzie 
I am prepared to prove that more than a year ago, it was one of the amusements of Miss Dispenser to relate to the young children of one of the professors of Geneva College, in whose family he was domesticated, murderous stories and tales of blood, that the chief and favorite theme of his conversation was piratical exploits and the pleasures of a pirate's life, that the great object of his ambition was renown as a pirate, that the book which he often has read and which, on leaving Geneva College to embark in a whaler, he presented to the student's library, was the pirate's own book, and that it still remains there with his name in it, that on stepping into the stagecoach to leave Geneva, the last words he said to a friend who took leave of him were that he would next be heard of as a pirate. Witnesses now in attendance upon the court to prove that throughout the period of his service in the Potomac, from Rio to Boston, the possibility of capturing her and the use to be subsequently made of her as a pirate were the object of his thoughts and the theme of his conversation to three at least of her forward officers. To how many of the crew he may have unfolded his plans is not known. That he detailed them in the presence of three can be proved. It can be proved that he explained how the officers might be murdered in the night and the ship captured, that although he objected to the size of the Potomac, if he could obtain a smaller vessel, he was still desirous of undertaking his project in her that he offered the first lieutenancy of the Potomac, if he could obtain possession of her, to one of her forward officers, that with her he proposed to capture some of the packets off New York, that from the captured vessel he hoped to procure a few choice spirits and gradually change and thin off his crew until he got a perfect one, that he proposed also to get in the track of outward-bound India men and made particular inquiry as to the part of those vessels in which they stowed the specie for the purchase of their return cargo, that he also inquired if the masters of the India men did not usually carry their families with them, that he went minutely into all the details of the discipline necessary to restrain the crew of a pirate, the means of refitting and watering in remote and unfrequented seas. I am prepared to prove that during a passage of nearly fifty days from Rio to Boston in the Potomac, this constituted Mr. Spencer's chief topic of conversation among the forward officers and among the crew, and that as an ulterior project, when he found his plans for carrying the Potomac could not be matured, he proposed to equip by some means a clipper brig at Baltimore and arranged all the details for manning and arming her after he should be dismissed from the naval service. I am prepared to prove by John Ford, former wardroom steward of the Summers, that the night before the Summers sailed, Daniel McKinley told him that there would probably be a mutiny on board the Summers. With regard to Samuel A. Cromwell, I am prepared to prove that for mutinous conduct he was turned out of his ship, and towed ashore on a grating, that very shortly before the departure of the Summers from New York, he asserted in a bar room of the Bowery of New York that there would probably be a mutiny on board of her before her return, Charles A. Wilson being at the time in his company. I am prepared to prove by Lieutenant Montgomery Lewis that when employed in the Florida Flotilla under Lieutenant McLaughlin on one occasion, when in a boat expedition under Lieutenant Rogers, Cromwell, having been put in irons for drunkenness and mutinous conduct, menaced Lieutenant Lewis by telling him that the next time they fell in with Indians, other shots would be received than those that were fired by Indians, and that there would be some killed. By Edwin Alfred, a seaman now on board of this ship, that during the greater part of the night he paraded before the tent to Lieutenant Lewis, with a loaded carbine, and with the avowed purpose of shooting him, should he come out, that he had two separate projects for creating a mutiny among the seamen of the expedition, at one time to turn all the officers adrift in a boat with a single oar, to proceed with the boats to Cuba and the Isle of Pines, with all the recesses of which, and of the neighboring coast, he professed to be familiar, and then to engage in piracy. 
whatever the court may decide, as to the evidence thus offered to prove the early piratical propensities, and the piratical project in another ship of Mr. Spencer. I trust it will, at any rate, depart sufficiently from its rules to receive the entire testimony offered to prove the piratical tendencies of Cromwell. He alone of the three mutineers, who were executed, persisted to the last in protesting his innocence, even while asking forgiveness of Lieutenant Gans aboard. Such is the secret character of mutiny, and the precaution with which a practiced pirate especially would hide his guilty plottings against the lives of his comrades and the honor of his country, that it is impossible to adduce, even before this court, all the evidence which rendered the guilt of Cromwell palpable to his officers and messmates, and divested it of all doubt. Many trifling incidents that had weighed at the time are forgotten. Many, consisting of looks and motions, significant enough to those who see them, cannot be described. Though it is believed that abundant evidence has been adduced before the court to prove the guilt of Cromwell, yet, with the means of showing his previous mutinous and piratical propensities at hand, is it not desirable to go a step further? and satisfy those who are strangers alike to the peculiar position of a ship's company alone upon this ocean, and the dire necessity they might grow out of a condition of that company, rare in any navy, and happily unparalleled in our own. The judge advocate stated that he should object most decidedly to the introduction of all the testimony offered as to Spencer's conduct or declarations on board the Potomac, or other vessels, or as to Cromwell's behavior while in the Florida squadron, as he considered it decidedly inadmissible. He had also doubts as to whether the declarations alleged to be capable of proof as having been made by Spencer, Cromwell, and McKinley, previous to the sailing of the summers from this port, could be received as testimony. He thought, however, that if those declarations had been made immediately previous to her sailing, they might be received as testimony. The court. We cannot admit testimony as to the conduct or declarations of Spencer on board the Potomac, or previously, or of Cromwell's while in the Florida squadron, but testimony will be received as to any declarations made by Spencer, Cromwell, McKinley, or others, touching the intended mutiny that occurred shortly previous to the sailing of the summers. Acting Master M.C. Perry, recalled, was one of the Council of Officers on board the Summers and was present during G.W. Warner's examination. The question was asked of him whether he thought Cromwell deserved to be hung, and he replied positively that he did. Persa High School, recalled, I took down the testimony of the witnesses as taken before the Council of Officers, correctly to the best of my belief. Warner there stated to the best of my belief that Cromwell ought to be hung. He said so distinctly. Warner's statement was read over to him twice. He made no objection to it and then signed it as a true statement. Lieutenant Gansevoort, recalled, was present at the Council of Officers. Wilson never made any report to me that he knew enough to hang Mr. Spencer. He came to me and told what he said had been a conversation with Mr. Spencer and himself, which was evidently a lie, and I told him so. He did it, I think, to ward off suspicion from himself. The form of the oath administered to the witnesses before the Council of Officers was, You do solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give before this Council of Officers assembled shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. The first two witnesses were examined without the oath, but afterwards warned with the alteration, the evidence you have given, their evidence being read over to them at the time. In the opinions which I gave of the necessity of the execution, I was not influenced by the arts or fears of the commander or any other man. I was influenced solely by the dictates of my conscience and from the knowledge I had of the facts, the commander did not take measures to ascertain which of the crew were disaffected and which not, 
because he did not wish to make known any suspicions he might have of any man at large without immediately confirming them. I thought, too, that the greater part of the crew was implicated and told the commander so. I had a better opportunity of judging from my situation than the commander had. I don't think that the officers could have stood out more than one or two days longer, carrying the weight of arms they did and not being allowed to sit down and in constant fear of a rescue. I judge for myself, and I am one of the strongest. I think the younger officers could not have stood it so long. Previous to the discovery of the mutiny, I think the commander passed two-thirds of his time on deck, and afterwards much more. I remarked that during the time, Spencer, Cromwell, and Small were in confinement. They appeared quite confident, and not at all alarmed at their situation. They seemed as if they expected a rescue, nor did their manner change until they were told they were to die. The article relative to mutiny was read once a month to the crew. The instructions of Secretary Paulding requires that apprentices should not be allowed to draw their spirit rations or tobacco. An order was promulgated to that effect on board the Summers, in pursuance of the Secretary's instructions. I am not aware of any injury Cromwell had done me to make him ask my forgiveness, except that he had meditated my death. The treatment of the crew was humane. There were more pains taken to procure good provisions, fresh fruit and vegetables, and make them comfortable than I ever saw on board a man of war before. I have known the commander to give the boys fruit that had been purchased for his children in consequence of the mistake of the purser in not having purchased what was ordered. There was no excess of punishment on board the Summers, and no offenses were punished that are not punished on board other vessels. There appeared a reluctance on the part of Captain Mackenzie to punish. I have frequently reported some of the crew. The punishments were generally inflicted with the colt, in a few instances with the cats. A colt is made of three stones, I think. It is lighter, much, than the cat. The punishment with the colt is always given without stripping over the clothes. The punishment with the cat is a much more formal punishment than with the colt. When the cat is used, the whole crew is called to witness punishment. Dr. Lincock recalled was present at the Council of Officers, and the testimony was correctly taken down. As surgeon of the Summers, it is my opinion that the physical strength of the officers was much reduced and their health materially affected by constantly carrying heavy arms during the day and sleeping with them at night. Physical and mental exertion, having so small a quantity of sleep, being almost constantly on the watch from the time of the discovery of the mutiny, until the execution. I think the officers were worn down more and more every day. It was quite visible in their countenances, and it was confirmed by their constant complaints. During the watch, the idlers had to go on deck every half hour, and to do so, they had to crawl under the hammocks, as they were strung to get out, being heavily armed at the same time. J. W. Wales recalled, the testimony of the witnesses before the council was read over to them, and they were informed if they wanted to make any corrections, it would be done. Corrections were uniformly made when the witnesses desired. Previous to the conversation with Mr. Spencer on the boom, I had been as intimate with him as any of the officers. I had been found with him smoking and talking. Whenever he wanted to draw any tobacco or cigars from the storeroom, he would always come to me for it. No conversation relating to any attempt to take the brig had been had by Mr. Spencer with me previous to that night on the booms. Neither had given me any hints or intimations of such purpose, nor had Small, Cromwell, nor any person on board. John Ford, I am not now in the service. I have been. Was wardroom steward of the summers. I left her six or eight days before her last cruise. The night before the summer sailed, Daniel McKinley, one of the crew of the summers at the time, said something to me about a mutiny. I was on board in the afternoon waiting for Mr. Wales, who owed me some little change. 
Towards evening, I went on shore, and after I got out of the boat, McKinley took me on one side and said, Steward, there will be mutiny on board this time for certain. You may be glad you are not going out in her, supposing we run out of the little stores this time, as we did before. Commander Mackenzie, although it has been determined by the court that a written defense of my conduct, founded on an examination of the evidence that has been adduced, is unnecessary and, under the circumstances, inadmissible. I trust that the court will not refuse to receive from me a brief statement of the reasons that produced the conviction in my mind on which I acted that the execution of the ringleaders of the intended mutiny on board the Summers was necessary to the preservation of the vessel. It is true that these reasons may be collected from my report to the Secretary of the Navy, which has been read before the court, but they are nowhere stated in connection nor with that distinctness and brevity that are necessary to impress their force on the minds of others. My report to the Secretary was intended to be a full history of all the proceedings on board the Summers for his information alone, and was far, very far, from being framed with any direct view to my own vindication. I proceed then, under the permission of the court to submit the following facts and considerations as the reasons that chiefly determined my conduct, how far the reality or sufficiency is established by the evidence, are questions that, without a single remark, I shall leave to the judgment of the court. First, I was influenced by my deep conviction of the reality of the plot disclosed by Mr. Spencer to Mr. Wales. Although I received the first communication with incredulity, yet when I reflected upon the earnest and solemn manner in which the disclosure was made, and the strong impression of the reality and imminence of the danger made upon the mind of Mr. Wales himself, my doubt vanished, and my mind was filled with the most earnest solicitude to discover and adopt the proper means for arresting the horrors with which we were threatened. I at once determined to adopt no measure, but after mature deliberation, to shrink from none that the preservation of the lives of those entrusted to my care, the honor of my country and my sense of duty should demand. Whether the influence of this determination is not apparent in all my subsequent acts, I submit to the judgment of the court. I believe, then, in the existence of a plot in which, by the declaration of Mr. Spencer, at least twenty of the crew were concerned. The nature of this plot, involving the murder of the officers and a large portion of the crew, and the commission of almost every crime, convinced me that those who had agreed to it were capable of carrying it into execution and committing any atrocity. This opinion was further confirmed by my previous knowledge of the depraved character of the crew, and by the fact that many of them, although men in strength and size, were still boys in age, and consequently would be little likely to resist temptation and more easily allured by the pleasures held out to them as accompanying the life of a pirate. Having stated the reasons which produced the conviction in my mind of the existence of the plot, it only remains for me to state those which induced me to change my original determination to bring the prisoners to the United States for trial and to deem their immediate execution necessary. I was influenced, first, by the insubordination of the crew manifested after we had left the coast of Africa, and very much increased after the arrest of the prisoners. Their gloomy and angry looks, their secret conferences, broken off when an officer appeared, their increased reluctance in the performance of their duty, the actual disobedience of some, the attempt of several to communicate with the prisoners. All these circumstances convinced me that there was danger of a rescue and that this scheme was in constant agitation. Secondly, by the uncertainty under which we labored as to the extent of the mutiny and the inutility and danger of attempting to ascertain by an examination of the crew how many were to be relied on. Let us suppose that the whole crew had been examined, and all had protested their innocence and ignorance. Could we have believed and trusted them? 
would the uncertainty have been removed or diminished? On the contrary, must not the universal denial have increased and justified our suspicions of universal guilt? We must still have believed that many were guilty and could not have known that any were innocent. If the examination had resulted in the discovery of the certain guilt of many of the suspected, our difficulties would have been still greater. To confine and guard them was impossible. To leave them at large, with the knowledge that their guilt was known, and that, if they arrived in safety, death might be their doom, was to render them desperate and an outbreak inevitable. Thirdly, by the exhaustion of the officers and by the impossibility that they could much longer sustain the fatigue to which they were subjected, and by the fact that, from loss of rest and continual exertion, we were daily losing strength, whilst that of the mutineers, from increasing numbers, was daily becoming greater. Fourthly, by the conviction that, even if it were possible for the officers to defend themselves and their vessel in fair weather, if a storm should arise, calling the attention of the officers and petty officers from the prisoners to the necessary duties of taking care of the vessel, it would have been easy for a few resolute men to have released the prisoners and taken possession of the vessel. Fifthly, by the size of the vessel which rendered it impossible for me to confine any more prisoners and prevent those already confined from communicating with each other and with those of the crew who were at large. Finally, by the conviction that, by the execution of the three ringleaders, the mutineers would be deprived of the power of navigating the vessel, as no other person would be capable of taking charge of her, and that this was the only effectual method of bringing them back to their allegiance and preserving the vessel committed to my charge. Having thus briefly stated the motives which produced the belief that the immediate execution of the ringleaders was necessary, I would only add that had any doubts existed in my mind as to the necessity of the course to be pursued, they would have been removed by the unanimous opinion of the commissioned, warrant and petty officers, whose means of judging were better than my own, that such a course was necessary and inevitable. Their opinion, concurring with my own, left me no room to doubt that in pursuing this course I was doing my duty faithfully to my God and to my country. The Judgment The President stated that the testimony being now closed, the court would be cleared. The court will deliberate and frame their decision, and it will then be sent to Washington for approval. The decision of the court, when promulgated later, was as follows. That a mutiny had been organized on board the United States brig Summers to murder the officers and take possession of the brig. That midshipman Philip Spencer, boatswain's mate Samuel Cromwell, and seaman Elijah Small were concerned in and guilty of such mutiny. That, had not the execution taken place, an attempt would have taken place to release the prisoners, murder the officers, and take command of the brig. That such attempt, had it been made in the night or during a squall, would, in the judgment of the court, from the number and character of the crew, the small size of the brig, and the daily decreasing physical strength of the officers, occasioned by almost constant watching and broken slumbers, have been successful. That Commander Mackenzie, under those circumstances, was not bound to risk the safety of his vessel, and jeopard the lives of the young officers and the loyal of his crew, in order to secure to the guilty the forms of trial, and that the immediate execution of the prisoners was demanded by duty and justified by necessity. The court are further of opinion that throughout all these painful circumstances, so well calculated to disturb the judgment and try the energy of the bravest and most experienced officer, the conduct of Commander Mackenzie and his officers was prudent and firm, and that he and they honorably performed their duty to the service and their country. Before the communication of this decision to the Secretary of the Navy, he caused the commander of the Summers to be arrested on a charge of murder. There were three specifications, all of which were but variations of one and the same charge, 
that the execution was directed and carried into effect without justifiable cause. A court-martial was convened at the Navy Yard in Brooklyn for the trial. It consisted of the following officers. Commodore John Downs, President. Commodore George C. Reed. Captains William C. Bolton. Daniel Turner. John D. Sloat. Joseph Smith. George W. Storer. Isaac McKeever. Benjamin Page. John Gwynn. Thomas W. Wyman. Commanders Henry W. Ogden. Irvin Shubrick. The judge advocate was William H. Norris of Baltimore. They commenced their sessions on the 2nd of February, 1843, after the judge advocate had concluded the reading of the charges and specifications. Commander Mackenzie rose and said, Spencer, Cromwell, and Small were put to death by my order, but to the charges and specifications I plead not guilty. He was allowed counsel, and Mr. Griffin, Mr. Dewar, and Mr. Sedgwick acted in this capacity. Footnote. John Dewar, 1782 to 1858, born in Albany, New York, later of New York Bar in Insurance and Maritime Law, author of Dewar's Reports and Law and Practice of Marine Insurance. End a footnote. The court was occupied in the hearing of this clause for upwards of 40 days, a longer period than was ever before consumed by any such proceeding in naval annals. By their final report, Commander Mackenzie was honorably acquitted of all the charges and specifications preferred against him by the Secretary of the Navy, and their judgment was confirmed by the President of the United States. Footnote. John Tyler, 1790-1861, born in Greenway, Virginia, graduated from William and Mary College, called to the bar, 1809, member state legislature, 1811, member of Congress, 1816, governor of Virginia, 1825, United States Senator, 1827, vice president of the United States, 1841, president on the death of William H. Harrison, 1841 to 1845. End a footnote. End of section 57. Section 58 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Oscar T. Caldwell for Embezzlement, Chicago, Illinois, 1855, Part 1. The Narrative Railroads had not been running very many years in the western states or anywhere else in this country when this case arose. Wherefore, it would seem that it did not take long to find out that the position of a conductor of a train was one which gave large opportunities for enrichment. Caldwell had been a conductor for some time on the Chicago and Burlington Railroad when his superiors began to suspect that he was not turning in all the money collected on the train. Month after month, when his returns were compared with those of other conductors on the same run, it was found that his were usually less than the others. When the superintendent offered him a ticket agency in a small city at a salary of $1,000 a year, in place of his salary of $700 as conductor, and he declined, this roused suspicion, and the result was that the celebrated Pinkerton Detective Agency of Chicago, then in its beginning, was employed to investigate. This it did with great success. It sent several men over the road at different times of Colwell's train. These men had marked money in bills which they paid to him as fares, and when Caldwell was finally arrested, some of this money was found on his person. Confronted by the Pinkertons with the evidence of his guilt, he did not deny the charge, and the railroad seems to have been willing not to prosecute if he would make restitution to the best of his ability. Negotiations to this effect were in progress when a lawyer got hold of him and advised him to give up nothing but to fight. 
The result was that he was indicted by the grand jury and tried in the recorder's court in Chicago in November 1855 and convicted. The trial. Footnote. Bibliography. Trial of Oscar T. Caldwell, laid a conductor on the Chicago and Burlington Railroad for embezzlement before the recorder's court of the city of Chicago at the September term, 1855. Reported by J. Victor Smith, reporter for Ohio and Indiana State Constitutional Conventions. Chicago, Daily Democratic Press Steam Company, Number 45 Clark Street, 1855. End of footnote. Honorable Robert S. Wilson, recorder. Footnote. Robert S. Wilson, member of the Bar of Michigan, moved to Chicago, 1850 member of firm of Wilson and Frank, was elected judge of the newly created Recorder's Court in March 1853. His eligibility to office was questioned, he not having resided in Chicago five years before his election, and quo warranto, proceedings were commenced against him. After a long contest, the case was decided by the Supreme Court in his favor. Died 1883. End the footnote. November 19th, the prisoner having been arrested September 15th, and a true bill having been returned, he appeared today by his counsel, who moved to quash the indictments. The motion was overruled, but the state not being ready on indictments one and two, a nolle prosequi, was entered on them, and the trial begun on the third. Daniel McElroy, Isaac N. Arnold, and John T. Stewart for the people. Footnote. Daniel McElroy, born in Tyrone County, Ireland, highly educated in Boston, taught school for two or three years, entered Harvard University, and afterwards studied law with Judge Story, went to Chicago in 1844, elected state's attorney of Cook County several times, died 1862. Isaac N. Arnold, Born in Otsego County, New York. From 16 to 20, he taught school half the year to maintain himself and attended school the other half. Entered law office of Richard Cooper and Judge Morehouse at Cooperstown and was admitted to bar at 21. Moved to Chicago, 1836. Elected to General Assembly in 1842, 1844, and 1856. Presidential elector, 1844. Elected to Congress, 1860. Warm personal friend of President Lincoln. Wrote The History of Abraham Lincoln and the Overthrow of Slavery in the United States. And Life of Benedict Arnold, 1880. Auditor of the Treasury for the Post Office Department. Died, 1884. John T. Stewart, prominent lawyer of Springfield, Illinois. Member of Congress. And a footnote. Robert S. Blackwell, E. W. Tracy, and T. Lyle Dickey for the prisoner. Footnote. Robert S. Blackwell, born in Illinois, son of David Blackwell, eminent lawyer of Belleville, Illinois, studied law with O. H. Browning, Quincy, and opened a law office in Rushville. Moved to Chicago and formed partnership with Corridon Beckwith author of Blackwell on Tax Titles, an abstract of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Illinois, died 1870. E. W. Tracy, highly educated, of commanding appearance and Websterian in his command of language and reasoning powers. In 1854, he entered into partnership with Charles S. Cameron and had offices at 44 Clark Street, Chicago. T. Lyle Dickey, 1811 to 1885, born in Bourbon County, Kentucky, graduated from Miami College, moved to Illinois, 1834, admitted to Illinois Bar, 1835, organized company for Mexican War, Captain First Regiment, Illinois Volunteers, elected circuit judge, 1848, served four years and resigned to re-enter practice went to Chicago in 1854 and returned to Ottawa in 1859, 
organized cavalry company in 1861 as 4th Illinois Cavalry, elected colonel, joined Grant at Cairo, was with Grant at Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson, and Shiloh, appointed chief of cavalry, on Grant's staff 1862, Democratic candidate for Congress at large 1866, commissioner from Illinois to Washington to secure appropriation for Illinois and Michigan Canal, 1867, assistant United States Attorney General, 1868, Corporation Council of Chicago, 1874. End of footnote. Several hours were consumed in getting a jury, a number being challenged by the defense, and finally, the following been selected. The court adjourned until the next day. William A. Tryon, Foreman, I. Bodwell, Benjamin Marshall, J.P. Knott, J. Roberts, Edward McGuire, Casper Arnold, Peter Button, George W. French, Oliver Jagger, James Kettlestring, William A. Baldwin. November 20th, Mr. Arnold to the jury. The indictment sets forth that on the 13th of September last, Oscar T. Caldwell was a conductor on the Chicago and Burlington Railroad. He was a popular conductor. There were no circumstances known to the companies leading them to suspect the integrity of Mr. Caldwell. The statute provides that every person in the employ of any corporate body who shall steal or embezzle any of the monies of said body shall, on conviction thereof, be imprisoned in the state's prison for a term not less than one, no more than ten years. It is charged that the accused was a conductor for the company named, that he received a very large amount of money belonging to the company, some portion of which he embezzled and converted to his own use. It is the duty of the conductor immediately after the trains leave the depot to go through the cars and ascertain who has paid fare at the office of the company and to collect the money for the fares of those who have not. He is to enter the amounts of money thus received in the blank tally sheet provided for the purpose. On the return of a conductor, say from Chicago to Burlington, this tally sheet will, if honestly kept, exhibit the exact amounts of fares received during the trip. In the hurry attending a large passenger train and trip, it would not be strange if the money handed over by the conductor should overgo the amount minuted on the tally. He might neglect to minute every fare taken, but if honest, the money returned would correct the tally. But it would be strange if the money fell short of the tally. During the month of May and June, it was discovered that the money returns of Mr. Caldwell were uniformly behind that of other conductors, alternately running the same trains. He was a popular conductor, and there seemed no reason why his returns of money should be always less than that of other conductors running on the same route. The discrepancy for one or two or three trips might not have been suspicious, but the average returns by Mr. Caldwell were seriously less than those of other conductors running alternate trains. The average of one conductor, for instance, was $97.00 of another $118, while Mr. Caldwell's were but a fraction over $76. In the month of August, persons were placed on the trains to report the exact amount of way fares collected by Caldwell. Mr. Hammond, the superintendent, wished to be absolutely certain of the guilt of the accused before exposure. This examination result in the discovery that Caldwell did not return all the money received by him for fares. In September last, a circular was issued requiring conductors, etc., to return to the general receiver of the company the identical money received of passengers. This was done in special view to Caldwell's case and to make assurance doubly sure. It was found that of 88 fares paid to him on a trip to Burlington, he reported but eighty and one-half fares. On the return trip, he, Caldwell, received forty-seven fares and reported thirty-one and a half fares. Of the March money paid him by persons set to watch him, 
Some was not returned to the railroad, but was afterwards paid out in the city by Caldwell, and some of it was subsequently found on his person. On the ninth of September, four persons were set to watch Caldwell. They paid their fares to Caldwell on the cars. He reported but two. Of fourteen other fares known to have been paid him, he returned money for only eleven fares. In addition to this, the confidential agents of the company found that he received on the return trip seven fares and reported but four fares. There was a discrepancy between his reports and the monies actually received of twenty fares. On the way out, he pocketed twelve dollars, and on the return trip, twenty-four dollars. Among the monies paid to Caldwell by the four persons set to watch his operations were three twenty-dollar gold pieces, two tens and two fives. Of the gold paid to him, Caldwell returned none to the company's office, at the time of his arrest, there was found on the accused a tally book which shows the manner in which he made up his accounts. His tally or memoranda was nearly correct, but you will see that he coolly and deliberately abstracted a portion and made up a false report. His own tally list shows the receipt of fifty-eight fares, and he reports an account for but fifty-one fares. His own account, in his Caldwell's own handwriting shows that going west, he received $83.95 and reported but $64.75, leaving for his stealings going west $19.20. On the return to Chicago on the same trip he received, according to his own report, in his own handwriting, $181.75, reports but $138.90, leaving for his stealings on the round trip the large sum of $62.05. On two occasions, the money returned by Caldwell overran the amounts minuted on his tally book as received. At one time, the excess was $0.20, cents, at another $0.85. Cents. But when he comes to the large sums, he lets the discrepancy go the other way. By the most careful estimates made by officers of the company, as to the gross amount thus embezzled, it appears that Caldwell had stolen fully $2,500. Mr. Hammer did not desire to expose the young man. They had been associated in business, and if the company could be indemnified, no farther proceedings would be had. On the 15th of September, Caldwell was invited to the office of Pinkerton and Rucker. There he was told of the discovery of the embezzlement. They told him he was uniformly behind the other conductors, that they, P and R, did not wish him to criminate himself by an admission, but they wished him to make restitution to the company. The accused seemed overwhelmed. He did not deny his guilt. He asked to see Colonel Hammond, who came and met him at the police office of Pinkerton and Brucker. Caldwell did not deny his guilt, but asked respectfully how much he was behind. Finally, Colonel Hammond told him the sum was $2,500 and consented to accept his, Caldwell's, resignation on condition that he would surrender up his property and so make restitution to the company, whose confidence he had betrayed. Caldwell reckoned up his property and found it amounted, here and in Buffalo, to some $1,700. Some dispute arose at one time during these interviews as to the amount of gold embezzled. He was subsequently searched and the important memoranda and the money found on his person. He was taken to jail on Saturday night. While in jail, Mr. Rucker visited him and again urged the prisoner to make full restitution to the company. At one time, Rucker said, Now, Mr. Caldwell, you don't pretend to deny that you are behind. No, replied Caldwell, I pretend to nothing of the kind. He thought he could not be behind so much as $2,500, said his wife kept all his accounts, and until it was further investigated, he did not know how he did stand with the company. At one time, Caldwell seemed utterly overcome. He said, I wish I had never come to Chicago. I am ruined. I have lived too fast. Finally, and before any settlement was made, 
which at one time was nearly consummated between Caldwell and the agents of the company. Lawyers obtained access to the accused, and in his behalf all further negotiations were declined, and Mr. Caldwell would not make any transfer of his property to the company. The state would be glad if the accused succeeded in producing clear evidence of his innocence, but I fear that the proofs of his guilt are as conclusive as they are abundant. Witnesses for the People and Defense Colonel Hammond and Superintendent of the Chicago and Burlington Line of Road, commencing at Chicago and running over the Galena Road for 30 miles and terminating at Galena. Accused was passenger conductor in September last for the Chicago and Burlington Line. Corporate name of the road is Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad, from Junction to Mendota. From Mendota to Galesburg, it is the Central Military Tract Railroad. Mr. Dickey objected to oral proof of the employment of accused by the two companies named or to proving the employment of either a superintendent or conductor orally. Objection overruled and exception taken by counsel for defense. Mr. Hammond, the Central Military Tract Railroad Company, and the Chicago Burlington and Quincy Railroad Company run or operate the line from Chicago to Burlington. Accused was in the employ of the companies up to the 19th of September. He made his reports and paid over his money to Charles E. Follett, the general ticket agent of the companies, and at that time general receiver of monies. Cannot state the precise time up to which Caldwell paid over monies to Follett. Think Mr. Jurgy became receiver sometime in August. He has acted as receiver since. The places named in the timetable now handed me are the stations on the C&B line and the distances there input down are mainly correct. In the tally list, the stations this side of the junction are not named as in the timetable because we do not collect fares between Chicago and Junction. The tally list is kept thus. When a wave passenger gets on the train, the conductor collects his fare and marks down one, opposite the name of the station to which he pays. The figures opposite the station to which the passenger or passengers pay indicate the number of fares. The fare from Chicago to Burlington is $6.00. I have given all my time to the superintendents of the C&B line since May last. Tickets have always been sold at Chicago and Burlington, and for some time past, at the prominent way stations. It is customary as soon as the train starts, and it is the duty of the conductor to observe the custom, to pass through the train, collect the tickets of such passengers as have bought their tickets at the office, to collect the fares of those who have not paid, and to enter these last in the tally sheet I have mentioned. Small printed checks are returned to passengers on receipt of their tickets or fares, in token that they have paid their fares to the station named, and for the convenience of the conductor. I know of no printed regulations on this particular head. It is the duty of the conductor to pass through the train and collect fares and tickets after passing each station. We have seven conductors and two trains each way every weekday. The seven conductors run the four trains. If there were eight conductors, they would each run the same days. There being seven, they follow each other round and in progress of time. Each conductor runs on every day of the week. On our general timetable, the train arrives in Burlington, just as... The eastward train leaves the city for this. A conductor leaving here Monday morning would leave Burlington on his return trip Tuesday evening and return here Wednesday morning. It is the custom to report to the receiver of the line at Chicago and to pay over monies received for the eastward and westward trains. To Mr. Tracy. These sheets are specimens of blank table sheets, etc., furnished to conductors. The conductor minutes upon this small tally sheet the number and amount of fares received between Chicago and Burlington, and Burlington to Chicago, and draws this off upon another blank, 
which he hands in with his report. If five persons get on the train here for Burlington, without purchasing their tickets in the office, and pay the conductor, it is the conductor's duty to mark on the tally sheet against Burlington the figure five, and in the proper place, thirty dollars, so that the money in a correctly kept tally sheet will check the number of fares, and the number will check the money due. The conductor is paid a monthly stipulated salary agreed on. He is paid on payroll or voucher, is paid sixty dollars. He is not to take his pay out of the fares he collects. Charles E. Follett, reside in Chicago, since first of May last, had been an employee of C and B Railroad, was general ticket agent in September last, was receiver up to August last. The receiver receives money from conductors and passes them over to the treasurer. Mr. Jerji succeeded me as receiver, for the last ten years have been connected with railroads. The specimen tally sheet now handed me was got up by myself. It contains the rates of fare between Chicago and Burlington. The blank now handed me is a conductor's report. The checklists are provided for convenience of conductors. It contains all the stations, with rates of fare between each. There are blank spaces in which conductors are supposed to enter the number of all fares received. The conductor's report is made up from the tally or checklist. In cases where there is more money than the tally lists and report call for, my instructions have been that conductors should, if the sum was enough, set it down as a through fare from Chicago to Burlington. If less than six dollars, it was to reach as far as it would go, commencing at this end of our road, or over our road, to the CMTRR. Our line is made up of three roads, and it is our duty to protect the interests of each, and as accurately as possible. I handed to Mr. Caldwell a copy of this notice to return the identical money received on the trains. The conductors on our line run round, as we phrase it, so that in the course of time each conductor had the same days to run in. We are able to know the average of fares received by each conductor. First in, first out was the rule. I have made a written statement showing the amounts and the average fares taken by each conductor between a certain day in May and another in September. This includes the receipts of Mr. Caldwell. The amount of fares taken by each conductor is something of a matter of luck. Know of no reason why the receipts should vary, but know that they do vary. The fact that the conductors on the C and B line run round would tend to cause the average receipts of each conductor to be materially the same. Mr. Arnold, is this paper, handing it, your statement of the average fares reported by the conductors on the C&B line? It is. The question objected to by counsel for defense. Mr. Arnold contended for the right to show the quo animal with which the accused withheld a part of the monies received by him for fares. A large deficiency in his accounts would be proven, and the prosecution desired to show that this deficiency was not accidental, but designed and criminal, that it was not a deficiency for a single trip, but a continually occurring deficiency for every trip for several months. Guilty intent would be proved if the prosecution were allowed to give the evidence. Is Wharton in court? Mr. Blacklaw, we don't use it. Wharton is a good prosecuting book only. Laughter. Roscoe is a good book for all sides. The court. Mr. Sheriff, when the noise and confusion in this court is so great that you are to presume, we can't hear anything forthwith and force silence. Mr. Arnold quoted other authorities in support of his position, that the defense in this case had a right to prove other pecuniary delinquencies of the defendant as conductor on the same line just previous to the crime charged in the indictment, for the purpose of showing the quo animal. 21st of Pickering, page 515, 
Wharton A. Criminal Law, page 238. Second, Russell, page 777. The point in controversy is the mind with which this crime was, as we shall show, committed. We shall prove that the defendant made a series of frauds and peculations from the funds of his employers, besides the particular ones charged in the third indictment. Suppose we could show that Caldwell, in the month of May or June last, went to his confreres, to his brother conductors, and said, This company don't pay us wages enough. I'm going to keep back a part of the fares I receive. Would not this be competent testimony? If so, then certainly it must be competent to show that the accused did keep back and steal a portion of the fares taken by him. Archibald, page 549. The peculations of Caldwell, if proved, are to be regarded as parts of one continuous transaction. The Court Suppose the law is, as you say, Mr. Arnold, would it apply to this case? Would you be allowed to show, by circumstantial evidence, that the receipts of Caldwell fell below the receipts of other conductors on the same line, and infer from that that he stole the amount of the deficiency, as charged in the indictment? Mr. Arnold replied to the court, and briefly repeated his position. Mr. Blackwell, in an argument of some length and great force, opposed the omission of the testimony offered. The court said that the decision of the points made by counsel would be reserved for the further examination and citation of authorities. The case might proceed on other points. Charles E. Vallette. Every trip in the month is numbered. Unless something extraordinary occurs, the conductor always makes his report and pays over the monies received immediately on his arrival in this city. Two separate reports are made, one for the westward and one for the eastward trip. The report now shown me is that made by O.T. Caldwell, for the train run out of Chicago on the evening of the 9th of September last. The handwriting in the filling up is that of O.T. Caldwell. This other report is that of O.T. Caldwell, the train run out of Burlington on the morning of the 11th of September. The writing and ink in the endorsement is by Mr. Caldwell. Cross-examined. Have been in connection with railroads since 1845. Have occasionally conducted trains of railroad cars. Never regularly. Conductors frequently have a surplus of monies on hand that they cannot account for. This is the case oftener with young than with older conductors who know how to apply surplus money, according to instructions. I have known conductors to be short of the amount called for by their accounts, but they are not so often short as they have a surplus. Conductors often make mistakes in adding up their columns, and also in the extension of fares, where conductors have a surplus of money amounting to a through fare. Six dollars. I have directed them to enter it in their reports for a full fare. Where it is less than six dollars, the conductor is directed to enter it as received between such stations as will protect the interests of each corporation forming the line. The words express divisible as follows on the back of the blank. The conductor's report was for the convenience of conductors at the time these blanks were issued. It was then the custom for conductors to collect the charges for express goods, and this part of the blank was to show what proportion of the express money belonged to the several companies of the line. I keep separate accounts with the three companies forming the line, because I was so directed by my superior officers. The three corporations are the B&Q, the CMT, and the CB&Q railroads. It was the spirit of my instructions that the money earned on each rail should be carried to the credit of the company owning that rail. When conductors are first employed, they are entrusted by the railroad company with what is called a bank, some 30 or $40 for the purpose of making change. When the conductor leaves the employee of the company or the companies, he refunds this bank. I should think there might be some difficulty in keeping the incidental money Receive affairs 
from the bank. Mr. Caldwell's bank was some thirty, perhaps thirty-five dollars. The object of the bank is for the convenience of conductors in making change, and usually in small coin. The latter part of the answer in question that drew it out was objected to by the defense. I had given Mr. Caldwell the same instructions with regard to surplus, etc., as to other conductors. Samuel Powell. I am employed in the general ticket office of the C.B. and Q. Railroad. No, Mr. Caldwell, was in the office during the last of September. The handwriting in the conductor's reports now handed me is that of Mr. Caldwell. The pencil marks are in Caldwell's handwriting, except where I have corrected them. The footings were erroneous and corrected them. The scaled brown paper package now handed me by Mr. Rucker and I found, as I was informed, on the person of Mr. Caldwell at the time of his arrest. They were handed me. Contains the tickets, kept them under lock and key, until I sealed them up and stamped them with my seal, as they now appear. Carl F. W. Jergy had been in the office of the C&B-Q Railroad since June last. Since August, I have been receiver. My duty is to receive all monies from the stations and from the conductors. I have here the sum of $203, which I received from Conductor Caldwell on the 12th of September. There was no other receiver for the company but myself. Mr. Caldwell has never paid any money to me since this of the 12th of September. Mr. Arnold offered in evidence the conductor's reports for trips of run Number 49 West on the 9th September, and number 50 Run East on the 11th of September, and the cash statement accompanied the payment of the money to the receiver on the 12th September. End of section 58. Section 59 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trial of Oscar T. Caldwell for Embezzlement. Chicago, Illinois, 1855. Part 2. November 21st. James E. Yost. I am clerk for Mr. E. A. Rucker of this city. In the month of September last, I was employed to go to Burlington. It was on Sunday. I went to watch the conductor on that train to see the color of the tickets or checks and the number of passengers that paid. I went on board the cars on the evening of the 9th of September and took my seat in the second passenger car of the C.B. and Q. Railroad. I paid my fare to Burlington after we got out from Chicago a few miles, paid it to Mr. Caldwell, the conductor of the train. He sits there by Mr. Blackwell. I paid him six dollars. I gave him a twenty-dollar gold piece. I kept account between Chicago and Burlington of the number of passengers I saw pay the conductor. I kept the account on a memorandum which I have here. I paid him my fare between Chicago and the first station going west. First saw Caldwell, collecting fares soon after leaving Chicago. Next saw him. Witness here examined a memorandum book. Mr. Blackwell, have you any recollection of color of the tickets, number of passengers, kind of money, number of fares, etc., independent of reference to that memoranda? I have recollection that colored tickets or checks were issued, and remember the color that passengers had that had paid their fares, but I can't state the number of either without reference to this memoranda. Mr. Blackwell, then we object to the testimony. The court, did you make this memoranda at the time the number of passengers that paid their fares received their checks? I did. I put it down. Not at the moment, but as soon as the conductor went into the next car, which was in a very few minutes. Mr. Blackwell, is there in the memoranda a statement of all the colors and all the species of monies paid by the passengers and the amounts? 
I did not get a perfectly full list. Mr. Blackwell, your honor now sees what we are driving at. The court, yes, but whether you have any right to drive at it. Mr. Arnold, have you any means of ascertaining the number of passengers on the trains at the junction? Yes, the memoranda show. I have no other means of stating accurately. Mr. Arnold, how many? Mr. Dickey, witnesses asked to refer to his memoranda. Now has witness a right thus to refer merely to refresh his memory? If a witness is called to prove an alleged fact, he must do so from his memory of the facts, as they transpired at the time. He may only look at memoranda to refresh his recollection. I may make a simple X on a piece of paper at a moment of meeting a friend. Ten years afterward, I meet that friend, but am only assured of his identity by reference to that X accidentally made at the moment of meeting. I would not be allowed to swear exclusively by the memoranda, but only allowed to refer to it. Mr. Arnold rose to read an authority. The court. We do not wish to hear anything from the prosecution, but as we are always willing to hear from the side to which we are opposed, we will listen to the defense. Mr. Blackwell argued his objections. The court. Upon this question, the court has no doubts. The evidence is admissible. Mr. Arnold. How many passengers were there when the cars arrived at the junction? Forty-two after leaving the junction. Forty from Chicago to the junction. At Aurora, forty-three. At Mendota, twenty-nine. Galesburg, twenty-nine. Monmouth, twenty-five. At Aquacock Junction, I have no count. Going out from Chicago, I saw passengers pay their fares. First, a few minutes after leaving Chicago, five paid. At Mendota, one paid. At Watauga, four paid. At Galesburg, seven. At Aquaca Junction, three. I paid six dollars through fare from Chicago to Burlington. Received a green through check. Paid a twenty dollar gold piece. I arrived at Burlington Monday, September 10th, about 7 a.m. I left Burlington on Tuesday a.m. Coming back, I made a memorandum of passengers, fares, etc. Leaving East Burlington, there were 18 passengers. Caldwell's train, second passenger car. At Galesburg, 30. At Mendota, 36. Plano, 54. Aurora, 54. Junction, 40. Cottage Hill, 42. After leaving Burlington, 11 passengers paid between that and the first station. Aquaqua, 12. Monmouth, 1. Galesburg, 5. Watauga, 6. Galf, 1. Kiwana, 5. Dover, 1. Mendota, 4. Waverly, 4. I paid my fare through Burlington to Chicago, coming back. Gave him a $10 bill marked. The bill now handed me is the identical bill I paid to Caldwell. I marked it by putting two black dots inside the cipher in the ten. Received the bill from Mr. Ed A. Rucker. Received it on September 9th for the purpose of paying to Mr. Caldwell. The marking was pointed out to me. Saw a memoranda in Mr. Rucker's possession of the date, number, and description of the bill. It was in a blank book. Cross-examined. Don't know where Mr. Rucker got the money he gave me. He took it from a drawer in his office. Corner Washington and Dearborn. Don't know Colonel Hammond. Never was connected with the railroad. Had traveled on a railroad three or four times before, more or less. Never watched the operations of a railroad conductor particularly before. Might have left the car several times in the trip. Didn't go into an eating house. Ate an apple or two. Don't know how many passengers were going through to Burlington. Passengers change their seats sometimes. I changed mine. Sat a little forward in the middle of the car, six or eight feet from the door. Had no memorandum in my hand when looking at the conductor. Made my memorandum in pencil mark. The one I produced here has some pencil. The writing in red ink don't look like Rucker's. It is not mine. 
don't know whose figures there are in margin. I made the figures in pencil mark, made those in ink now referred to. After my return to Chicago, I made both the memorandums from each other. The memorandum now shown me is the one I made after arriving at Burlington. The cars were in motion while I made some of the memorandums. On my return, I asked Caldwell what time we arrived at Mendota, and if we dined there. The only other conversation I had with Caldwell was when I paid my fare. He asked me where I was going and how many I paid for. There were three other men on the same train, and on the same business. Didn't know them. Found out they were on the same business as we crossed the ferry. They knew my business. Didn't compare notes. Slept a part of the time when on the way to Burlington. Can't see when asleep. Don't know the exact time I went to sleep or waked. Waked before daylight. At stations, people came in and went out. Had never seen any of the passengers before. Couldn't distinguish any of them now. At stations, some persons may have come on board and gone off before the train started. Going west. Didn't know the destination of any passengers after leaving Chicago. I walked about the car and counted the passengers several times. There was a dim light in the cars. Some of the passengers were lying down. Some occupied a whole seat. Didn't count the seats. The lights were near the end of the car. At no time was it so dark that I couldn't count the passengers. Sat in my seat most of the time while making my memoranda. Was near a light. Didn't show to anybody by my actions what my business was. Passengers paid Caldwell, mostly in bills. Don't know what kind. Caldwell had his book in his hand as he went through the cars. Saw him make motions, as if figuring while receiving fares. Think he received some fares without making the motions, indicating the recording of fares. Can't tell how much money was paid between O'Quaka and Burlington independent of my memoranda. Coming east, there were ladies in the cars. Don't remember any children. In one of the cars, there was a saloon. Was in the second passenger car both ways. It was not the same car, I think. Took my seat in the second car by directions from Mr. Rucker. Made my memoranda. Immediately after Carla left the cars. A minute or so after he had collected tickets and fares. The money given me by Mr. Rucker did not belong to me, nor any part of it. Don't know whose it was. Gave the change back to Rucker. Can't tell how many persons paid fares to Caldwell after leaving Chicago, except for my memory of the memoranda. Had never been over the road before. Only no names of stations by the check I had. In making out my memoranda, I went by the check, and by those names in red ink. Didn't compare names of stations as printed on the check with the writing in red ink. Slept in the latter part of the night. Only know I wasn't asleep as at Quaqua by the evidence of the memoranda. Samuel Bridgman Went on Mr. Caldwell's train to Burlington on Sunday night, the 9th of September last. Arrived at Burlington the next morning. Sat in the second car. First saw Caldwell as he entered my car after leaving Chicago, at the hind seat on right-hand side as you entered, paid $6 fare to Caldwell, paid him a $10 gold piece, an eagle. I could identify the coin I paid him. The coin now handed me is the one I paid him. There is a small hole in the star over the head of the crossbar cut out of the letter A. It was dated 1849. The marks were shown me by E.A. Rucker before I started. No James Yost. He was in the same car with me at the time I paid my fare. I saw him in Burlington after reaching there. He went through with me. I saw the same $10 gold piece after I arrived at Burlington, in the hands of Mr. Benedict. He pulled out some gold, among which was the identical piece I had paid Caldwell for fare. I came back on the Tuesday's train rode in the third car, paid my fare through to Chicago with two five-dollar bills, paid it to Caldwell just after leaving Burlington. They were marked bills. The ones now handed me are those I paid Caldwell. They were handed to me by Mr. Rucker. Cross-examined. Was not previously acquainted with Caldwell. 
had never before been over the C&B Road, was employed by Mr. Rucker, had been a policeman until last spring. Mr. Rucker employs a detective police, was policeman in New York, made Rucker's acquaintance in New York, been policeman three years, was master at arms in the U.S. Frigate Congress, was a detective at the Crystal Palace, was aware that other emissaries went down to Burlington with me on the track of Caldwell, saw West on Saturday evening before going to Burlington. I was aware each of these men, Yost and Benedict, were going out to watch the conductor. No Yost by description and Benedict also. West was described to me. Saw Benedict at the depot here before we started. Saw him going into the first car or out of the forward end of the second car. I rode in the fourth car. Stayed in the second car twenty or twenty-five minutes before I left. Saw Yost there. Stayed in the fourth car all the way down. Saw none of the emissaries in the third or fourth car. Arrived at Burlington early in the morning. Benedict and I both stopped at the same hotel. B. F. Benedict went out and called to his train to Burlington on the ninth of September last. Went out between eight and ten o'clock Sunday evening. Sat in first passenger car. Paid fares shortly after leaving Chicago to Caldwell, who sits over there. Paid six dollar fare in a twenty dollar gold piece. He subsequently gave me change in gold. He gave me a ten dollar and a five dollar in gold, and I gave him a one dollar bill back. Mr. Rucker gave me the twenty dollars in gold. I brought back the ten dollars given me by Caldwell. Think I could identify it. The one now handed me is the one. It has a whole board in the star over the head. So another person paid fair going west. He sat in the seat forward of me and paid a ten dollar bill, I think. Saw that person go through to Burlington. He was a pock marked man with a dirty white wool hat, painted or whitewashed. His name was West. Reached Burlington between 7 and 8 Monday morning. On Tuesday a.m., I returned on Caldwell's train. Paid $6 fare to Chicago. Paid him a $20 gold piece. He gave me back a $10 gold piece and a $5 gold piece. I gave him back $1 in gold. Am not sure I could identify the $10 in gold. Think I should. Saw West on the trip coming east. Came in third car. Know what Mr. West came through on that train to Chicago. I saw two ladies who sat in front of me, pay fare, soon after leaving Burlington. They came through Chicago. One of them gave Coldwell two five-dollar bills. Think the other gave him a five-dollar and a three-dollar bill. Saw Mr. Bridgman pay a through fare. He sat behind me. Bridgman gave Caldwell two bills. Saw a man sitting by the side of Bridgman Pay. That man came through to Chicago. Saw him here. I returned to Mr. Rugger the identical gold received from Caldwell within two hours after arrival here. Cross-examined. Came here some two or three months since from Buffalo. Lived near there eight years. My father lived near Buffalo. Had been engaged as a detective in Buffalo and for Pinkerton and Company here. Had a conference with Rucker on the 9th of September. Received from him instructions and three $20 gold pieces. Kept no portion of it myself. I was instructed to take the first car going out west and the third coming east. Knew Yost was going. Knew that other persons were going. Mr. Bridgman and West. Saw West in Chicago Depot. Yost on the cars and also Bridgman. Three cars were occupied. I am paid by the month. Received no extra pay. I used my own money to pay my expenses while gone. Don't know who the gold belonged to. Edward A. Rucker. Caldwell came to our office between 6 and 7 o'clock on the evening of September 15th. I was in. Mr. Pinkerton came in with Caldwell at the usual front entrance. Had seen Pinkerton in the afternoon. He had not gone away with the avowed purpose of arresting Caldwell. I did not give Caldwell the idea that if he would refund the money, he should not be prosecuted before Colonel Hammond was sent for. 
Caldwell may have been under some durance or restraint with regard to his locomotion. I can't say that Caldwell knew that he was at liberty to leave that office, that he knew there was any restraint. I think just before Hammond was sent for, I suggested to Caldwell whether he wouldn't like to see Colonel Hammond. My object was entirely for Caldwell's benefit, that he might have an opportunity to make an arrangement with Colonel H., that he seemed unwilling to make with us. Something was said to Caldwell to the effect that he had now had an opportunity to settle his deficiencies in account with the company, and of retiring from this service without the question of the real circumstances being raised, or the fact of his having been at our office at all known. No one might know of the investigation except Mr. Pinkerton, Colonel Hammond, myself, and one or two others. Perhaps I mentioned Mr. Joy. I did not hold out any inducements to him, none whatever. I did not speak of any criminal prosecution. Caldwell's impression seemed to be that there would be no criminal prosecution. The specific sum was named. Something was said about the mode of arriving at the amount that had been taken, or an approximate sum. It was remarked that owing to the way it had been taken, the exact sum could not be ascertained. November 22nd. The court ruled with regard to the admissibility of the evidence of Colonel Hammond and others as to the conversation had with the accused at Pinkerton and Company's office at the time of his arrest, that it was admissible. It would still remain a question for the jury whether the circumstances in which the accused then stood would affect the ambitions or conversation. Charles G. Hammond I went to Pinkerton's office at the request of Mr. Caldwell. When I went in, I said, Caldwell, I came here at your request and am ready to hear anything you may have to say. The first part of the conversation was in the presence of Mr. Pinkerton, or Mr. Rucker, or both. My impression is that Mr. Rucker commenced by recapitulating the conversation, or the substance of it, that he had had with Caldwell. After a while, Pinkerton or Rucker, or both, withdrew and left Caldwell and myself together. Our conversation then referred to three or four points. I stated to him my regret at the position he was in. I told him I had always treated him with great kindness. To this he replied, You have always treated me as a father. I stated to him that I had decided to find a different state of facts, and explained fully the reasons that induced me to test his runs that is, being so uniformly behind and deficient for so long a period of time, as compared with the average of the other conductors, had forced upon me the conviction that he was dishonest, that I was particularly unwilling to discharge him from the time he had been with us. I stated to him that I was unwilling to discharge him unless I had some reasons that I could explain to his friends, as well as satisfactorily to himself and that I had employed or called in the aid of Pinkerton and Company for the purpose of ascertaining how this might be, and that the result was overwhelming, so much so that I did not feel at liberty to let her pass. I stated to him that I would have been glad to have received his resignation and let him pass out or off into other business, making his own excuses for leaving our business, such excuses to his friend for his resignation, as he saw fit. Among the first remarks I made to him was that I did not wish him to say anything to me, by conversation or otherwise, by way of confession or admission, or otherwise, which he did not wish to say or make. I told him that I, in my conversation with him, should treat him as guilty, for so I believed him. I did believe him guilty told him that in my conversation with him, I should assume that he was guilty. I then went on to give him all my reasons. The first reason was because of the deficits continued through a period of some four months, as compared with the general average of all the other conductors. I stated my subsequent reasons, stated the facts as they appeared to my mind, by or from the running of the two runs prior to that time. Don't think I stated specifically the number of trains watched. 
I stated to him, Caldwell, that the reasons why I would or must treat him as guilty were from the facts discovered on his train, the trains he had run the last two times, twice run before. I did not go into the details. I told him, Caldwell, that I would have been glad to have received his resignation, that I would be glad to receive it now, provided such restitution should be made to the company as would not distress his family, provided that making a restitution comported with his feelings. I said it would be better for his reputation and his feelings. In this, I had particular reference to giving him an opportunity to redeem himself, to making a good man. Mr. Caldwell occasionally asked me how much his deficiencies were, or his deficit, or how much is the difference. I told him the difference between him and one conductor was large. Between him and the average of the other conductors was not so large. I told him that the amount he was behind one conductor was $2,500. He replied, I have no such amount of property, or I cannot secure such an amount as that, or I have no such amount as that. One of the three phrases. I next remarked to him, You have a mortgage on property in Buffalo, which you told me amounted to $1,000. He had told me this previously when I was looking into his resources with reference to a restitution. He replied that the mortgage was only worth $800. It was a chattel mortgage on a livery stable in possession of an adopted brother at Buffalo. I asked him for his, Caldwell's, other property, mentioned information that his furniture was very valuable. He mentioned his house, which was built on a leased lot on Clark Street. I asked him for his other property. Some small matters were spoken of. I think the house amounted to $700. He did not admit that the furniture was very valuable. I thought it was, and pressed the matter a little. I said to him, It is not in your power to make very full or large restitution to the company. But what you can, I wish you would. I would be glad to receive your resignation, and allow, or have you, to make such excuses to your friends as you see fit. Go into some business and redeem yourself. I especially allowed him to retain his household furniture. Think the value arrived at in our conversation was $700 for the house. Caldwell stated at different times during this interview that he wanted time to figure up his affairs. He could not tell how he stood, said he felt confused somewhat and needed time to look over his matters or to estimate his affairs, to see how he stood, what he had got, and how he had got it. I explained to Mr. Caldwell the reason why I had offered him the ticket office at Burlington within a short period. It might be a mystery to him, after what I had now said, of what I had known. Told him the offer was to enable him to remove from his associations here, that in Burlington, though the salary was $1,000, he would soon find he could not live upon that amount. Such had been his habits of living and spending money that he would naturally seek other business, and would thus go away and perhaps redeem himself. I told Caldwell that his refusal to take that office, it being worth $1,000 and his present office, but $720 per annum, had strengthened my suspicions. He admitted the fact. Mr. Blackwell, Mr. Hammond, I observed they call you Colonel. As a preliminary question, let me ask you how you got that title. John Wentworth gave it to me, sir. Cross-examined. Had been engaged exclusively in the business of railroads since 1852. Superintendent of the Chicago and Burlington Road since the early part of March last. Previous to that, I was general agent of the Michigan Central Road. Have never been a conductor, but have sometimes had charge of trains. Once had a Sabbath school excursion to Batavia when I stated to the conductor that I would take charge of it myself. I did so, and afterwards sent the money to the proper officer in a note. Did not state in that note that I did not know how I came by it, had made it a duty to frequently pass over the road, and anything which did not appear to be right, I spoke to the conductor in regard to. 
I have frequently detected errors at the end of a route which conductors have made. The conductor who arrives in the morning generally makes his report in the afternoon. Don't know of any particular instance of delay in making their reports of so long a time as a day or two. If the conductor arrived on Sunday evening, he would wait till Monday before reporting. Don't know of any rule of the company on this subject. It rests with the officers. I am not superintendent over the treasurer. The ticket agent generally consults with me. The receiver is under the control of the treasurer. Conductors generally make their tally immediately on taking fare from a person on the cars. But there is no general order on that subject. Mr. Caldwell gave as a reason for not wishing to accept our offer of the post of ticket agent at Burlington, that he did not want to go there, that his wife being a stranger there would not like to go. Mr. Caldwell was formerly in the employ of the Michigan Central Company as ticket agent at LaSalle. He left that post and went as conductor on the Aurora Road. From that he was transferred to our ticket office on Lake Street, and from there he went back to the road as conductor. Mr. Rennick was taken from the ticket office at Burlington and placed on the train as conductor. Recommended the transfer of Mr. Caldwell from the ticket office at LaSalle to the Aurora Road. It was his own desire, and full confidence in him. The first suspicion I had of his dishonesty was when he left the ticket office in Lake Street, where he had a salary of $1,000, and went back to the train at a salary of $750. The services required of the ticket agent occupy more time, but are perhaps not more laborious than those of a conductor. There were seven men to run four trains on our road. They laid over at one end 24 hours, and at the other end 36 hours. I suppose as the roads are now managed, a ticket agent, by conspiring with the conductor, might be enabled to steal from the company. During the conversation between myself and Caldwell at the office of Pinkerton, my impression was that he was under arrest, was told so when I went upstairs. He appeared confused, but my judgment was then, and still is, that it was a confusion put on and not real. I believed he was guilty, was aware that Caldwell and the circuit agent by combination might steal when I offered him the ticket agency at Burlington. I set spies upon the heels of Caldwell, in order that I might prove or disprove my suspicions, to be sure whether he was guilty or not, at the same time having no doubt of his guilt. The receipts on trains on public occasion such as Fourth of July are, of course, expected to be greater than on ordinary occasions. Can't say whether Caldwell happened to run any such train or not. There was no direct confession or denial by Caldwell at the time. I talked to him at Rucker's office. I did not intend to prosecute him if he made such restitution as was in his power. I held out that idea to him all the time. First employed Pinkerton and Rucker to follow Caldwell sometime in August. have never known two conductors to average precisely alike in their returns. It depends upon whether they have more or less passages, and upon their faithfulness in making their reports. I told P&R to say to Caldwell that if he would put his property into the hands of someone to secure the company, he could have such time as he desired to figure up his affairs. Was advised that Caldwell was to be arrested that day before the arrest was made. Think I was told in his presence that he had been searched. After the run of the 13th, I gave Pinkerton and Rucker positive orders to arrest Mr. Caldwell. No understanding was had between Pinkerton and Rucker and myself in regard to the manner in which the arrest was to be made. Gave no particular directions to them to try to induce Caldwell to make restitution. I did not tell them to send for me, but Rucker said he might want to see me. I told them I should be at my office. I have no bargain about the subject with Rucker and Pinkerton. They were employed by me for this particular case. Mr. Arnold, what were the averages of the conductors? The defense objected on the ground that involved the question in regard to the introduction of the transcript of the several conductors' reports and averages, 
which had been before offered in evidence and objected to, and which question was still undecided by the court. The court said that it might decide the whole question at once, in regard to the proposition to introduce the statement of averages. The opinion of court was then, and is now, that the paper in itself does not contain evidence which would be admissible even in a civil case. The paper purports to contain a statement of what was, or what should have been, reported by seven different conductors. Now, to make it competent, its testimony. It would have been necessary to call these conductors and first prove the statement to be correct. A mere transcript, without proof of its accuracy, was not sufficient. In reference to the argument that it was competent to introduce it for the purpose of showing intent, it was sufficient to say that proving the fact of one crime does not show any intent to commit another. The O'Connell case had been referred to. That case did not present a parallel, as O'Connell, though not present at the meeting, was cognizant of what was to take place, and attended afterwards similar meetings which had the same object in view. For instance, a man had five horses stolen, one each night, for four consecutive nights, all by the same person. But the fact that the thief stole the first horse would not be competent testimony as showing that he intended to steal the second, nor the first and second that he intended to steal the third, and so on. The circumstances surrounding and connected with the transaction in question were all that could be adduced to show intent. As to the defense opening the door for the admission of this statement, the prosecution might go on and examine the witness in reference to any new question which the defense had put to him. They could resort to the same sources of information which the defense did, but the testimony in question would not be permitted to come in. Mr. Hammond, the averages of which I spoke, so far as they were made up by me, extend from May to September. There were seven conductors running with six of them we compared Caldwell's averages. Mr. Arnold, with how many of the other conductors were Caldwell's averages compared? Objected to by counsel for defense. The court decided that the conductors themselves and others who made these tables or furnished the data should be called instead of putting the tables of averages themselves in evidence. It was charged that the reports of one of these conductors was false. Might not the reports of the others be incorrect? Mr. Stewart, I call your Honor's particular attention to that important point. If the reports of the other conductors are incorrect, so much the more direct and all-important in this testimony for the people. For, of course, they would not return more money than they had collected, and if they returned less... It would only prove the peculations of the prisoner to have been so much the greater. The court sustained the objection and decided that the tables of averages could not be put in evidence because it was not the best and because there was no proof that the reports of one or more of the six conductors who run trains with the prisoner were correct. E. A. Rucker recalled, On the 9th of September last, I employed four persons, Benedict, one of our men, Mr. Bridgman, another of our men, Mr. Yost and Peter West, sent them out to take account of fares paid to Caldwell on the route from Chicago on the 9th, supposing he would return here Tuesday evening, gave them instructions, gave them marked money, called their attention to the marks as recorded in a book, assigned to each their respective positions in the cars, I can partly or wholly state from memory the marks on the money and the different kinds of money and to whom paid respectively. From recollection, I state as follows. I gave to James E. Yost a $20 gold piece. Forget the date. A hole was bored in one star by taking the point of my knife for a drill. On the reverse, the crossbar in the letter A was scratched. Gave him a $10 bill on Citizens Bank, Fulton, Oswego County, New York, number 1422, letter A. I marked their bill by marking ink dots inside the rolls on the zero in the ten. This is the same bill testified to by Yost yesterday. 
after giving the bill to Yost, I found it afterwards, in the possession of Mr. Caldwell, on September 15th. I gave Bridgman a gold eagle of 1849. One of the stars was bored, crossbar and A in states, was scratched. Gave him two fives on the Merchants Bank, New Bedford, Massachusetts. I marked them, one with letter B, number 200, the other letter B, number 87, in the roll of the figure five. I made an ink dot. The bills are here, producing them. I found these identical bills on the person of Mr. Caldwell, September 15th. The star of the head in the eagle given Bridgman was the one bored. I received this from B.F. Benedict on his return. It is the coin identified by Benedict yesterday. I gave Benedict three $20 gold pieces, each dated 1852. One of these Mr. B. returned to me. Yost returned to me some bank bills, one or two two-dollar bills. Can't state definitely. He returned me all after deducting his expenses. Bridgman returned to me the amount handed him after deducting expenses. Benedict returned to me two ten-dollar gold pieces and a one-dollar gold piece. One of the tens was the one I had given to Bridgman. Another thus returned had been given to West. Date, 1847. Crossbar of A scratched. I gave to West a ten-dollar gold piece and a ten-dollar bill. The gold piece now handed me is the one. I identify by the date of 1847 as the crossbar of A in states scratched and a star in front of the face board. The two five-dollar gold pieces were marked by a bore in the star over the top of the head, the other by a board star behind the head. I had delivered those five-dollar gold pieces to be paid to Caldwell on a previous trip on the 5th of September. I received these four pieces and a gold dollar from Benedict, the two ten dollars and two five dollar gold pieces and the one dollar. The ten dollar bill I gave West was on the United Company Bank, number 746, letter A dots in the roll of the zero. I saw the prisoner on the 15th of September, Saturday. I had been looking for him during the day. Saw him at 7 p.m. at our office. Had a conversation with him. Pinkerton was present and no one else that I recollect. Caldwell came to our office with Pinkerton, who introduced him to me. I pointed to a seat in front room. Caldwell took a seat and said, What about that woman? Pinkerton replied, That's not what we want to see you about. It is about the C and B Railroad. I told him he was invited there to talk of his connection with the C and B line. The Colonel Hammond's suspicions were excited that he, Caldwell, was not returning the monies received on their account, that the matter was in our hands for investigation, that we had become satisfied Hammond's suspicions were correct, and consequently had invited him in there to talk the matter over with a view to some arrangement. About that time, he asked, What matter? I then told him I would go over it again. He seemed taken aback a little and seemed confused. I told him that the superintendent of the C&B Railroad had had his suspicions excited that he, Caldwell, was not returning all the monies received from the railroad, that we had investigated it and become satisfied that he was not in the practice of returning all monies received on account of the company, that we had reported to Colonel Hammond on the subject, and he, Colonel H., had referred the matter to us that we had caused a more thorough, or at any rate a thorough investigation, that we had become convinced beyond question that he, Caldwell, was not in the habit of returning the monies received for fares, that we had proof to that effect, and had called him in there to see if some arrangement could not be effected, or something to that effect. I said to him that we did not ask him to make any admission, that our proof was sufficient, that all we wanted was that he should make such settlement as would be satisfactory between him and the officers of the road. Caldwell again asked as before, What matters? What settlements? And appeared much confused. Pinkerton was the only other person in the room. I told Caldwell 
All we wanted him for was to make an arrangement. Didn't care to have it made with us. Told him the company believed he had kept their monies. I told him Colonel H. had compared the amounts paid by him, Caldwell, with what others paid in, and found his to be less than that of the others. Caldwell asked if I thought that was a fair way. I replied it was. That Colonel H. had taken the amounts returned by the conductors for the last four months, made an average, and then made a particular average of Caldwell's payments, and found him largely behind. Very largely behind the highest average. Caldwell replied that you couldn't tell anything by that, that some days were good and some bad. I told him he ought to return as much as the average, that they run round, and all had the same chance on the same days, and that he was one of the most popular conductors on the road. He said you could tell nothing by that. A man's popularity was nothing. I said he would be offended if I said anything against his popularity. He said he guessed that would make no difference then. Caldwell finally concluded that he would make no investigation nor arrangement for restitution. I told him I thought he didn't seem to apprehend his position, or he would be glad to investigate the matter. That he had been on the road some two years, had the confidence of his employers until recently that they had now detected his operations and had the evidence to prove it, that within the last month we had watched him closely, that within the last month he had received larger sums for fares per trip than he had returned to the company, that this was so for several trips, that if the matter were prosecuted criminally, the result, in my estimation, would be that he would go to the penitentiary, that we had proved to substantiate a criminal charge and if one should be preferred, the result would be as I stated. I think I took down the statutes and read a section to him. I explained that I did not do this to make any threats, or to frighten him into a settlement or arrangement, that his employers, though they had lost confidence in him and were aware that by making a settlement with him, should it become generally known, might become the subject of unjust imputations but notwithstanding all that they were willing, he should make reparation, tender his resignation, and quietly withdraw from the service of the company, that I thought he ought to be glad of the chance to do that, that the matter was not generally known, only myself, Pinkerton and Hammond, and a few connected with our business, possibly Mr. Joy also. Caldwell replied, that that wasn't so, that he had heard of it yesterday or last night 160 miles from here, that it was all over the road, that it was all out. Mr. Pinkerton, who had occasionally said a word, now addressed Caldwell, assuming that the latter was guilty. He placed the matter similar to my own statements, but in his own way, told him that now we had the proof. It was the proper time for him to make an arrangement. I told him the next step would be to take him into custody, that as it was late, there could be no preliminary examination, and he would have to go to jail. He said he didn't want to go to jail. He had friends who could give bail. I told him it would be much better to take a different course. I offered myself to go out and find, or try to find a magistrate, suggested he could sit in the sheriff's office while I did so. Mr. Pinkerton told Caldwell to stand up while he searched him. He did so, and I received the articles as Pinkerton handed them over. We reminded Mr. C. that it was late, and that we had better go over to the jail. He might stay in the sheriff's room while I looked for a magistrate. He seemed fixed and irresolute, indisposed to move. He finally said he would like to see Colonel Hammond. I said to Caldwell, You don't pretend you are not deficient in your accounts. Oh, no, nothing of the kind, was the reply. He said his wife kept his accounts of family expenses, and he wanted time to see how things stood. He said he hadn't had anything like the amount Colonel Hammond said he had, as inferred from the averages. Caldwell repeated that what he wanted was time to see how much he was behind. That seemed the question with him. I found on the person of Caldwell this, exhibiting it, memorandum book and papers. They have been in my possession ever since and are unchanged. 
Before Colonel Hammond came, I asked Caldwell if he had not received a notice of some kind about paying over the identical money he collected for payers. He said he had not. The bill marked E-A-R was found in Caldwell's vest pocket with a package of $20. The $10 and $5 bills were found, I think, in his pantaloons pocket in a roll amounting to $185. They are also marked E-A-R. I had an interview with the prisoner on Monday, September 17th, at the jail. I told him the matter seemed in the course of adjustment and hoped he would soon be out. I told him that we had agreed, or nearly agreed, on a plan of adjustment. I tried to cheer him up. He said he was ruined. He wished he had never come here. He said he had lived too fast. Conversation lasted 15 or 20 minutes. Finally, he said he was very sorry about it that he ought not to have used the company's money or their money, was sorry he had lost Colonel Hammond's confidence. He said he was glad the matter had been arranged or settled or something of that kind. I told him I thought the matter would be arranged in an hour or two. I suggested he should come to our office and make out the report for his last two runs. He said he felt bad, wanted to wash and shave first. I suggested our office as convenient and private, as some assignments were to be made, etc. Caldwell expressed himself satisfied with the assignments or with the settlement proposed to be made. I told him that certain articles, his house, his lease, his watch, and $100 of his money had been turned out, but I was not satisfied that he had turned out everything he had. I asked him about some gold that I thought he had a short time previous, some $200. This was my only object in going to the jail. Calvo said he couldn't produce the gold. End of section 59section 60 of american state trials volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org american state trials volume 1 by john d lawson trial of oscar t caldwell for embezzlement chicago illinois 1855 part 3 November 23rd, E. A. Rucker, cross-examined. I found on the person of Caldwell, when we searched him, some of the identical bank bills I had furnished to the man sent out to watch Caldwell. Bridgman did not return me any money that I had furnished to either of the other men sent out. It was not my intention to draw confessions from Caldwell by threats of the penitentiary or criminal prosecution. I stated to Caldwell, that his averages were largely behind. When I first came in, I said, I'm sorry you can't arrange with Colonel Hammond. Prisoner replied in effect that he was sorry too. I asked the matter and said, You don't assume or pretend or something like that. You are not behind. He answered, Oh no, nothing of the kind. Had no conversation then about Caldwell's property. I didn't know Caldwell had been told about his averages. It was on my mind. After Hammond's first conversation with him, Caldwell remarked in substance that he wasn't behind so much or didn't owe the company so much as Colonel Hammond said. Colonel Hammond told me that he didn't know why Caldwell would not settle unless because he, Caldwell, was holding back something. I had purposely avoided speaking to prisoner in the first instance about the exact amount of his deficits an exact form of settlement. After first interview with Colonel Hammond, I told prisoner I was sorry that there was no settlement. He was sorry too. I said, you don't assume you are not deficient in your returns. He replied, no, nothing of the kind. Caldwell wanted time. I told him if he admitted his deficiency to the company, I could see no reason why he couldn't arrange the basis of a settlement. Then, as well as on Monday. Prisoner said his deficiency wasn't as great as charged. I visited Prisoner in jail because I believed he had a hoard or had some gold somewhere, 
and thought he should restore to the company. Prisoner looked bad, tried to cheer him. I said he would soon be about. He said he was sorry he came to this city, that he had been too extravagant or living too fast, that he had used theirs, the company's money, that he had got behind hand with them, that this detection or affair would ruin him. It had got out, everybody knew it, and that he was ruined. I thought he was soon to come out on the settlement that I felt sure had been consummated or would be by his counsel, and I tried to relieve his mind. Caldwell said he was sorry he had taken their money. I ought not to have taken their money. Prisoner seemed to know the matter had been settled or would be definitely. Prisoner said he had lived too fast or too expensively, and that was the cause of his taking the company's money. That was the cause of his trouble. Caldwell's house was searched the same night he was put in jail. His wife's person was never searched. It was never proposed. He has a child. I told him we had been to his house, asked his wife for his conductor's box. It was arranged that the prisoner should not be put in a cell the first night. He was to sleep on a cot in the hall. Prisoner requested us to tell his wife where he was. This was what induced us to search his house. I told him I had been to his house. Prisoner didn't ask for our authority. He asked to have a friend sent for with regard to bail. Think he spoke of his having an attorney at our office. I did not refuse to help him get bail. I expressly proposed to help him get bail. Mr. Blackwell, did you tell Caldwell you never arrested a man without convicting him? No. I made some remark to that effect, that we, Pinkerton and company, were not in the habit of proceeding in these matters without being sure of the proofs and being able to sustain ourselves. It was not our purpose to operate on his fears. My purpose was to satisfy Caldwell's mind that we had full proofs of his deficiencies. On Monday, I told prisoner I had been to his house and asked his wife for his conductor's box, that she did not give it to me. Prisoner replied, You go to my wife now, and she will tell you where the box is. Mr. Blackwell, I was not acting for prisoner until late on Sunday night, and had great difficulty in getting into the jail. Mr. Stewart, you, Mr. Blackwell, can be sworn if you wish to get your statements before the jury. Mr. Blackwell, I don't wish to be sworn and therefore make these statements. G.P. Penny had been a railroad conductor for several years. There were printed blanks for tally list furnished conductors. I don't know the course of other conductors in keeping their tallies. William H. Backus. I am conductor in the Chicago and Burlington Railroad. This tally list is like those kept by myself. I never made but one like the one shown me. I could take the memorandum now shown me. Memorandum found on Caldwell's person, and from it make out my entire report of a trip from Burlington to Chicago. The first marks, B.C. I should read as Burlington to Cameron, seven passengers. Cross-examined. So far as my experience goes, the tally list exhibited here is the only one I have any knowledge of. It is like the one I made out. I kept that by putting down the stations and marks as I went along. A conductor's tally list and report often vary. I do not recollect that my money ever runs short of my tally list. It would generally overrun. I can conceive that it might run short. The tally list is used simply as a memorandum from which to make out their reports. My practice has been to first make out my report according to my tally list, then count up my money and what is over, put in between stations as nearly as practicable, where it belongs and where it would fit. The chief object is to get the money. The tally list is solely for the convenience of the conductor. Have on one occasion run all the way from Mendota to Junction before putting down a single fare on my tally list, trusting to memory to put them all down afterwards. In adjusting overplus, I should put down as many through fares as possible and place the balance as near as I could where it belonged. 
had frequently gone entirely through a car without putting down any tally, trusting to memory. I generally put it down after I had reached the end of the car. I have sometimes gone through the whole train without tallying. There are many things which may interrupt the conductor in collecting fare. He may hear the engineer's whistle, intimating that the track is obstructed, which would stop him immediately. The business of collecting fear is a very small part of the conductor's duties. He has the time, the property of his employers, and the lives of his passengers in trust, and necessarily, if fit to be a conductor, feels the weight of some responsibility. Our alarms are a very frequent occurrence on roads in this country. I consider my principal duty as conductor to be to look after the safety of the train. Our instructions, I should think, are chiefly to this point. A conductor who has had experience on hearing a peculiar kind of whistle from the engineer will leave all other kinds of business at once and look outside his train. These alarms are likely to happen at any time. Mistakes frequently occur in keeping tally. The conductor is often called upon to refund money taken through some error. The conductor does not return the tally list to the company. It is not regarded as his duty to do so. The tally lists of different trips may happen to be very nearly alike. I have no recollection of any instance when my money was short of what the tally list represented, but have heard of such. I have been conductor about four years. I think generally if I have collected more than one fare in a car, I have not left the car till I put it down. I don't know the practice of other conductors. If a man gives me a gold piece in payment of fare, I give him gold in exchange if he asks for it. Otherwise, I give him bills. If I should receive money and not give change immediately, I should put down the tally at the time of receiving it the same as if I had given change. Conductors are frequently called on to change money for passengers. It might at such times appear to an outsider as if he was taking fare. A conductor may frequently apply to a passenger to change money for him. I have often, on receiving money before starting out, got it changed into gold for giving change. I don't think a conductor could return the identical money received for fare and attend to all his other business. It has been the custom for the receiver to return broken or counterfeit money to the conductor who took it. I believe it is the practice still. I'm taking $100 along the route for passengers. I think the conductor would not be able to return more than one half of the identical money he received. This would occur from the natural necessity of changing money. It is altogether probable that in a short time after starting on the trip, the identical money which he started with and that which he received from the first passenger would be gone. No instructions in regard to returning the identical money were ever given to me. Mr. Blackwell, during your conductorship on this road, did you have any difficulty with a man about a free ticket, a man and his wife having been on the train? Mr. Stewart objected. He said he was willing to concede that mistakes will be made. The prosecution would rely upon its proof respecting fears for through passengers. Mr. Blackwell insisted that the defense had the right to show that the reports made by conductors are open to many mistakes and errors, consistent with entire innocence. The court ruled that the defense were at liberty to offer any testimony showing that the reports and tally lists, such as been offered in evidence against Caldwell, could be erroneous without guilt. Mr. Bacchus, I recollect but one event of that kind. It was the case of a gentleman belonging to the New York Central Railroad. I had known him previously on that road. When I came round to him for his fare, he presented Colonel Hammond's pass from Burlington to Chicago. I took the pass and gave him a check. There was a lady sitting beside him, and I asked for her fare. He said she was his wife. I asked him if he had a pass for her. He said he understood his passes, including his wife, and that Colonel Hammond so intended it. I said that the pass did not include her, and that I had no means of ascertaining Colonel Hammond's intentions other than from the face of the pass. I told him he would have to pay her fare. 
He said that if he was to pay her fare, he preferred to pay for both. I told him that I had orders to collect fare from all persons not having tickets or passes. I told him that after I got here, I would see Colonel Hammond, and if it was intended to include the lady in the pass, I would refund the money, for the pass was as good to me as the money. After I got here, I did not see Colonel Hammond that night. Next morning, I saw Colonel H. Explain the matter to him, and he told me, though it was not intended to include the lady, I had better pay back the twelve dollars and take up the pass. I did so, and I went out the next run. I paid myself the twelve dollars by taking off my report of the run through two through fares. My money returned for that run was for two through fares less than was marked on my tally list. I report then of that run reported money for two through passes less than I had actually received. My report on that run was twelve dollars less than the tally list called for. We often have occasion to strike out tallies. In going through a train in a hurry, we often ask a person for his fare. He may ask us the amount of fare to the next station. If we are not familiar with the rates, I might take out the list, and supposing he was going there would state the amount and make a mark. And after the man would hand us a ticket, I would then have to take out the list and erase the mark or the tally would show one fare more than I had the money for. When the train is long, or I am in a hurry, or many other things might induce me to stop then to correct the tally, such mistakes might not occur. The whistle of the engine, or many other things might call away our attention from the matter at the moment. I went out last evening to Mendota, and collecting the fares, I came to a gentleman, who refused to pay. He said he had paid his fare at the office, that he had bought three tickets and paid fifteen dollars for them to Galesburg, that in the morning he had put his family aboard, and in looking after the baggage he had got left behind, that his wife had all three tickets and had gone on to Galesburg. I told him my duty was to collect the fare, that he must pay it to me, and if on getting to Galesburg his ticket was produced, I would refund him the money. He paid me, but I did not go through to Galesburg that night, but explained the matter to the other conductor. If that ticket is not produced before I make my report, I will pay this five dollars and five cents I got from him to the company, and if the ticket comes, I will refund him the money, and out of the fares I may collect on the next run, will pay myself, and report one fare of that amount less that I will actually receive. Mistakes and tallies are made by persons mistaking stations. Where we are convinced tickets have been purchased, we refund. In such cases, we pay ourselves out of the next money collected. Persons with through tickets often stop at way stations. We charge five cents more when tickets are not purchased. At almost every trip, persons with through tickets stop over. In such cases, we give them blank tickets furnished for that purpose, which we fill out. No money passes on such occasions. We make no return of such tickets. They are returned the first time. We give a person who pays fare on the road and wishes to stop on road, if he will pay through amount, a stopover ticket. There is once in a while persons who pass over the road who are deadheads. Have every trip some fifteen deadheads to report. We report them as all others. Ministers of the gospel pay half fare. They usually pay conductors on the train. Half fare tickets are only sold at Burlington and Chicago, and when they come on board from all other places, have to pay the conductor on the road. There were no half fare tickets sold in September. There are many irregular deadheads who have only a pass for a single trip. We report the pass as a ticket in a deadhead report. A pass is the same as a through ticket. Passes are not entered in the conductor's report, nor tickets, only the money collected. Tickets are sold at all stations. I understand that the reason for charging more on fares collected in the cars is to compel the purchase of tickets at the stations. Cases frequently occur where a gentleman will pay the conductor 
the fear of one, two, three, four, or five persons beside him. They may be his family, or of the same party, and may not be able to get seats together, sometimes some of them in one car and the others in another. He generally describes them, and when the conductor comes to them, he passes them. At stations where the cars stop, persons frequently come into the cars, and meeting friends sit down and converse with them. When we arrive at junctions or crossroads, or places where we connect with trains on other roads, passengers who have paid their through fare frequently change their minds in which to go on another road and ask for a return of fare. When such passengers have paid their fare in money, I generally refund them the rate for the rest of the road. I have refunded money in cases where the passengers have paid me tickets. But if I think the passenger will ever come back to travel over that road again, I give him a stopover ticket, which is good for 365 days, or forever. The mistakes I have mentioned are those most likely to occur to conductors in marking on their tally list. They are ones which have occurred to myself. There are many instances where a person in the car for the purpose of observing how many fares are paid may be deceived. I have been on railroads as a conductor for four years, and I think I am experienced enough to know that such things as I have mentioned are of frequent occurrence, and that persons sent there to observe may often be deceived, aside from the general mistakes which such persons might make. There are others which occur because of their not knowing all the circumstances and not hearing the conversation. A case occurred on the last trip. Four persons got on with tickets to Galesburg, and before I came around to collect, they had learned that they desired to go to Cameron instead of Galesburg. The fare to Galesburg was $1.05, and to Cameron, $1.35. Thirty cents difference. They gave me four tickets and one dollar and twenty cents. A person in the car not hearing the circumstances would suppose that I had got four fares of one dollar and thirty-five cents each, or five dollars and forty cents, when in fact I only had got one dollar and twenty cents in money. A person may pay me fares for himself and other persons who may be in another part of the car, or in another car, or in the saloon. And yet a person not hearing our conversation could not tell how many fares I had received. And when the conductor comes to the other passengers so paid for, the man who may be observing will not know that I pass them as persons entitled to our free passages. When we take half fares from clergymen, we give them a check like other passengers, and no one not hearing the conversation can tell whether we receive full fare or not. Conductors sometimes get change of passengers. When he does so, a man not hearing the conversation could not tell whether he was collecting a fare or not. Mr. Blackwell, if upon a comparison of the tally list of any run with the amount of bank started with and amount found on hand at the end of run, a conductor should find that his tally list called for more money then it actually been taken and the conductor could not recollect or discover where the mistake was. What would be the course for a conductor as to his report, according to his duty? I can only answer by saying what I should do. I should keep my bank good, let the consequences be what they might. If the money is over, it is put into my report, and if the money is short, I see no reason why the report should not also be made to correspond with it. I take the money as my guide for the report in preference to the tally list. I make my report correspond with my money. Always know, when I go out on the train, how much I have. And of course, I ought to have that when I come off. When I get through, I always take my bank out of the money. If I have gold, I make it up with that, taking my small change first. If I have not gold, I make it out with bills and make out my report by the balance. We have instructions to put the amount of money in the report, and as far as we are able to apportion it, so as it will go to the roads over which we run. If it be over, I would apportion it as near as possible, according to justice to all three roads. 
If the money is short, I would make my report agree, as I never yet paid any of my own money to the company. I would make a deduction from the through phase. Often I have not put down a fare in the tally list, knowing that I had not done so, but also knowing that I was about something more important than putting down that fare. On all the roads where I have been, conductors have to make their money good. G. P. Penny was conductor on Chicago and Burlington Railroad for four years, up to the first of this month, and not now. Agree with the general statements of Mr. Backus. The tally lists do not indicate in all instances, accurately, the amount of money received by a conductor. I don't see how a man watching the conductor could know exactly whether the passenger was paying through or way fare. have had passengers pay me to Newark and afterwards conclude to go on to Burlington and pay the additional fare. Deacon A. Harvey am a conductor on the Galena Railroad. The tally list of a conductor is not with me an accurate list to make out report from. I remember one time when my cash was short at the amount called for by the tally list. Very often my cash overruns from $10 to $40. Don't know what the tally list is for. I supposed it was to keep the statistics of the several stations, but think it is not so. Mistakes will occur sometimes. Within this week have known instances. Don't think the tally list important. Very frequently ask passengers for change, and am often asked by them for change. In dark nights, mistakes are made tallying. We make up our reports to fit the money paid over. It isn't our intention to keep the tally list accurately. I consider it of no account. We can't keep it accurate. Don't consider it of the least importance. It is of some convenience to the conductor as an approximation. I think we might as well pay over the money in a lump. We have no different lines of corporations over which to apportion surplus monies, not accounted for in the tally list. I wouldn't swear my report was right. My money would be right or nearly right. Never have received any instructions about tally lists. Don't return tally lists to the office. The court. Proceed with your testimony. Mr. Dickey. Mr. Blackwell has been absent some minutes. He has the program. Mr. Blackwell was called after some fifteen minutes. The sheriff. Mr. Deputy, go down to Young America and see if you can't find Mr. Blackwell. After waiting some time, the court took a recess of forty minutes. End of section 60. Section 61 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson. Trial of Oscar T. Caldwell for Embezzlement, Chicago, Illinois, 1855, Part 4. David Remick. I am running a passenger train on the Chicago and Burlington Railroad. Have run but a few months. Have been on the road two years. Have been in the ticket office at Burlington. Left to because a company of us and engaged in a railroad enterprise, but would have left anyhow for the sake of having some out door business. I agree with the general statements of Mr. Backus. The tally list is not an accurate test of receipt of fares. I invariably had more money than called for by the tally. The first train I run out, I had a surplus of $27.60. On one occasion, there was a family of four persons. The man had the tickets and got left. I took the money from the three on the cars, and the next day redeemed the tickets. This made a discrepancy between my tally list and my report. T.F. Cody I am conductor on the Chicago and Burlington Road. I agree with the general statements made by Mr. Backus. Tally lists are never accurate. I have several times had less money than called for by the tally list. Conductors of night trains have frequently made mistakes in marking on the tally list. I have made such mistakes myself often. 
The light in the cars is not so good as daylight. Our alarm whistles frequently call a conductor's attention. The treasurer directed me to pay over the identical money taken for fares so far as possible. I have a bank of forty dollars. Seldom have any of my own money mixed with the bank. Think it not possible to carry out the orders of the company in all cases. Think under many circumstances I could keep track of the money I took. Before the circular was issued, the conductors were in the habit of buying change at the brokers. I have exchanged gold with employee along the line of a road as a matter of courtesy. The money usually overruns the tally list. If otherwise, it must be the result of accident, perhaps by giving a $10 bill for a $1 bill. A year ago this summer, I made a mistake in footing up. Such mistakes are rare. I like the form of tally list used on the Chicago and Burlington Railroad much better than any I have seen. It is almost impossible to make a mistake on the tally list, now used by the Chicago and Burlington line. It is plainer. The tariffs are all before the conductor, and in such a way that he can't well miss. Charles Green, am conductor on the Illinois Central Railroad, have been on the New York and Erie Railroad some five years. I concur in the statement of Mr. Backus. On our road, we use no printed tally list. Nothing but memorandum books have had my cash short of tally list seldom, often a surplus. Change cars once between Amboy and Dunleith. Simon Sanborn Have been a conductor on the Illinois Central Railroad for six or seven years, since January last. I agree with the testimony of the other conductors in regard to the liabilities of making mistakes in tallying. The tally list is not an accurate basis for making out reports. Very frequently falls short of my money and my money sometimes comes short of my tally list. It has done so several times. I could not say how many. I do not consider the tally list reliable as a basis of making reports. There is no tally list provided for conductors on our road. I use the same form which is used on the Galena Road. I use them only as a guide for making up reports. I have had my money fall short of my tally list since. I have been on the Illinois Central Road. Think it was but one occasion. Cannot state the precise amount. Think it was less than ten dollars. My whole receipts on that trip, I think, were not over one hundred dollars. Did not report from tally list on that occasion, because I could not. I generally take out my bank and return the rest to the company, be it more or less. I do not consider a tally list as of very great importance. We take pains to have our tally list as correct as we can. My receipts have never exceeded $100 on any one trip. I am acquainted with Mr. Caldwell, have known him 10 or 15 years, knew him in Rochester, New York. I was part of the time, conductor on the New York and Erie Road. I was a clerk in Rochester when I first became acquainted with Caldwell. He was part of the time, a barkeeper. Part of the time he kept a saloon. Charles E. Follett. Am general ticket agent for Chicago and Burlington Road. Am acquainted with the business of the ticket office at Burlington. Something over $17,000 passed through the office last month. There is no chance of stealing from that office except by collusion with some conductor. Cross-examined. During April, through tickets were sold from Chicago to Mendota. Commenced selling through from Chicago to Burlington about the 1st of May. I made my statements from the paper now handed me. Table of averages. That statement contains the dollars and cents of each conductor taken during each trip. If the conductor received $2,000 for May, we divide the amount by the number of trips. From 1st of May to 1st of September. Nine conductors were on the road, not uniformly, including Mr. Caldwell. There were five conductors all the time on the through trains. The following were the averages of the conductors. Conductor, G.P. Penny. Amount, $6,770.60. Number of runs, 57. Average, $118.75. Conductor, S. Hatch. 
amount $6,707.13, number of runs 60, average $111.78. Conductor, T.A. Cody, amount $5,861.95, number of runs 60, averages $97.70. Conductor, S. Allen. $5,354.87, number of runs, 61, average, $87.78, conductor, O.T. Caldwell, amount, $4,232.01, number of runs, 56, average, $76.46, total, $28,976. Dollars and fifty six cents. Number of runs two hundred ninety four. Average ninety eight dollars and fifty six cents. November twenty fourth. The speeches of counsel. Mr. McElroy opened on behalf of the people by reading from the section of the statutes defining the offense charged against the prisoner. One of the authorities relied upon in the application of the statute to this case was in Wharton. Page 596. The defendant was charged with embezzling the funds and mummies of the Chicago and Burlington Railroad line, while employed by that company as a servant and conductor. It may not be disguised, gentlemen of the jury, that this case is one of unusual interest. The crowd that has thronged the courtroom has shown you the public interest. The prisoner is a young man with many friends and sympathizers, it is natural and proper it should be so. On the other hand, the people have no sympathizers. They need none. We rely and desire to rely solely on the law and the testimony without the aid of other influence. Counsel for the prisoner would be glad to have you believe that this prosecution is by a corporation. It is not so. The prosecution is by the people of the state of Illinois. It has been shown to you that the prisoner fully shared the confidence of his employers. According to his own statement, Mr. Hammond had acted to him, Caldwell, like a father. It is also in evidence that while the prisoner was running a train at a salary of $720 per annum, he was offered a situation in the ticket office at Burlington at a salary of $1,000 per annum. Now, Mark... While running the train, he was obliged to be up all night and away from his family several nights in the week. Besides that, he was living in this expensive city where the cost of living is more than double what it is in country towns. To a country town like Burlington, gentlemen, the prisoner might have gone in a very pleasant and honorable position, have earned $280 more per annum than he was earning as conductor, would have had regular hours of work and rest, and would have been with his family all the time. What is the inference when a man declines this superior position with less unpleasant labor and an increase of pay, and seeks to continue in the lower salaried position, where he is at the same time away from his family? Does the fact that there are such checks and guards and vouchers to be given in the ticket office, that stealing is almost impossible, throw any light upon the subject? Is the report true that while the conductor's salary is nominally $720, it is easily made worth $1,200 or $2,500 even? The facts are before you. You will draw your own inferences. You will be told that the agents of the detective police are eminently depraved men, and such epithets as vipers, spies, scoundrels, jailbirds, et it genus omni, will be considered so essential to the defense of this unfortunate young man that his counsel will hardly be able to get through without emptying them on the segregate and aggregate heads of the officers in the service of Pinkerton and Company. I will only remark in this connection that none but the evil-minded need fear the chiefs or the subordinates of the Northwestern Police Agency. It is well known that men's opinions of the law are affected by the drawing of lines of distinction, as halters and the like. The result of the carefully planned watchings of the prisoner on his runs of the westward and eastward trains on the 9th and 11th of September 
were conclusive as to his guilt. The further discovery of large gold coins on his person at the time he was searched marked coins that had been paid him for fares by the detective policeman consummated the legal proofs of the embezzlement. The appearance of Caldwell when informed of his detection by Mr. Rucker was all against him. He simulated great surprise and confusion. Gentlemen, a railroad conductor is too much of a cosmopolitan to be astonished, at all events, to be confused and overwhelmed by any such announcement. If innocent, he might be indignant, but never so confused and overwhelmed as not to know whether he was innocent or guilty. Conductors travel farther in a day and see more new faces, more varied and exciting scenes, more of life and incident in a single day than many people see in all their lives through. His appearance, therefore, in the presence of Colonel Hammond, his profession of overwhelming embarrassment, make powerful assaults on the presumption of innocence, of the same force and in the same direction of the partial negotiations of Caldwell, to make restitution to employers and the extraordinary conclusion to which he arrived in deciding to take the risks of a public trial. Was the chance of escaping a conviction, risked for the sake of an after-civil prosecution of the parties who detected and arrested him, or was the chance of conviction, with the possibilities of pardon or a new trial, of a verdict set aside, etc., etc., preferable to the disclosure of the hoarding place of his gold insisted upon by Mr. Rucker? Would the defense dare to take up and bring in here a flash? saying he had heard used on the street by those whose interest of fears made them enemies of the prosecution, viz. they all steal, or single out Caldwell. A declaration so pernicious to the morale of society would hardly be made in this temple erected by society to justice. If such a sweeping charge against the honesty of conductors as a class were as true as I hope it is false, would it be reason for the acquittal of the prisoner? Would it not enhance the necessity for a thorough legal investigation of this case, for the doing of strict justice here, that the alleged debauchers of the railroad service might be arrested? And this brings me to speak, in concluding, of the position of soulless corporations, as the defense would represent all railroad companies. Gentlemen, you will not allow yourselves for one moment to be prejudiced against the associations of enterprising men who are building those iron highways, upon which the world is being borne forward with marvelous rapidity of progress in all that is physically prosperous and socially elevating. No man is rich enough to build a railroad. It must be by bodies of men uniting their means and incorporating themselves for unity of action. And of all men that should be, if not profoundly grateful, at least disposed to extend the protection of the laws over such corporations and their property. The people of Illinois, the citizens of Chicago, are first to be named. Their position in this court is only that of individuals, asking for protection and the dispensation of justice in the name of the people of Illinois, whose interest in this matter is infinitely greater than theirs. Mr. Dickey in the course of a long practice, this is the most extraordinary prosecution I have ever seen. In my childhood, I had heard of persons being brought before their triers and presumed to be guilty until he established his innocence. Never before this occasion have I felt the presence of such an influence booing up the prosecution and crushing down the defense. Let me recapitulate the points of this case. And in the first place, with regard to this extraordinary institution called the Northwestern Police Agency, and in the outset I am free to say that I do not believe Mr. Rucker, of the firm of Pinkerton and Company, would for one moment continue the prosecution of a man whom he believed innocent. Rucker has undoubtedly come to believe that this prisoner is guilty. He, Mr. Rucker, is a man of as much intellect as I have met in this city and possessed to the most extraordinary shrewdness. But the character of this prosecution is nevertheless the most cold-blooded, cruel, and callous I have seen in twenty years' practice. I hope I may never see the like again. 
I shall not stoop to excite prejudice against the prosecution by talking of soulless corporations. I shall proceed at once to a brief review of the case, commencing with his arrest by Pinkerton and the conversation between the prisoner and Rucker and Colonel Hammond. With reference to Colonel Hammond, I have to say that while it is not my practice to abuse or traduce a person simply because in the trial of a case he comes in my way. On the other hand, no man's station is so high that I cannot criticize him. Colonel Hammond would not, it is true, knowingly injure an innocent man, would not charge this conductor with stealing if he did not believe him guilty. But gentlemen, Colonel Hammond is a peculiar man. His positions in life have been such. His character has been so molded by the powerful influences of exact public service that he has come to expect not only the most rigorous performance of duty, but has so long dealt with subordinates, not to say inferiors, that he has come to believe that he is always right, and those whom he opposes always wrong. Wherever he sets his foot, there it must remain. He is a man of iron will, and if anything gets in his way, it must be crushed into the ground, or it must remove. In his treatment of subordinates, he might be compared to the father who made his child stand on one foot all day for the good of his soul. Hammond tells us that when he first went into the interview with Caldwell at the office of Pinkerton and Company, he assumed that Caldwell was guilty, and soon after said, You know, Mr. Caldwell, that I have always treated you like a father. Yes, replied Caldwell, you always have treated me kindly and like a father. But what is the subsequent action of this kind father? Why, he leaves the prisoner to the tender mercies of Pinkerton and company, and pursues him in this criminal prosecution. Caldwell, in the first place, is approached by Mr. Pinkerton, who, with a profound cunning, inveigles him to the office of the Northwestern Police Agency, on the pretense of making some communications or receiving information about a woman. But arrived at the office, he was informed that certain deficiencies had been discovered in his returns. He was assumed to be guilty. Now, a great point is made by the prosecution because when Caldwell was first charged with having kept the company's money, he did not deny the charge, but soon after spoke of time to arrange his accounts so that he might know how much he was behind. Was it wonderful that he should be confused in one time? Here were the nets of Pinkerton and company, gathering in around him. Pinkerton and Rucker compared with whom Talleyrand was slow and stupid. Colville asked for time, but he was pressed to settle, urged to make over his property, etc., with very distinct intimations of a criminal prosecution if he declined. But he did decline, and was arrested, arrested without authority, searched and marched to jail. No preliminary examination, no opportunity to get bail, or to see his friends, or to procure counsel. When the trial comes on, it is noticeable that the quartet arranged and composed by Pinkerton and company do not dance round the prisoner. Ghost is here, Benedict is here, and Bridgman is here, but West is not produced. Ghost appears like an honest boy who is inveigled into this business by Rucker. A Benedict is a thief set to catch a thief. A Bridgman's previous history we know nothing, save that he was a man of war's man, and that his family are living in Washington. These witnesses testify to paying their fares to Caldwell, in money, through to Burlington, and returning. Two of them also testify that they saw two ladies pay their fare, through from Burlington to Chicago, on the eastward trip. Now I must state that I believe this latter statement to be a manufactured lie. I believe the witness swore to that for the purpose of making the number of through passengers on the eastward trip correspond with the number of passengers marked opposite the letters B.C. in the tally list found on Caldwell's person on the 15th. I exonerate Mr. Rucker from all intention to wrong a man whom he regarded as innocent, but he thinks Caldwell is guilty. 
Rucker is a man too upright to swear to a willful falsehood, but his service as a detective agent has rendered him incapable of distinguishing between guilt and innocence, and he always assumes his victim to be guilty. Acting under the belief of Caldwell's guilt, and urged on by a powerful thirst for victory, with the obliquities of his mind resulting from the life he leads, I insist he is incapable of giving an account of the evidence between him and Caldwell, which might be relied upon as a fair and faithful picture of the reality. It was well for Caldwell that in spite of the pit prepared for him by these keen and able men, he did not buy his peace, as in a moment of weakness he had well nigh done. Many men, while conscious of their innocence, have yet concluded it were wiser to buy their peace and avoid the ignominy of a public prosecution. He refused, and appeals to a jury of his peers for an honorable acquittal on the charges brought against him. End of section 61